section one of the first voyage of james cook volume two by james cook seventeen twenty eight to seventeen seventy nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the first voyage of james cook volume two by james cook seventeen twenty eight to seventeen seventy nine being the second volume of the three voyages of captain james cook round the world complete in seven volumes london longman hurst rees orme and brown eighteen twenty one book two chapter seven part one range from cape turnagain southward along the eastern coast of poenamu round cape south and back to the western entrance of cook strait which completed the circumnavigation of this country with a description of the coast and of admiralty bay the departure from new zealand and various particulars at four o'clock in the afternoon of friday the ninth of february we tacked and stood southwest till eight o'clock the next morning when being not above three or four miles from the shore we stood off two hours and then again southwest till noon when at the distance of about two miles from the shore we had twenty six fathom water we continued to make sail to the southward till sunset on the eleventh when a fresh breeze at north-east had carried us back again the length of cape palliser of which as the weather was clear we had a good view it is of a height sufficient to be seen in clear weather at the distance of twelve or fourteen leagues and the land is of a broken and hilly surface between the foot of the high land and the sea there is a low flat border of which there are some rocks that appear above water between this cape and cape turnagain the land near the shore is in many places low and flat and has a green and pleasant appearance but farther from the sea it rises into hills the land between cape palliser and cape tierra Witta is high and makes in table points it also seemed to us to form two bays but we were at too great a distance from this part of the coast to judge accurately from appearances the wind having been variable with calms we had advanced no farther by the twelfth at noon than latitude forty one degrees fifty two minutes cape palliser then bearing north distant about five leagues and the snowy mountain south eighty three degrees west at noon on the thirteenth we found ourselves in the latitude of forty two degrees two minutes south cape palliser bearing north twenty degrees east distant eight leagues in the afternoon a fresh gale sprung up at north-east and we steered south-west by west for the southernmost land in sight which at sunset bore from us south seventy four degrees west at this time the variation was fifteen degrees four minutes east at eight o'clock in the morning of the fourteenth having run one and twenty leagues south fifty eight degrees west since the preceding noon it fell calm we were then abreast of the snowy mountain which bore from us northwest and in this direction lay behind a mountainous ridge of nearly the same height which rises directly from the sea and runs parallel with the shore which lies northeast a half north and southwest a half south the northwest end of the ridge rises inland not far from cape campbell and both the mountain and the ridge are distinctly seen as well from cape koamaru as cape palliser from koamaru 
They are distant two and twenty leagues southwest a half south, and from Cape Palliser thirty leagues west southwest, and are of a height sufficient to be seen at a much greater distance. Some persons on board were of opinion that they were as high as Tenerife, but I did not think them as high as Mount Egmont on the southwest coast of Ayahaino Moa, because the snow, which almost entirely covered Mount Egmont, lay only in patches upon these. At noon this day we were in latitude 42 degrees 34 minutes south. The southernmost land in sight bore southwest to half west, and some lowland that appeared like an island and lay close under the foot of the ridge bore northwest by north about five or six leagues. In the afternoon, when Mr. Banks was out in the boat a shooting, we saw with our glasses four double canoes, having on board fifty seven men, put off from that shore and make towards him. We immediately made signals for him to come on board, but the ship, with respect to him, being right in the wake of the sun, he did not see them. We were at a considerable distance from the shore, and he was at a considerable distance from the ship, which was between him and the shore, so that, it being a dead calm, I began to be in some pain for him, fearing that he might not see the canoes time enough to reach the ship before they should get up with him. Soon after, however, we saw his boat in motion and had the pleasure to take him on board before the Indians came up, who probably had not seen him, as their attention seemed to be wholly fixed upon the ship. They came within about a stone's cast and then stopped, gazing at us with a look of vacant astonishment. Tupia exerted all his eloquence to prevail upon them to come nearer, but without any effect. After surveying us for some time, they left us and made towards the shore, but had not measured more than half the distance between that and the ship before it was dark. We imagined that these people had heard nothing of us, and could not but remark the different behaviour and dispositions of the inhabitants of the different parts of this coast upon their first approaching the vessel. These kept aloof with a mixture of timidity and wonder. Others had immediately commenced hostilities by pelting us with stones. The gentleman whom we had found alone, fishing in his boat, seemed to think us entirely unworthy of his notice and some, almost without invitation, had come on board with an air of perfect confidence and goodwill. From the behaviour of our last visitors, I gave the land from which they had put off, and which, as I had before observed, had the appearance of an island, the name of Lookers On. At eight o'clock in the evening, a breeze sprung up at south southwest, with which I stretched off south east, because some on board thought they saw land in that quarter. In this course, we continued till six o'clock the next morning, when we had run eleven leagues, but saw no land except that which we had left. Having stood to the south east with the light breeze, which veered from the west to the north till noon, our latitude by observation was 42 degrees 56 minutes south, and the high land that we were abreast of the preceding noon bore north-northwest to half-west. In the afternoon we had a light breeze at northeast, with which we steered west, edging in for the land, which was distant about eight leagues. At seven in the evening we were about six leagues from the shore, and the southernmost extremity of the land in sight bore west-southwest. At daybreak on the 16th we discovered land bearing south by west and seemingly detached from the coast we were upon. About eight a breeze sprung up at north by east and we steered directly for it. 
At noon, we were in latitude 43 degrees 19 minutes south. The peak on the snowy mountain bore north 20 degrees east, distant 27 leagues. The southern extremity of the land we could see bore west, and the land which had been discovered in the morning appeared like an island extending from south-southwest to southwest by west to half-west, distant about eight leagues. In the afternoon we stood to the southward of it with a fresh breeze at north. At eight in the evening we had run eleven leagues and the land then extended from southwest by west to north by west. We were then distant about three or four leagues from the nearest shore and in this situation had fifty fathom water with a fine sandy bottom. The variation of the compass by this morning's amplitude was 14 degrees 39 minutes east. At sunrise the next morning, our opinion that the land we had been standing for was an island was confirmed by our seeing part of the land of Tovi Poenamu open to the westward of it, extending as far as west by south. At eight in the morning, the extremes of the island were north 76 degrees west and north northeast a half east, and an opening near the south point, which had the appearance of a bay or harbour, north 20 degrees west, distant between three and four leagues. In this situation, we had 38 fathom water with a brown sandy bottom. This island, which I named after Mr. Banks, lies about five leagues from the coast of Tovi Poenamu. The south point bears south 21 degrees west from the highest peak on the snowy mountain and lies in latitude 43 degrees 32 minutes south and in longitude 186 degrees 30 minutes west by an observation of the sun and moon which was made this morning. It is of a circular figure and about 24 leagues in compass. It is sufficiently high to be seen at the distance of 12 or 15 leagues and the land has a broken irregular surface with the appearance rather of barrenness than fertility. Yet it was inhabited for we saw smoke in one place and a few straggling natives in another. When this island was first discovered in the direction of south by west, some persons on board were of opinion that they also saw land bearing south-southeast and south-east by east. I was myself upon the deck at the time and told them that in my opinion it was no more than a cloud and that as the sun rose it would dissipate and vanish. However, as I was determined to leave no subject for disputation which experiment could remove, I ordered the ship to be war and steered east-south-east by compass in the direction which the land was said to bear from us at that time. At noon we were in latitude 44 degrees 7 minutes south, the south point of Banks's island bearing north, distant five leagues. By seven o'clock at night we had run eight and twenty miles, when, seeing no land, nor any signs of any, but that which we had left, we bore away south by west, and continued upon that course till the next day at noon, when we were in latitude forty-five degrees sixteen minutes, the south point of Banks's island bearing north, six degrees thirty minutes west, distant twenty-eight leagues. The variation by the azimuth this morning was fifteen degrees thirty minutes east. As no signs of land had yet appeared to the southward, and as I thought that we had stood far enough in that direction to weather all the land we had left, judging from the report of the natives in Queen Charlotte Sound, I hauled to the westward. We had a moderate breeze at north northwest and north till eight in the evening, when it became unsettled, and at ten fixed at south. 
during the night it blew with such violence that it brought us under our close reef topsails at eight the next morning having run twenty-eight leagues upon a west by north a half north course and judging ourselves to be to the westward of the land of tovi poenamu we bore away northwest with a fresh gale at south at ten having run eleven miles upon this course we saw land extending from the southwest to the northwest at the distance of about ten leagues which we hauled up for at noon our latitude by observation was forty four degrees thirty eight minutes the southeast point of banks's island bore north fifty eight degrees thirty minutes east distant thirty leagues and the main body of the land in sight west by north a head sea prevented us from making much way to the southward at seven in the evening the extremes of the land stretched from southwest by south to north by west and at six leagues from the shore we had thirty-two fathom water at four o'clock the next morning we stood in for the shore west by south and during a course of four leagues our depth of water was from thirty-two to thirteen fathom when it was thirteen fathom we were but three miles distant from the shore and therefore stood off its direction is here nearly north and south the surface to the distance of about five miles from the sea is low and flat but it then rises into hills of a considerable height it appeared to be totally barren and we saw no signs of it being inhabited our latitude at noon was forty four degrees forty four minutes and the longitude which we made from banks's island to this place was two degrees twenty two minutes west during the last twenty-four hours though we carried as much sail as the ship would bear we were driven three leagues to the leeward we continued to stand off and on all this day and the next keeping at the distance of between four and twelve leagues from the shore and having water from thirty-five to fifty-three fathom on the twenty-second at noon we had no observation but by the land judged ourselves to be about three leagues farther north than we had been the day before at sunset the weather which had been hazy clearing up we saw a mountain which rose in a high peak bearing northwest by north and at the same time we saw the land more distinctly than before extending from north to southwest by south which at some distance within the coast had a lofty and mountainous appearance we soon found that the accounts which had been given us by the indians in queen charlotte's sound of the land to the southward were not true for they had told us that it might be circumnavigated in four days on the twenty-third having a hollow swell from the south-east and expecting wind from the same quarter we kept plying between seven and fifteen leagues from the shore having from seventy to forty-four fathom at noon our latitude by observation was forty-four degrees forty minutes south and our longitude from banks's island one degree thirty-one minutes west from this time to six in the evening it was calm but a light breeze then springing up at east north east we steered south south east all night edging off from the land the hollow swell still continuing our depth of water was from sixty to seventy five fathom while we were becalmed mr banks being out in the boat shot two port egmont hens which were in every respect the same as those that are found in great numbers upon the island of faro and were the first of the kind we had seen upon this coast though we fell in with some a few days before we made land at daybreak the wind freshened and before noon we had a strong gale at north-north-east 
At eight in the morning, we saw the land extending as far as southwest by south and steered directly for it. At noon, we were in latitude 45 degrees 22 minutes south, and the land, which now stretched from southwest to half south to north northwest, appeared to be rudely diversified by hill and valley. In the afternoon, we steered southwest by south and southwest, edging in for the land with a fresh gale at north. But though we were at no great distance, the weather was so hazy that we could see nothing distinctly upon it, except a ridge of high hills lying not far from the sea and parallel to the coast, which in this place stretches south by west and north by east, and seemed to end in a high bluff point to the southward. By eight in the evening we were abreast of this point, but it being then dark, and I not knowing which way the land trended, we brought to for the night. At this time the point bore west, and was distant about five miles. Our depth of water was thirty-seven fathom, and the bottom consisted of small pebbles. At daybreak, having made sail, the point bore north, distant three leagues, and we now found that the land trended from it, southwest by west as far as we could see. This point I named Cape Saunders in honour of Sir Charles. Our latitude was 45 degrees 35 minutes south and longitude 189 degrees 4 minutes west. By the latitude and the angles that are made by the coast, this point will be sufficiently known. There is, however, about three or four leagues to the southwest of it, and very near the shore, a remarkable saddle hill, which is a good direction to it on that quarter. From one league to four leagues north of Cape Saunders, the shore forms two or three bays, in which there appeared to be good anchorage, and effectual shelter from the southwest westerly and northwesterly winds. But my desire of getting to the southward, in order to ascertain whether this country was an island or a continent, prevented my putting into any of them. We kept at a small distance from the shore all this morning, with the wind at southwest, and had a very distinct view of it. It is of a moderate height, and the surface is broken by many hills, which are green and woody, but we saw no appearance of inhabitants. At noon, Cape Saunders bore north 30 degrees west, distant about four leagues. We had variable winds and calms till five o'clock in the evening, when it fixed at west-southwest and soon blew so hard that it put us past our topsails and split the foresail all to pieces. After getting another to the yard, we continued to stand to the southward under two courses, and at six the next morning, the southernmost land in sight bore west by north, and Cape Saunders north by west, distant eight leagues. At noon it bore north twenty degrees west, fourteen leagues and our latitude by observation was 46 degrees 36 minutes. The gale continued with heavy squalls and a large hollow sea all the afternoon, and at seven in the evening we lay to under our foresail with the ship's head to the southward. At noon on the 27th our latitude was 46 degrees 54 minutes, and our longitude from Cape Saunders 1 degree 24 minutes east. At 7 in the evening we made sail under our courses, and at 8 the next morning set the topsails close reefed. At noon our latitude was 47 degrees 43 minutes, and our longitude east from Cape Saunders 2 degrees 10 minutes. At this time we wore and stood to the northward, in the afternoon we found the variation to be 16 degrees 34 minutes east. At 8 in the evening we tacked and stood to the southward with the wind at west. 
At noon this day, our latitude by account was 47 degrees 52 minutes, and our longitude from Cape Saunders 1 degree 8 minutes east. We stood to the southward till half an hour past three in the afternoon, and then, being in latitude 48 degrees south and longitude 188 degrees west, and seeing no appearance of land, we tacked and stood to the northward, having a large swell from the southwest by west. At noon the next day, our latitude was 46 degrees 42 minutes south, and Cape Saunders bore north 46 degrees west, distant 86 miles. The southwest swell, continuing till the third, confirmed our opinion that there was no land in that quarter. At four in the afternoon, we stood to the westward with all the sail we could make. In the morning of the 4th, we found the variation to be 16 degrees 16 minutes east. This day, we saw some whales and seals, as we had done several times after our having passed the strait. But we saw no seal while we were upon the coast of Ahainamawe. We sounded both in the night and this morning, but had no ground with 150 fathom. At noon we saw Cape Saunders bearing north a half west, and our latitude by observation was 46 degrees 31 minutes south. At half an hour past one o'clock, we saw land bearing west by south, which we steered for, and before it was dark were within three or four miles of it. During the whole night we saw fires upon it, and at seven in the morning were within about three leagues of the shore, which appeared to be high but level. At three o'clock in the afternoon we saw the land extending from northeast by north to northwest a half north, and soon after we discovered some low land, which appeared like an island, bearing south a half west. We continued our course to the west by south, and in two hours we saw high land over the lowland, extending to the southward as far as southwest by south, but did not appear to be joined to the land to the northward, so that there is either water, a deep bay, or lowland between them. At noon on the 6th, we were nearly in the same situation as at noon on the day before. In the afternoon, we found the variation by several azimuths and the amplitude to be 15 degrees 10 minutes east. On the 7th at noon, we were in latitude 47 degrees 6 minutes south and had made 12 miles easting during the last 24 hours. We stood to the westward the remainder of this day, and all the next till sunset, when the extremes of the land bore from north by east to west, distant about seven or eight leagues. In this situation our depth of water was 55 fathom, and the variation by amplitude 16 degrees 29 minutes east. The wind now veered from the north to the west, and as we had fine weather and moonlight, we kept standing close upon the wind to the southwest all night. At four in the morning we had sixty fathom water, and at daylight we discovered under our bow a ledge of rocks, extending from south by west to west by south, upon which the sea broke very high. They were not more than three quarters of a mile distant, yet we had five and forty fathom water. As the wind was at northwest, we could not now weather them, and as I was unwilling to run to leeward, I tacked and made a trip to the eastward. The wind, however, soon after coming to the northward, enabled us to get clear of all. Our soundings, while we were passing within the ledge, were from 35 to 47 fathom, with a rocky bottom. This ledge lies southeast six leagues from the southernmost part of the land, 
and southeast by east from some remarkable hills which stand near the shore about three leagues to the northward of it there is another ledge which lies full three leagues from the shore and on which the sea broke in a dreadful surf as we passed these rocks to the north in the night and discovered the others under our bow at break of day it is manifest that our danger was imminent and our escape critical in the highest degree from the situation of these rocks so well adapted to catch unwary strangers i called them the traps our latitude at noon was forty seven degrees twenty six minutes south the land in sight which had the appearance of an island extended from northeast by north to northwest by west and seemed to be about five leagues distant from the main the easternmost ledge of rocks bore south south east distant one league and a half and the northernmost northeast a half east distant about three leagues this land is high and barren with nothing upon it but a few straggling shrubs for not a single tree was to be seen it was however remarkable for a number of white patches which i took to be marble as they reflected the sun's rays very strongly other patches of the same kind we had observed in different parts of this country particularly in mercury bay we continued to stand close upon a wind to the westward and at sunset the southernmost point of land bore north thirty eight degrees east distant four leagues and the westernmost land in sight bore north two degrees east the point which lies in latitude forty seven degrees nineteen minutes south longitude one ninety two degrees twelve minutes west i named south cape the westernmost land was a small island lying off the point of the main supposing south cape to be the southern extremity of this country as indeed it proved to be i hoped to get round it by the west for a large hollow swell from the southwest, ever since our last hard gale had convinced me there was no land in that direction end of section one section two of the first voyage of james cook volume two by james cook seventeen twenty eight to seventeen seventy nine this librivox recording is in the public domain book two chapter seven part two range from cape turnagain southward along the eastern coast of poenamu round cape south and back to the western entrance of cook strait which completed the circumnavigation of this country with a description of the coast and of admiralty bay the departure from new zealand and various particulars continued in the night we had a hard gale at northeast by north and north which brought us under our courses but about eight in the morning it became moderate and at noon veering to the west we tacked and stood to the northward having no land in sight our latitude by observation was forty seven degrees thirty three minutes south our longitude west from the south cape fifty nine minutes we stood away north north east close upon a wind without seeing any land till two the next morning when we discovered an island bearing northwest by north, distant about five leagues. About two hours afterwards we saw land ahead, upon which we tacked and stood off till six, when we stood in to take a nearer view of it. At eleven we were within three leagues of it, but the wind seeming to incline upon the shore, I tacked and stood off to the southward. We had now sailed round the land which we had discovered on the 5th, and which then did not appear to be joined to the main, which lay north of it. 
and being now come to the other side of what we suppose to be water a bay or lowland it had the same appearance but when i came to lay it down upon paper i saw no reason to suppose it to be an island on the contrary i was clearly of opinion that it made part of the main at noon the western extremity of the main bore north fifty nine degrees west and the island which we had seen in the morning south fifty nine degrees west distant about five leagues it lies in latitude forty six degrees thirty one minutes south longitude one ninety two degrees forty nine minutes west and is nothing but a barren rock about a mile in circuit remarkably high and lies full five leagues distant from the main this island i named after dr zolander and called it zolander's island the shore of the main lies nearest east by south and west by north and forms a large open bay in which there is no appearance of any harbour or shelter for shipping against south-west and southerly winds the surface of the country is broken into craggy hills of a great height on the summits of which are several patches of snow it is not however wholly barren for we could see wood not only in the valleys but upon the highest ground yet we saw no appearance of its being inhabited we continued to stand to the south-west by south till eleven o'clock the next morning when the wind shifted to the south-west by west upon which we wore and stood to the north-north-west being then in latitude forty seven degrees forty minutes south longitude one ninety three degrees fifty minutes west and having a hollow sea from the south-west during the night we steered north north west till six in the morning when seeing no land we steered north by east till eight when we steered north east by east a half east to make the land which at ten we saw bearing east north east but it being hazy we could distinguish nothing upon it at noon our latitude by observation was forty six degrees south about two it cleared up and the land appeared to be high rude and mountainous about half an hour after three i hauled in for a bay in which there appeared to be good anchorage but in about an hour finding the distance too great to run before it would be dark and the wind blowing too hard to make the attempt safe in the night i bore away along the shore this bay which i called dusky bay lies in latitude forty five degrees forty seven minutes south it is between three and four miles broad at the entrance and seems to be full as deep as it is broad it contains several islands behind which there must be shelter from all winds though possibly there may not be sufficient depth of water the north point of this bay when it bears southeast by south is rendered very remarkable by five high peaked rocks which lie off it and have the appearance of the four fingers and thumb of a man's hand for which reason i called it point five fingers the land of this point is farther remarkable for being the only level land within a considerable distance it extends near two leagues to the northward is lofty and covered with wood the land behind it is very different consisting wholly of mountains totally barren and rocky and this difference gives the cape the appearance of an island at sunset the southernmost land in sight bore due south distant about five or six leagues and as this is the westernmost point of land upon the whole coast i called it west cape it lies about three leagues to the southward of dusky bay in the latitude of forty five degrees fifty four minutes south and in the longitude of one ninety three degrees seventeen minutes west the land of this cape is of a moderate height next the sea 
and has nothing remarkable about it except a very white cliff two or three leagues to the southward of it to the southward of it also the land trends away to the southeast and to the northward it trends north northeast having brought two for the night we made sail along the shore at four in the morning in the direction of northeast a half north with a moderate breeze at south southeast at noon our latitude by observation was forty five degrees thirty minutes south at this time being about a league and a half from the shore we sounded but had no ground with seventy fathom we had just passed a small narrow opening in land where there seemed to be a very safe and convenient harbour formed by an island which lay in the middle of the opening at east the opening lies in latitude forty five degrees sixteen minutes south and on the land behind it are mountains the summits of which were covered with snow that appeared to have been recently fallen and indeed for two days past we had found the weather very cold on each side of the entrance of the opening the land rises almost perpendicularly from the sea to a stupendous height and this indeed was the reason why i did not carry the ship into it for no wind could blow there but right in or right out in the direction of either east or west and i thought it by no means advisable to put into a place whence i could not have got out but with a wind which experience had taught me did not blow more than one day in a month in this however i acted contrary to the opinion of some persons on board who in very strong terms expressed their desire to harbour for present convenience without any regard to future disadvantages in the evening being about two leagues from the shore we sounded and had no ground with a hundred and eight fathom the variation of the needle by azimuth was fourteen degrees east and by amplitude fifteen degrees two minutes we made the best of our way along the shore with what wind we had keeping at the distance of between two and three leagues at noon we were in latitude forty four degrees forty seven minutes having run only twelve leagues upon a northeast one quarter north course during the last four and twenty hours we continued to steer along the shore in the direction of northeast one quarter east till six o'clock in the evening when we brought to for the night at four in the morning we stood in for the land and when the day broke we saw what appeared to be an inlet but upon a nearer approach proved to be only a deep valley between two highlands we proceeded therefore in the same course keeping the shore at the distance of between four and five miles at noon on the sixteenth the northernmost point of land in sight bore north sixty degrees east at the distance of ten miles and our latitude by observation was forty four degrees five minutes our longitude from cape west two degrees eight minutes east about two we passed the point which at noon had been distant ten miles and found it to consist of high red cliffs down which there fell a cascade of water in four small streams and i therefore gave it the name of cascade point from this point the land trends first north seventy six degrees east and afterwards more to the northward at the distance of eight leagues from cascade point in the direction of east north east and at a little distance from the shore lies a small low island which bore from us south by east at the distance of about a league and a half at seven in the evening we brought two in thirty-three fathom with a fine sandy bottom at ten we had fifty fathom and at twelve wore in sixty-five fathom 
having driven several miles north-northwest after our having brought two. At two in the morning we had no ground with a hundred and forty fathom, by which it appears that the soundings extend but a little way from the shore. About this time it fell calm. At eight a breeze sprung up at southwest, with which we steered along the shore, in the direction of northeast by east a half east, at the distance of about three leagues. At six in the evening, being about one league from the shore, we had seventeen fathom, and at eight, being about three leagues from the shore, we had forty-four. We now shortened sail and brought two, having run ten leagues northeast by east since noon. It was calm most part of the night, but at ten in the morning a light breeze sprung up at southwest by west when we made sail again along the shore northeast by north, having a large swell from the west southwest which had risen in the night. At noon our latitude by observation was 43 degrees 4 minutes south, and our longitude from Cape West, 4 degrees 12 minutes east. We observed that the valleys as well as the mountains were this morning covered with snow, part of which we supposed to have fallen during the night, when we had rain. At six in the evening we shortened sail, and at ten brought two, at the distance of about five leagues from the shore, where we had a hundred and fifteen fathom. At midnight, there being little wind, we made sail, and at eight in the morning we stood to the northeast close upon a wind till noon, when we tacked, being about three leagues from the land, and by observation, in latitude forty-two degrees eight minutes, and longitude from Cape West five degrees five minutes east. We continued to stand westward till two in the morning, when we made a trip to the eastward, and afterwards stood westward till noon, when, by our reckoning, we were in the latitude 42 degrees 23 minutes, and longitude from Cape West 3 degrees 55 minutes east. We now tacked and stood eastward, with a fresh gale at north by west, till six in the evening, when the wind shifted to the south and south southwest, with which we steered northeast by north till six in the morning, when we hauled in east by north to make the land, which we saw soon afterwards. At noon, our latitude by account was 41 degrees 37 minutes, and our longitude from Cape West, five degrees 42 minutes east. We were now within three or four leagues of the land, but it being foggy, we could see nothing upon it distinctly, and as we had much wind and a vast swell rolling in upon the shore from the west-southwest, I did not think it safe to go nearer. In the afternoon we had a gentle breeze from the south-southwest, with which we steered north along the shore till eight, when, being within two and three leagues, we sounded and had but thirty-four fathom, upon which we hauled off northwest by north till eleven at night, and then brought two, having sixty-four fathom. At four in the morning we made sail to the northeast with a light breeze at south-southwest, which at eight veered to the westward, and soon after died away. At this time we were within three or four miles of the land, and had fifty-four fathom, with a large swell from the west-southwest rolling obliquely upon the shore, which made me fear that I should be obliged to anchor. But by the help of a light air now and then from the southwest, I was able to keep the ship from driving. At noon, the northernmost land in sight bore northeast by east, a half east, distant about ten leagues. Our latitude by account was forty degrees fifty five minutes south, longitude from Cape West six degrees thirty five minutes east. 
From this time we had light airs from the southward with intervals of calm till noon on the 23rd when our latitude by observation was 40 degrees 36 minutes 30 seconds south and our longitude from Cape West 6 degrees 52 minutes east. The easternmost point of land in sight bore east 10 degrees north at the distance of 7 leagues and a bluff head or point of which we had been abreast at noon the day before and of which lay some rocks above water bore south 18 degrees west at the distance of six leagues this point i called rocks point our latitude was now 40 degrees 55 minutes south and having nearly run down the whole of the northwest coast of tovi poenano i shall give some account of the face of the country i have already observed that on the eleventh when we were off the southern part the land then seen was craggy and mountainous and there is great reason to believe that the same ridge of mountains extends nearly the whole length of the island between the westernmost land which we saw that day and at the easternmost which we saw on the thirteenth there is a space of about six or eight leagues of which we did not see the coast though we plainly discovered the mountains inland the sea coast near cape west is low rising with an easy and gradual ascent to the foot of the mountains and being in most parts covered with wood from point five fingers down to latitude forty four degrees twenty minutes there is a narrow ridge of hills that rises directly from the sea and is covered with wood close behind these hills are the mountains extending in another ridge of a stupendous height and consisting of rocks that are totally barren and naked except where they are covered with snow which is to be seen in large patches upon many parts of them and has probably lain there ever since the creation of the world a prospect more rude craggy and desolate than this country affords from the sea cannot possibly be conceived for as far inland as the eye can reach nothing appears but the summits of rocks which stand so near together that instead of valleys there are only fissures between them from the latitude of forty four degrees twenty minutes to the latitude of forty two degrees eight minutes these mountains lie farther inland and the sea coast consists of woody hills and valleys of various height and extent and has much appearance of fertility many of the valleys form plains of considerable extent wholly covered with wood but it is very probable that the ground in many places is swampy and interspersed with pools of water from latitude forty two degrees eight minutes to forty one degrees thirty minutes the land is not distinguished by anything remarkable it rises into hills directly from the sea and is covered with wood but the weather being foggy while we were upon this part of the coast we could see very little inland except now and then the summits of the mountains towering above the cloudy mists that obscured them below which confirmed my opinion that the chain of mountains extended from one end of the island to the other in the afternoon we had a gentle breeze at southwest which before it was quite dark brought us abreast of the eastern point which we had seen at noon but not knowing what course the land took on the other side of it we brought to in thirty-four fathom at the distance of about one league from the shore at eight in the evening there being little wind we filled and stood on till midnight and then we brought to till four in the morning when we again made sail and at break of day we saw low land extending from the point to the south south east as far as the eye could reach the eastern extremity of which appeared in round hillocks 
by this time the gale had veered to the eastward which obliged us to ply to windward at noon next day the eastern point bore southwest by south distant sixteen miles and our latitude was forty degrees nineteen minutes the wind continuing easterly we were nearly in the same situation at noon on the day following about three o'clock the wind came to the westward and we steered east south east with all the sail we could set till it was dark and then shortened sail till the morning as we had thick hazy weather all night we kept sounding continually and had from thirty seven to forty two fathom when the day broke we saw land bearing south east by east and an island lying near it bearing east south east distant about five leagues this island i knew to be the same that i had seen from the entrance of queen charlotte's sound from which it bears northwest by north distant nine leagues at noon it bore south distant four or five miles and the northwest head of the sound southeast by south distant ten leagues and a half our latitude by observation was forty degrees thirty three minutes south as we had now circumnavigated the whole country it became necessary to think of quitting it but as i had thirty tons of empty water casks on board this could not be done till i had filled them i therefore hauled round the island and entered a bay which lies between that and queen charlotte's sound leaving three more islands which lay close under the western shore between three or four miles within the entrance on our starboard hand while we were running in we kept the lead continually going and had from forty to twelve fathom at six o'clock in the evening we anchored in eleven fathom with a muddy bottom under the west shore in the second cove that lies within three islands and as soon as it was light the next morning i took a boat and went on shore to look for a watering place and a proper berth for the ship both which i found much to my satisfaction as soon as the ship was moored i sent an officer on shore to superintend the watering and the carpenter with his crew to cut wood while the longboat was employed in landing the empty casks in this employment we were busy till the thirtieth when the wind seeming to settle at south-east and our water being nearly completed we warped the ship out of the cove that we might have room to get under sail and at noon i went away in the pinnace to examine as much of the bay as my time would admit after rowing about two leagues up it i went ashore upon a point of land on the western side and having climbed a hill i saw the western arm of this bay run in southwest by west about five leagues farther yet i could not discover the end of it there appeared to be several other inlets or at least small bays between this and the northwest head of queen charlotte sound in each of which i make no doubt there is anchorage and shelter as they are all covered from the sea wind by the islands which lie without them the land about this bay as far as i could see of it is of a hilly surface chiefly covered with trees shrubs and fern which render travelling difficult and fatiguing in this excursion i was accompanied by mr banks and dr zollander who found several new plants we met with some huts which seemed to have been long deserted but saw no inhabitants mr banks examined several of the stones that lay upon the beach which were full of veins and had a mineral appearance but he did not discover anything in them which he knew to be ore if he had had an opportunity to examine any of the bare rocks perhaps he might have been more fortunate 
he was also of opinion that what I had taken for marble in another place was a mineral substance, and that, considering the correspondence of latitude between this place and South America, it was not improbable but that, by a proper examination, something very valuable might be found. At my return in the evening, I found all the wood and water on board, and the ship ready for the sea. I resolved, therefore, to quit the country, and return home by such a route as might be of most advantage to the service, and upon this subject took the opinion of my officers. I had myself a strong desire to return by Cape Horn, because that would have enabled me finally to determine whether there is or is not a southern continent. But against this it was a sufficient objection that we must have kept in a high southern latitude in the very depth of winter, with a vessel which was not thought sufficient for the undertaking, and the same reason was urged against our proceeding directly for the Cape of Good Hope, with still more force because no discovery of moment could be hoped for in that route. It was therefore resolved that we should return by the East Indies, and that with this view we should, upon leaving the coast, steer westward, till we should fall in with the east coast of New Holland, and then follow the direction of that coast to the northward, till we should arrive at its northern extremity. But if that should be found impracticable, it was further resolved that we should endeavour to fall in with the land or islands said to have been discovered by Quiros. With this view, at break of day on Saturday, the 31st of March, 1770, we got under sail and put to sea, with the advantage of a fresh gale at south-east and clear weather taking our departure from the eastern point, which we had seen at noon on the 23rd, and to which, on this occasion, I gave the name of Cape Farewell. The bay out of which we had just sailed I called Admiralty Bay, giving the name of Cape Stevens to the northwest point, and Cape Jackson to the southeast after the two gentlemen who at this time were secretaries to the board. Admiralty Bay may easily be known by the island that has just been mentioned, which lies two miles northeast of Cape Stevens, in latitude 40 degrees 37 minutes south, longitude 185 degrees 6 minutes west, and is of a considerable height. Between this island and Cape Farewell, which are between 14 and 15 leagues distant from each other, in the direction of west by north and east by south, the shore forms a large deep bay, the bottom of which we could scarcely see while we were sailing in a straight line from one cape to the other. It is, however, probably of less depth than it appeared to be, for as we found the water shallower here than at the same distance from any other part of the coast, there is reason to suppose that the land at the bottom which lies next to the sea is low, and therefore not easily to be distinguished from it. I have for this reason called it Blind Bay, and am of opinion that it is the same which was called Murderer's Bay by Tasman. Such particulars of this country and its inhabitants, with their manners and customs, as could be learned while we were circumnavigating the coast, shall now be related. End of section 2section three of the first voyage of James Cook, volume two by James Cook, 1728 to 1779. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 2, Chapter 8 A General Account of New Zealand 
its first discovery, situation, extent, climate, and productions. New Zealand was first discovered by Abel Janssen Tasman, a Dutch navigator whose name has been several times mentioned in this narrative, on the 13th of December in the year 1642. He traversed the eastern coast from latitude 34 degrees to 43 degrees and entered the strait which divides the two islands and in the chart is called Cook's Strait. But being attacked by the natives soon after he came to an anchor in the place to which he gave the name of Murderer's Bay, he never went on shore. He gave the country the name of Staatenland, or the Land of the States, in honour of the States General, and it is now generally distinguished in our maps and charts by the name of New Zealand. As the whole of this country, except that part of the coast which was seen by Tasman from on board his ship, has from his time to the voyage of the Endeavour, remained altogether unknown, it has by many been supposed to be part of a southern continent. It is, however, now known to consist of two large islands, divided from each other by a strait or passage, which is about four or five leagues broad. These islands are situated between the latitude of 34 degrees and 48 degrees south, and between the longitudes of 181 degrees and 194 degrees west, which is now determined with uncommon exactness from innumerable observations of the sun and moon and one of the transits of Mercury by Mr. Green, a person of known abilities who, as has been mentioned before, was sent out by the Royal Society to observe the transit of Venus in the South Seas. The northernmost of these islands is called by the natives Ehainamawe, and the southernmost Tovi or Tove Hoenamo. Yet, as I have observed before, we are not sure whether the name Tovi Poenamu comprehends the whole southern island or only part of it. The figure and extent of these islands, with the situation of the bays and harbours they contain, and the smaller islands that lie about them, will appear from the chart that I have drawn, every part of which, however, I cannot vouch to be equally accurate. The coast of our Haina Maui, from Cape Palliser to East Cape, is laid down with great exactness, both in its figure and the course and distance from point to point. For the opportunities that offered, and the methods that I used, were such as could scarcely admit of an error. From East Cape to St. Maria van Diemen, the chart, though perhaps not equally exact, is without any error of moment, except possibly in some few places which are here, and in other parts of the chart, distinguished by a dotted line, and which I had no opportunity to examine. From Cape Maria van Diemen to latitude 36 degrees 15 minutes, we were seldom nearer the shore than between five and eight leagues, and therefore the line that marks the sea coast may possibly be erroneous. From latitude 36 degrees 15 minutes, to nearly the length of Entry Island, our course was very near the shore, and in this part of the chart, therefore, there can be no material error, except perhaps at Cape Tierra Between Entry Island and Cape Palliser, we were again farther from the shore, and this part of the coast, therefore, may not be laid down with minute exactness. Yet, upon the whole, I am of opinion that this island will be found not much to differ from the figure that I have given it, and that upon the coast there are few or no harbours which are not noticed in the journal, 
or delineated in the chart. I cannot, however, say as much of Tovi Poenamu. The season of the year and the circumstances of the voyage would not permit me to spend so much time about this island as I had employed upon the other, and the storms that we met with made it both difficult and dangerous to keep near the shore. However, from Queen Charlotte Sound to Cape Campbell, and as far to the southwest as latitude 43 degrees, the chart will be found pretty accurate. Between latitude 43 degrees and latitude 44 degrees 20 minutes, the line may be doubted, for of some part of the coast which it represents, we had scarcely a view. From latitude 44 degrees 20 minutes to Cape Saunders, our distance would not permit me to be particular, and the weather was besides extremely unfavourable. From Cape Saunders to Cape South, and even to Cape West, there is also reason to fear that the chart will in many places be found erroneous, as we were seldom able to keep the shore, and were sometimes blown to such a distance that it could not be seen. From Cape West to Cape Farewell, and even to Charlotte Sound, it is not more to be trusted. Tovi Poenamu is for the most part a mountainous and to all appearance a barren country, and the people whom we saw in Queen Charlotte Sound, those that came off to us under the snowy mountains, and the fires to the west of Cape Saunders, were all the inhabitants and signs of inhabitants that we discovered upon the whole island. A Hainamawe has a much better appearance. It is indeed not only hilly but mountainous, yet even the hills and mountains are covered with wood, and every valley has a rivulet of water. The soil in these valleys and in the plains, of which there are many that are not overgrown with wood, is in general light but fertile, and in the opinion of Mr. Banks and Dr. Zollander, as well as of every other gentleman on board, all kinds of European grain, plants, and fruit would flourish here in the utmost luxuriance. From the vegetables that we found here, there is reason to conclude that the winters are milder than those in England, and we found the summer not hotter, though it was more equally warm, so that if this country should be settled by people from Europe, they would, with a little industry, be very soon supplied not only with the necessaries, but the luxuries of life in great abundance. In this country there are no quadrupeds but dogs and rats, at least we saw no other, and the rats are so scarce that many of us never saw them. The dogs live with the people, who breed them for no other purpose than to eat. There might indeed be quadrupeds that we did not see, but this is not probable, because the chief pride of the natives, with respect to their dress, is in the skins and hair of such animals as they have, and we never saw the skin of any animal about them but those of dogs and birds. There are indeed seals upon the coast, and we once saw a sea lion, but we imagine that they are seldom caught, for though we saw some of their teeth, which were fastened into an ornament like a botkin, and worn by the natives at their breast, and highly valued, we saw none of their skins. There are whales also upon this coast, and though the people did not appear to have any art or instrument by which such an animal could be taken and killed, we saw patu patus in the possession of some of them, which were made of the bone of a whale or of some other animal whose bone had exactly the same appearance. Of birds the species are not many, and of these none, except perhaps the gannet, is the same with those of Europe. Here are ducks indeed, and shags of several kinds, sufficiently resembling those of Europe, to be called the same by those who have not examined them very nicely. 
Here are also hawks, owls and quails, which differ but little from those of Europe at first sight, and several small birds whose song, as has been remarked in the course of this narrative, is much more melodious than any that we had ever heard. The sea coast is also visited by many oceanic birds, particularly albatrosses, shearwaters, pintados, and a few of the birds which Sir John Narborough has called penguins, and which indeed are what the French call nuance, and seem to be a middle species between bird and fish, for their feathers especially those upon their wings, differ very little from scales, and their wings themselves, which they use only in diving, and not to accelerate their motion, even upon the surface of the water, may, perhaps with equal propriety, be called fins. Neither are insects in greater plenty than birds. A few butterflies and beetles, flesh flies very like those in europe and some mosquitoes and sand flies perhaps exactly the same with those of north america make up the whole catalogue of mosquitoes and sand flies however which are justly accounted the curse of every country where they abound we did not see many there were indeed a few in almost every place where we went on shore but they gave us so little trouble that we did not make use of the shades which we had provided for the security of our faces. For this scarcity of animals upon the land, the sea, however, makes an abundant recompense. Every creek swarming with fish, which are not only wholesome, but equally delicious with those of Europe. The ship seldom anchored in any station, or with a light gale past any place that did not afford us enough with hook and line to serve the whole ship's company especially to the southward when we lay at anchor the boats with hook and line near the rocks could take fish in any quantity and the seine seldom failed of producing a still more ample supply so that both times when we anchored in cook strait Every mess in the ship that was not careless and improvident salted as much as lasted many weeks after they went to sea. Of this article, the variety was equal to the plenty. We had mackerel of many kinds, among which one was exactly the same as we have in England. These came in immense shoals and were taken by the natives in their sends who sold them to us at a very easy rate. Beside these, there were fish of many species, which we had never seen before, but to all which the seamen very readily gave names, so that we talked here as familiarly of hakes, bream, coalfish, and many others, as we do in England. And though they are by no means of the same family, it must be confessed that they do honour to the name. But the highest luxury which the sea afforded us, even in this place, was the lobster or sea crayfish, which are probably the same that in the account of Lord Anson's voyage are said to have been found at the island of Juan Fernandez, except that, though large, they are not quite equal in size. They differ from ours in England in several particulars. They have a greater number of prickles on their backs, and they are red when first taken out of the water. These we also bought everywhere to the northward in great quantities of the natives, who catch them by diving near the shore and finding out where they lie with their feet. We had also a fish that Frezier, in his voyage to the Spanish main in South America, has described by the names of elephant, pejagallo, or poison cock, which, though coarse, we eat very heartily. Several species of the skate or stingray are also found here, which were still coarser than the elephant, but as an atonement, 
we had among many kinds of dogfish one spotted with white which was in flavour exactly similar to our best skate but much more delicious we had also flat fish resembling both soles and flounders besides eels and congers of various kinds with many others of which those who shall hereafter visit this coast will not fail to find the advantage and shellfish in great variety particularly clams cockles and oysters among the vegetable productions of this country the trees claim a principal place for here are forests of vast extent full of the straightest the cleanest and the largest timber trees that we had ever seen their size their grain and apparent durability render them fit for any kind of building and indeed for every other purpose except masts for which as i have already observed they are too hard and too heavy there is one in particular which when we were upon the coast was rendered conspicuous by a scarlet flower that seemed to be a compendage of many fibres it is about as large as an oak and the wood is exceedingly hard and heavy and excellently adapted to the use of the millwright there is another which grows in the swamps remarkably tall and straight thick enough to make masts for vessels of any size and if a judgment may be formed by the direction of its grain very tough this which as has been before remarked our carpenter thought to resemble the pitch pine may probably be lightened by tapping and it will then make the finest masts in the world it has a leaf not unlike a yew and bears berries in small bunches great part of the country is covered with a luxuriant verdure and our natural historians were gratified by the novelty if not the variety of the plants so thistle garden nightshade one or two kinds of grass the same as in england and two or three kinds of fern like those of the west indies with a few of the plants that are to be found in almost every part of the world were all out of about four hundred species that have hitherto been described by any botanists or had been seen elsewhere during the course of this voyage except about five or six which had been gathered at terra del fuego of eatable vegetables there are but few our people indeed who had been long at sea eat with equal pleasure and advantage of wild celery and a kind of cresses which grew in great abundance upon all parts of the seashore we also once or twice met with a plant like what the country people in england call lamb's quarters or fat hen which we boiled instead of greens and once we had the good fortune to find a cabbage tree which afforded us a delicious meal and except the fern root and one other vegetable totally unknown in europe and which though eaten by the natives was extremely disagreeable to us we found no other vegetable production that was fit for food among those that appeared to be the wild produce of the country and we could find but three esculent plants among those which are raised by cultivation yams sweet potatoes and cocos of the yams and potatoes there are plantations consisting of many acres and i believe that any ship which should happen to be here in the autumn when they are dug up might purchase them in any quantity gourds are also cultivated by the natives of this place the fruit of which furnishes them with vessels for various uses we also found here the chinese paper mulberry tree the same as that of which the inhabitants of the south sea islands make their cloth but it is so scarce that though the new zealanders also make cloth of it 
they have not enough for any other purpose than to wear as an ornament in the holes which they make in their ears, as I have observed before. But among all the trees, shrubs, and plants of this country, there is not one that produces fruit, except a berry which has neither sweetness nor flavour, and which none but the boys took pains to gather should be honoured with that appellation. There is, however, a plant that serves the inhabitants instead of hemp and flax, which excels all that are put to the same purpose in other countries. Of this plant there are two sorts. The leaves of both resemble those of flags, but the flowers are smaller and their clusters more numerous. In one kind they are yellow and in the other a deep red. Of the leaves of these plants, with very little preparation, they make all their common apparel, and of these they make also their strings, lines, and cordage for every purpose, which are so much stronger than anything we can make with hemp that they will not bear a comparison. From the same plant, by another preparation, they draw long slender fibres which shine like silk and are as white as snow. Of these, which are also surprisingly strong, the finer clothes are made, and of the leaves, without any other preparation than splitting them into proper breadths and tying the strips together, they make their fishing nets, some of which, as I have before remarked, are of an enormous size. A plant which, with such advantage, might be applied to so many useful and important purposes, would certainly be a great acquisition to England, where it would probably thrive with very little trouble, as it seems to be hardy and to affect no particular soil, being found equally in hill and valley, in the driest mould and the deepest bogs. The bog, however, it seems rather to prefer, as near such places we observed it to be larger than elsewhere. I have already observed that we found great plenty of iron sand in Mercury Bay, and therefore that iron ore is undoubtedly to be found at no great distance. As to other metals, we had scarcely knowledge enough of the country for conjecture. If the settling of this country should ever be thought an object worthy the attention of Great Britain, the best place for establishing a colony would be either on the banks of the Thames or in the country bordering upon the Bay of Islands. In either place there would be the advantage of an excellent harbour, and, by means of the river, settlements might be extended and a communication established with the inland parts of the country. Vessels might be built of the fine timber which abounds in these parts, and very little trouble and expense, fit for such a navigation as would answer the purpose. I cannot indeed exactly assign the depth of water which a vessel intended to navigate this river, even as far up as I went with a boat, should draw because this depends upon the depth of water that is upon the bar or flats which lie before the narrow part of the river, for I had no opportunity to make myself acquainted with them, but I am of opinion that a vessel which should draw no more than twelve feet would perfectly answer the purpose. When we first arrived upon the coast of this country, we imagined it to be much better peopled than we afterwards found it, concluding that the inland parts were populous from the smoke that we saw at a considerable distance from the shore, and perhaps that may really be the case with respect to the country behind Poverty Bay and the Bay of Plenty, where the inhabitants appeared to be more numerous than in other places but we had reason to believe that in general no part of the country but the sea coast is inhabited 
and even there we found the people but thinly scattered. All the western coast from Cape Maria van Diemen to Mount Egmont being totally desolate, so that upon the whole the number of inhabitants bears no proportion to the extent of country. End of section three. Section four of the first voyage of James Cook, volume two by James Cook, 1728 to 1779. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book two, chapter nine. A description of the inhabitants, their habitations, apparel, ornaments, food, cookery, and manner of life. The stature of the men in general is equal to the largest of those in Europe. They are stout, well-limbed, and fleshy, but not fat like the lazy and luxurious inhabitants of the islands in the South Seas. They are also exceedingly vigorous and active, and have an adroitness and manual dexterity in an uncommon degree, which are discovered in whatever they do. I have seen the strokes of fifteen paddles on a side in one of their canoes, made with incredible quickness, and yet with such minute exactness of time, that all the rowers seem to be actuated by one common soul. Their colour in general is brown, but in few deeper than that of a Spaniard, who has been exposed to the sun, in many not so deep. The women have not a feminine delicacy in their appearance, but their voice is remarkably soft, and by that the dress of both sexes being the same, they are principally distinguished. They have, however, like the women of other countries, more airy cheerfulness, and a greater flow of animal spirits than the other sex. Their hair, both of the head and beard, is black, and their teeth extremely regular and as white as ivory. The features of both sexes are good. They seem to enjoy high health, and we saw many who appeared to be of a great age. The dispositions both of the men and women seem to be mild and gentle. They treat each other with the tenderest affection, but are implacable towards their enemies, to whom, as I have before observed, they never give quarter. It may perhaps at first seem strange that where there is so little to be got by victory, there should so often be war, and that every little district of a country inhabited by people so mild and placid should be at enmity with all the rest. But possibly more is to be gained by victory among these people than at first appears, and they may be prompted to mutual hostilities by motives which no degree of friendship or affection is able to resist. It appears by the account that has already been given of them that their principal food is fish, which can only be procured upon the sea coast and there in sufficient quantities only at certain times. The tribes, therefore, who live inland, if any such there are, and even those upon the coast, must be frequently in danger of perishing by famine. Their country produces neither sheep, nor goats, nor hogs, nor cattle. Tame fowls they have none, nor any art by which those that are wild can be caught in sufficient plenty to serve as provision. If there are any whose situation cuts them off from a supply of fish, the only succedaneum of all other animal food except dogs, they have nothing to support life but the vegetables that have already been mentioned, of which the chief are fern root, yams, clams, and potatoes. When by any accident these fail, the distress must be dreadful. And even among the inhabitants of the coast, 
many tribes must frequently be reduced to nearly the same situation, either by the failure of their plantations or the deficiency of their dry stock during the season when but few fish are to be caught. These considerations will enable us to account not only for the perpetual danger in which the people who inhabit this country appear to live by the care which they take to fortify every village, but for the horrid practice of eating those who are killed in battle, for the hunger of him who is pressed by famine to fight will absorb every feeling and every sentiment which would restrain him from allaying it with the body of his adversary. It may, however, be remarked that, if this account of the origin of so horrid a practice is true, the mischief does by no means end with the necessity that produced it. After the practice has been once begun on one side by hunger, it will naturally be adopted on the other by revenge. Nor is this all, for though it may be pretended, by some who wish to appear speculative and philosophical, that whether the dead body of an enemy be eaten or buried is in itself a matter perfectly indifferent, as it is, whether the breasts or thighs of a woman should be covered or naked, and that prejudice and habit only make us shudder at the violation of custom in one instance, and blush at it in the other. Yet leaving this as a point of doubtful disputation to be discussed at leisure, it may safely be affirmed that the practice of eating human flesh, whatever it may be in itself, is relatively, and in its consequences, most pernicious, tending manifestly to eradicate a principle which is the chief security of human life, and more frequently restrains the hand of murder than the sense of duty or even the fear of punishment. Among those who are accustomed to eat the dead, death must have lost much of its horror, and where there is little horror at the sight of death, there will not be much repugnance to kill. A sense of duty and fear of punishment may be more easily surmounted than the feelings of nature, or those which have been engrafted upon nature by early prejudice and uninterrupted custom. The horror of the murderer arises less from the guilt of the fact than its natural effect, and he who has familiarized the effect will consequently lose much of the horror. By our laws and our religion, Murder and theft incur the same punishment, both in this world and the next. Yet of the multitude who would deliberately steal, there are but very few who would deliberately kill, even to procure much greater advantage. But there is the strongest reason to believe that those who have been so accustomed to prepare a human body for a meal, that they can with as little feeling cut up a dead man, as our cookmaids divide a dead rabbit for a fricassee, would feel as little horror in committing a murder as in picking a pocket, and consequently would take away life with as little compunction as property. So that men under these circumstances would be made murderers by the slight temptations that now make them thieves. If any man doubts whether this reasoning is conclusive, let him ask himself whether in his own opinion he should not be safer with a man in whom the horror of destroying life is strong, whether in consequence of natural instinct unsubdued or of early prejudice, which has nearly an equal influence, than in the power of a man who under any temptation to murder him would be restrained only by considerations of interest for to these all motives of mere duty may be reduced, as they must terminate either in hope of good or fear of evil. The situation and circumstances, however, of these poor people, as well as their temper, are favourable to those who shall settle as a colony among them. Their situation sets them in need of protection, and their temper renders it easy to attach them by kindness, 
and whatever may be said in favour of a savage life among people who live in luxurious idleness upon the bounty of nature civilization would certainly be a blessing to those whom her parsimony scarcely furnishes with the bread of life and who are perpetually destroying each other by violence as the only alternative of perishing by hunger but these people from whatever cause being inured to war and by habit considering every stranger as an enemy were always disposed to attack us when they were not intimidated by our manifest superiority at first they had no notion of any superiority but numbers and when this was on their side they considered all our expressions of kindness as the artifices of fear and cunning to circumvent them and preserve ourselves but when they were once convinced of our power after having provoked us to the use of our firearms though loaded only with small shot and of our clemency by our forbearing to make use of weapons so dreadful except in our defence they became at once friendly and even affectionate placing in us the most unbounded confidence and doing everything which could incite us to put equal confidence in them it is also remarkable that when an intercourse was once established between us they were very rarely detected in any act of dishonesty before indeed and while they considered us as enemies who came upon their coast only to make an advantage of them they did not scruple by any means to make any advantage of us and would therefore when they had received the price of anything they had offered to sell pack up both the purchase and the purchase money with all possible composure as so much lawful plunder from people who had no view but to plunder them i have observed that our friends in the south seas had not even the idea of indecency with respect to any object or any action but this was by no means the case with the inhabitants of new zealand in whose carriage and conversation there was as much modesty reserve and decorum with respect to actions which yet in their opinion were not criminal as are to be found among the politest people in europe the women were not impregnable but the terms and manner of compliance were as decent as those in marriage among us and according to their notions the agreement was as innocent when any of our people made an overture to one of their young women he was given to understand that the consent of her friends was necessary and by the influence of a proper present it was generally obtained but when these preliminaries were settled it was also necessary to treat the wife for a night with the same delicacy that is here required by the wife for life and the lover who presumed to take any liberties by which this was violated was sure to be disappointed one of our gentlemen having made his addresses to a family of the better sort received an answer which translated into our language according to the mode and spirit of it as well as the letter would have been exactly in these terms any of these young ladies will think themselves honoured by your addresses but you must first make me a suitable present and you must then come and sleep with us on shore for daylight must by no means be a witness of what passes between you i have already observed that in personal cleanliness they are not quite equal to our friends at otaheite because not having the advantage of so warm a climate they do not so often go into the water but the most disgustful thing about them is the oil with which like the islanders they anoint their hair it is certainly the fat either of fish or of birds melted down and though the better sort have it fresh their inferiors use that which is rancid 
and consequently are almost as disagreeable to the smell as a Hottentot. Neither are their heads free from vermin, though we observe that they were furnished with combs, both of bone and wood. These combs are sometimes worn stuck upright in the hair as an ornament, a fashion which at present prevails among the ladies of England. The men generally wear their beards short and their hair tied upon the crown of the head in a bunch, in which they stick the feathers of various birds in different manners, according to their fancies. Sometimes one is placed on each side of the temples, pointing forwards, which we thought made a very disagreeable appearance. The women wear their hair sometimes cropped short, and sometimes flowing over their shoulders. The bodies of both sexes are marked with the black stains called amoko, by the same method that is used at Otaheite, and called tattooing. But the men are more marked and the women less. The women in general stain no part of their bodies but the lips, though sometimes they are marked with small black patches on other parts. The men, on the contrary, seem to add something every year to the ornaments of the last, so that some of them, who appeared to be of an advanced age, were almost covered from head to foot. Besides the Amoko, they have marks impressed by a method unknown to us of a very extraordinary kind. They are furrows of about a line deep and a line broad, such as appear upon the bark of a tree which has been cut through after a year's growth. The edges of these furrows are afterwards indented by the same method, and being perfectly black, they make a most frightful appearance. The faces of the old men are almost covered with these marks. Those who are very young black only their lips like the women, when they are somewhat older, they have generally a black patch upon one cheek and over one eye, and so proceed gradually that they may grow old and honourable together. But though we could not but be disgusted with the horrid deformity which these stains and furrows produced in the human face divine, we could not but admire the dexterity and art with which they were impressed. The marks upon the face in general are spirals, which are drawn with great nicety and even elegance, those on one side exactly corresponding with those on the other. The marks on the body somewhat resemble the foliage in old chaste ornaments and the convolutions of filigree work, but in these they have such a luxuriance of fancy that of an hundred which at first sight appeared to be exactly the same, no two were, upon a close examination, found to be alike. We observed that the quantity and form of these marks were different in different parts of the coast, and that as the principal seat of them at Otaheite was the breach, in New Zealand it was sometimes the only part which was free, and in general was less distinguished than any other. The skins of these people, however, are not only dyed but painted, for, as I have before observed, they smear their bodies with red ochre, some rubbing it on dry and some applying it in large patches mixed with oil, which is always wet, and which the least touch will rub off, so that the transgressions of such of our people as were guilty of ravishing a kiss from these blooming beauties were most legibly written upon their faces. The dress of a New Zealander is certainly, to a stranger at first sight, the most uncouth that can be imagined. It is made of the leaves of the flag, which have been described among the vegetable productions of this country. These leaves are split into three or four slips, and the slips, when they are dry, interwoven with each other into a kind of stuff between netting and cloth, with all the ends, which are eight or nine inches long, 
hanging out on the upper side, like the shag or thromp mats, which we sometimes see lying in a passage. Of this cloth, if cloth it may be called, two pieces serve for a complete dress. One of them is tied over their shoulders with a string and reaches as low as the knees. To the end of this string is fastened a bodkin of bone, which is easily passed through any two parts of this upper garment so as to tack them together. The other piece is wrapped round the waist and reaches nearly to the ground. The lower garment, however, is worn by the men only upon particular occasions, but they wear a belt to which a string is fastened for a very singular use. The inhabitants of the South Sea Islands slit up the prepuce so as to prevent it from covering the glands of the penis, but these people, on the contrary, bring the prepuce over the glands, and to prevent it from being drawn back by the contraction of the part, they tie the string which hangs from their girdle round the end of it. The glands, indeed, seem to be the only part of their body which they were solicitous to conceal, for they frequently threw off all their dress but the belt and string, with the most careless indifference, but showed manifest signs of confusion when, to gratify our curiosity, they were requested to untie the string, and never consented but with the utmost reluctance and shame. When they have only their upper garment on and sit upon their hands, they bear some resemblance to a thatched house. But this covering, though it is ugly, is well adapted to the use of those who frequently sleep in the open air without any other shelter from the rain. But besides this coarse shag or thatch, they have two sorts of cloth which have an even surface and are very ingeniously made in the same manner with that manufactured by the inhabitants of South America, some of which we procured at Rio de Janeiro. One sort is as coarse as our coarsest canvas, and somewhat resembles it in the manner of laying the threads, but it is ten times as strong. The other is formed by many threads lying very close one way, and a few crossing them the other, so as to bind them together. But these are about half an inch asunder, somewhat like the round pieces of cane matting, which are sometimes placed under the dishes upon a table. This is frequently striped, and always had a pretty appearance, for it is composed of the fibres of the same plant, which are prepared so as to shine like silk. It is made in a kind of frame of the size of the cloth, generally about five feet long and four broad, across which the long threads, which lie close together or warp, are strained, and the cross threads or woof are worked in by hand, which must be a very tedious operation. To both these kinds of cloth they work borders of different colours, in stitches somewhat like carpeting, or rather like those used in the samplers which girls work at school. These borders are of various patterns, and wrought with a neatness, and even an elegance which, considering they have no needle, is surprising but the great pride of their dress consists in the fur of their dogs, which they use with such economy that they cut it into stripes and sew them upon their cloth at a distance from each other, which is a strong proof that dogs are not plenty among them. These stripes are also of different colours and disposed so as to produce a pleasing effect. We saw some dresses that were adorned with feathers instead of fur, but these were not common, and we saw one that was entirely covered with the red feathers of the parrot. The dress of the man who was killed when we first went ashore in Poverty Bay has been described already, but we saw the same dress only once more during our stay upon the coast, and that was in Queen Charlotte's Sound. The women, 
contrary to the custom of the sex in general, seem to affect dress rather less than the men. Their hair, which, as I have observed before, is generally cropped short, is never tied upon the top of the head when it is suffered to be long, nor is it ever adorned with feathers. Their garments were made of the same materials and in the same form as those of the other sex, but the lower one was always bound fast round them, except when they went into the water to catch lobsters, and then they took great care not to be seen by the men. Some of us happening one day to land upon a small island in Telaga Bay, we surprised several of them at this employment, and the chaste Diana, with her nymphs, could not have discovered more confusion and distress at the sight of Actium than these women expressed upon our approach. Some of them hid themselves among the rocks, and the rest crouched down in the sea till they had made themselves a girdle and apron of such weeds as they could find, and when they came out, even with this veil, we could perceive that their modesty suffered much pain by our presence. The girdle and apron which they wear in common have been mentioned before. Both sexes bore their ears, and by stretching them, the holes become large enough to admit a finger at least. In these holes they wear ornaments of various kinds, cloth, feathers, bones of large birds, and even sometimes a stick of wood and to these receptacles of finery they generally applied the nails which we gave them, and everything which it was possible they could contain. The women sometimes thrust through them the down of the albatross, which is as white as snow, and which, spreading before and behind the hole in a bunch almost as big as the fist, makes a very singular, and, however strange it may be thought, not a disagreeable appearance. Besides the ornaments that are thrust through the holes of the ears, many others are suspended to them by strings, such as chisels or botkins made of green talc, upon which they set a high value, the nails and teeth of their deceased relations, the teeth of dogs, and everything else that they can get, which they think either curious or valuable. The women also wear bracelets and anklets made of the bones of birds, shells, or any other substance which they can perforate and string upon a thread. The men had sometimes hanging to a string, which went round the neck, a piece of green talc or whalebone, somewhat in the shape of a tongue, with the rude figure of a man carved upon it, and upon this ornament they set a high value. In one instance, we saw the gristle that divides the nostrils, and called by anatomists the septum nasi, perforated, and a feather thrust through the hole, which projected on each side over the cheeks. It is probable that this frightful singularity was intended as an ornament, but of the many people we saw, we never observed it in any other nor even a perforation that might occasionally serve for such a purpose. Their houses are the most inartificially made of anything among them, being scarcely equal except in size to an English dock kennel. They are seldom more than 18 or 20 feet long, 8 or 10 broad, and 5 or 6 high, from the pole that runs from one end to the other and forms the ridge, to the ground. The framing is of wood, generally slender sticks, and both walls and roof consist of dry grass and hay, which, it must be confessed, is very tightly put together, and some are also lined with the bark of trees, so that in cold weather they must afford a very comfortable retreat. The roof is sloping like those of our barns, and the door is at one end just high enough to admit a man creeping upon his hands and knees. Near the door is a square hole, which serves the double office of window and chimney, 
for the fireplace is at that end, nearly in the middle between the two sides. In some conspicuous part, and generally near the door, a plank is fixed, covered with carving after their manner. This they value as we do a picture, and in their estimation it is not an inferior ornament. The side walls and roof project about two feet beyond the walls at each end, so as to form a kind of porch, in which there are benches for the accommodation of the family. That part of the floor which is allotted for the fireplace is enclosed in a hollow square by partitions either of wood or stone, and in the middle of it the fire is kindled. The floor along the inside of the walls is thickly covered with straw, and upon this the family sleep. Their furniture and implements consist of but few articles, and one chest commonly contains them all, except their provision baskets, the gourds that hold their fresh water, and the hammers that are used to beat their fern root, which generally stand without the door. Some rude tools, their clothes, arms, and a few feathers to stick in their hair make the rest of their treasure. Some of the better sort, whose families are large, have three or four houses enclosed within a courtyard, the walls of which are constructed of poles and hay, and are about ten or twelve feet high. When we were on shore in the district called Talaga, we saw the ruins, or rather the frame of a house, for it had never been finished, much superior in size to any that we saw elsewhere. It was thirty feet in length, about fifteen in breadth, and twelve high. The sides of it were adorned with many carved planks, of a workmanship much superior to any other that we had met with in the country. But for what purpose it was built, or why it was deserted, we could never learn. But these people, though in their houses they are so well defended from the inclemency of the weather, seem to be quite indifferent whether they have any shelter at all during their excursions in search of fern roots and fish, sometimes setting up a small shade to windward, and sometimes altogether neglecting even that precaution, sleeping with their women and children under bushes, with their weapons ranged round them, in the manner that has already been described. The party, consisting of forty or fifty, whom we saw at Mercury Bay, in a district which the natives call Opurage, never erected the least shelter while we stayed there, though it sometimes rained incessantly for four and twenty hours together. The articles of their food have been enumerated already. The principal, which to them is what bread is to the inhabitants of Europe, is the roots of the fern which grows upon the hills, and is nearly the same with what grows upon our high commons in England, and is called indifferently fern, bracken, or brakes. The birds, which sometimes serve them for a feast, are chiefly penguins and albatrosses, with a few other species that have been occasionally mentioned in this narrative. Having no vessel in which water can be boiled, their cookery consists wholly of baking and roasting. They bake nearly in the same manner as the inhabitants of the South Seas, and to the account that has been already given of their roasting, nothing need be added but that the long skewer or spit to which the flesh is fastened is placed sloping towards the fire by setting one stone against the bottom of it and supporting it near the middle with another by the moving of which, to a greater or less distance from the end, the degree of obliquity is increased or diminished at pleasure. To the northward, as I have observed, there are plantations of yams, sweet potatoes, and cocos, but we saw no such to the southward. The inhabitants, therefore, of that part of the country must subsist wholly upon fern root and fish, 
except the scanty and accidental resource which they may find in sea fowl and dogs and that fern and fish are not to be procured at all seasons of the year even at the seaside and upon the neighbouring hills is manifest from the stores of both that we saw laid up dry and the reluctance which some of them expressed at selling any part of them to us when we offered to purchase them at least the fish for sea stores and this particular seems to confirm my opinion that this country scarcely sustains the present number of its inhabitants who are urged to perpetual hostilities by hunger which naturally prompted them to eat the dead bodies of those who were slain in the contest water is their universal and only liquor as far as we could discover and if they have really no means of intoxication they are in this particular happy beyond any other people that we have yet seen or heard of as there is perhaps no source of disease either critical or chronic but intemperance and inactivity it cannot be thought strange that these people enjoy perfect and uninterrupted health in all our visits to their towns where young and old men and women crowded about us prompted by the same curiosity that carried us to look at them we never saw a single person who appeared to have any bodily complaint nor among the numbers that we have seen naked did we once perceive the slightest eruption upon the skin or any marks that an eruption had left behind at first indeed observing that some of them when they came off to us were marked in patches with a white flowery appearance upon different parts of their bodies we thought that they were leprous or highly scorbutic but upon examination we found that these marks were owing to their having been wetted by the spray of the sea in their passage which when it was dried away left the salts behind it in a fine white powder another proof of health which we have mentioned upon a former occasion is the facility with which the wounds healed that had left scars behind them and that we saw in a recent state when we saw the man who had been shot with a musket ball through the fleshy part of his arm his wound seemed to be so well digested and in so fair a way of being perfectly healed that if i had not known no application had been made to it i should certainly have inquired with a very interested curiosity after the vulnerary herbs and surgical art of the country a farther proof that human nature is here untainted with disease is the great number of old men that we saw many of whom by the loss of their hair and teeth appeared to be very ancient yet none of them were decrepit and though not equal to the young in muscular strength were not a whit behind them in cheerfulness and vivacity end of section four Section 5 of The First Voyage of James Cook, Volume 2, by James Cook, 1728-1779. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 2, Chapter 10 Of the Canoes and Navigation of the Inhabitants of New Zealand their tillage weapons and music government religion and language with some reasons against the existence of a southern continent the ingenuity of these people appears in nothing more than in their canoes they are long and narrow and in shape very much resemble a new england whaleboat the larger sort seem to be built chiefly for war and will carry from forty to eighty or an hundred armed men we measured one which lay ashore at talaga she was sixty-eight feet and a half long 
five feet broad and three feet and a half deep. The bottom was sharp, with straight sides like a wedge, and consisted of three lengths, hollowed out to about two inches, or an inch and a half thick, and well fastened together with strong plating. Each side consisted of one entire plank, 63 feet long, 10 or 12 inches broad, and about an inch and quarter thick, and these were fitted and lashed to the bottom part with great dexterity and strength. A considerable number of thwarts were laid from gunwale to gunwale, to which they were securely lashed on each side, as a strengthening to the boat. The ornament at the head projected five or six feet beyond the body, and was about four feet and a half high. The ornament at the stern was fixed upon that end, as the stern post of a ship is upon her keel, and was about fourteen feet high, two feet broad, and an inch and a half thick. They both consisted of boards of carved wood, of which the design was much better than the execution. All their canoes, except a few at Opourage or Mercury Bay, which were of one piece and hollowed by fire, are built after this plan, and few are less than twenty feet long. Some of the smaller sort have outriggers, and sometimes two of them are joined together, but this is not common. The carving upon the stern and head ornaments of the inferior boats, which seem to be intended wholly for fishing, consists of the figure of a man, with a face as ugly as can be conceived, and a monstrous tongue thrust out of the mouth, with the white shells of sea ear stuck in for the eyes. But the canoes of the superior sort, which seem to be their men of war, are magnificently adorned with open work, and covered with loose fringes of black feathers, which had a most elegant appearance. The gunwale boards were also frequently carved in a grotesque taste, and adorned with tufts of white feathers placed upon a black ground. Of visible objects that are wholly new, no verbal description can convey a just idea, but in proportion as they resemble some that are already known, to which the mind of the reader must be referred, the carving of these people being of a singular kind, and not in the likeness of anything that is known on our side of the ocean, either in the heaven above, or in the earth beneath, or in the waters that are under the earth, I must refer wholly to the representations which will be found of it in plate 15. The paddles are small, light, and neatly made. The blade is of an oval shape, or rather of a shape resembling a large leaf, pointed at the bottom, broadest in the middle, and gradually losing itself in the shaft, the whole length being about six feet, of which the shaft or loom, including the handle, is four, and the blade two. By the help of these oars, they push on their boats with amazing velocity. In sailing, they are not expert, having no art of going otherwise than before the wind. The sail is of netting or mat, which is set up between two poles that are fixed upright upon each gunwale, and serve both for masts and yards. Two ropes answered the purpose of sheets, and were consequently fastened above to the top of each pole. But clumsy and inconvenient as this apparatus is, they make good way before the wind, and are steered by two men who sit in the stern, with each a paddle in his hand for that purpose. Having said thus much of their workmanship, I shall now give some account of their tools. They have adzes, axes, and chisels, which serve them also as augers for the boring of holes. As they have no metal, their adzes and axes are made of a hard black stone or of a green talc, which is not only hard but tough, and their chisels of human bone 
or small fragments of jasper which they chip off from a block in sharp angular pieces like a gun flint their axes they value above all that they possess and would never part with one of them for anything that we could give i once offered one of the best axes i had in the ship besides a number of other things for one of them but the owner would not sell it from which i conclude that good ones are scarce among them their small tools of jasper which are used in finishing their nicest work they use till they are blunt and then as they have no means of sharpening them throw them away we had given the people at talaga a piece of glass and in a short time they found means to drill a hole through it in order to hang it round the neck as an ornament by a thread and we imagine the tool must have been a piece of this jasper how they bring their large tools first to an edge and sharpen the weapon which they call patu patu we could not certainly learn but probably it is by bruising the same substance to powder and with this grinding two pieces against each other their nets particularly their sen which is of an enormous size have been mentioned already one of these seems to be the joint work of a whole town and i suppose it to be the joint property also the other net which is circular and extended by two or three hoops has been particularly described as well as the manner of baiting and using it their hooks are of bone or shell and in general are ill made to receive the fish when it is caught and to hold their other provisions they have baskets of various kinds and dimensions very neatly made of wicker work they excel in tillage as might naturally be expected where the person that sows is to eat the produce and where there is so little besides that can be eaten when we first came to tegadu a district between poverty bay and east cape their crops were just covered and had not yet begun to sprout the mould was as smooth as in a garden and every root had its small hillock ranged in a regular quincunx by lines which with the pegs were still remaining in the field we had not an opportunity to see any of these husbandmen at work but we saw what serves them at once for spade and plough this instrument is nothing more than a long narrow stake sharpened to an edge at one end with a short piece fastened transversely at a little distance above it for the convenience of pressing it down with the foot with this they turn up pieces of ground six or seven acres in extent though it is not more than three inches broad but as the soil is light and sandy it makes little resistance tillage weaving and the other arts of peace seem to be best known and most practised in the northern part of this country for there is little appearance of any of them in the south but the arts of war flourish equally through the whole coast of weapons they have no great variety but such as they have are well fitted for destruction they have spears darts battle-axes and the patu patu the spear is fourteen or fifteen feet long pointed at both ends and sometimes headed with bone these are grasped by the middle so that the part behind balancing that before makes a push more difficult to be parried than that of a weapon which is held by the end the dart and other weapons have been sufficiently described already and it has also been remarked that these people have neither sling nor bow they throw the dart by hand and so they do stones but darts and stones are seldom used except in defending their forts their battles whether in boats or on shore are generally hand to hand and the slaughter must consequently be great as a second blow with any of their weapons is unnecessary if the first takes place
Their trust, however, seems to be principally placed in the patu patu, which is fastened to their wrists by a strong strap, lest it should be wrenched from them, and which the principal people generally wear sticking in their girdles, considering it as a military ornament and part of their dress, like the poniard of the Asiatic and the sword of the European. They have no defensive armour, but besides their weapons, the chiefs carry a staff of distinction in the same manner as our officers do the spontoon. This was generally the rib of a whale, as white as snow, with many ornaments of carved work, dog's hair, and feathers. But sometimes it was a stick, about six feet long, adorned in the same manner, and inlaid with a shell like mother of pearl. Those who bore this mark of distinction were generally old, at least past the middle age, and were also more marked with the amoco than the rest. One or more persons thus distinguished always appeared in each canoe when they came to attack us according to the size of it. When they came within about a cable's length of the ship, they used to stop, and the chiefs, rising from their seat, put on a dress which seemed appropriated to the occasion, generally of dog skin, and holding out their decorated staff or weapon, directed the rest of the people what they should do. When they were at too great a distance to reach us with a lance or a stone, they presumed that we had no weapon with which we could reach them. Here then the defiance was given, and the words were almost universally the same, Haramai, Haramai, Here Uta A Patu Patu Oga, come to us, come on shore, and we will kill you all with our Patu Patus. While they were uttering these menaces, they came gradually nearer and nearer, till they were close alongside, talking at intervals in a peaceable strain, and answering any questions that we asked them, and at intervals renewing their defiance and threats, till, being encouraged by our apparent timidity, they began their war song and dance, as a prelude to an attack, which always followed, and was sometimes continued, till it became absolutely necessary to repress them by firing some small shot, and sometimes ended after throwing a few stones on board, as if content with having offered us an insult, which we did not dare to revenge. The war dance consists of a great variety of violent motions and hideous contortions of the limbs, during which the countenance also performs its part. The tongue is frequently thrust out to an incredible length, and the eyelids so forcibly drawn up that the white appears both above and below, as well as on each side of the iris, so as to form a circle round it nor is anything neglected that can render the human shape frightful and deformed. At the same time, they brandish their spears, shake their darts, and cleave the air with their patu-patus. This horrid dance is always accompanied by a song. It is wild indeed, but not disagreeable, and every strain ends in a loud and deep sigh, which they utter in concert. In the motions of the dance, however horrid, there is a strength, firmness, and agility which we could not but behold with admiration, and in their song they keep time with such exactness that I have often heard above an hundred paddles struck against the sides of their boats at once, so as to produce but a single sound at the divisions of their music. A song not altogether unlike this they sometimes sing without the dance, and as a peaceable amusement. They have also other songs which are sung by the women, whose voices are remarkably mellow and soft, and have a pleasing and tender effect. The time is slow and the cadence mournful, but it is conducted with more taste than could be expected among the poor ignorant savages of this half-desolate country especially as it appeared to us, 
who were none of us much acquainted with music as a science, to be sung in parts. It was at least sung by many voices at the same time. They have sonorous instruments, but they can scarcely be called instruments of music. One is the shell, called the triton's trumpet, with which they make a noise not unlike that which our boys sometimes make with the cow's horn. The other is a small wooden pipe resembling a child's nine-pin, only much smaller, and in this there is no more music than in a pee-whistle. They seem sensible indeed that these instruments are not musical, for we never heard an attempt to sing to them, or to produce with them any measured tones that bore the least resemblance to a tune. To what has already been said of the practice of eating human flesh, I shall only add that in almost every cove where we landed, we found flesh bones of men near the places where fires had been made, and that among the heads that were brought on board by the old man, some seemed to have false eyes and ornaments in their ears as if alive. That which Mr. Banks bought was sold with great reluctance by the possessor. The head was manifestly that of a young person about fourteen or fifteen years of age, and by the contusions on one side appeared to have received many violent blows, and indeed a part of the bone near the eye was wanting. These appearances confirmed us in the opinion that the natives of this country give no quarter, nor take any prisoners to be killed and eaten at a future time, as is said to have been a practice among the Indians of Florida. For if prisoners had been taken, this poor young creature, who cannot be supposed capable of making much resistance, would probably have been one and we knew that he was killed with the rest, for the fray had happened but a few days before. The towns or hippers of these people, which are all fortified, have been sufficiently described already, and from the Bay of Plenty to Queen Charlotte Sound, they seem to be the constant residence of the people. But about Poverty Bay, Hawke's Bay, Tegadu, and Tolaga, we saw no hippers, but single houses scattered at a distance from each other. Yet upon the sides of the hills there were stages of a great length, furnished with stones and darts, probably as retreats for the people at the last extremity, as upon these stages a fight may be carried on with much advantage against those below, who may be reached with great effect by darts and stones, which it is impossible for them to throw up with equal force. And indeed the forts themselves seem to be no farther serviceable than by enabling the possessors to repress a sudden attack. For as there is no supply of water within the lines, it would be impossible to sustain a siege. A considerable stock of fern root and dry fish is indeed laid up in them, but they may be reserved against seasons of scarcity, and that such seasons there are, our observations left us no room to doubt. Besides, while an enemy should be prowling in the neighbourhood, it would be easy to snatch a supply of water from the side of the hill though it would be impossible to dig up fern root or catch fish. In this district, however, the people seem to live in a state of conscious security and to avail themselves of their advantage. Their plantations were more numerous, their canoes were more decorated, and they had not only finer carving, but finer clothes. This part of the coast also was much the most populous, and possibly their apparent peace and plenty might arise from their being united under one chief or king. For the inhabitants of all this part of the country told us that they were the subjects of Teratu. When they pointed to the residence of this prince, it was in a direction which we thought inland, but which, when we knew the country better, we found to be the Bay of Plenty. 
it is much to be regretted that we were obliged to leave this country without knowing anything of Teratu but his name. As an Indian monarch, his territory is certainly extensive. He was acknowledged from Cape Kidnappers to the northward and westward as far as the Bay of Plenty, a length of coast upward of 80 leagues, and we do not yet know how much farther westward his dominions may extend. Possibly the fortified towns which we saw in the Bay of Plenty may be his barrier, especially as at Mercury Bay he was not acknowledged, nor indeed any other single chief. For wherever we landed or spoke with the people upon that coast, they told us that we were at but a small distance from their enemies. In the dominions of Teratu, we saw several subordinate chiefs, to whom great respect was paid, and by whom justice was probably administered. For upon our complaint to one of them, of a theft that had been committed on board the ship by a man that came with him, he gave him several blows and kicks, which the other received as the chastisement of authority, against which no resistance was to be made, and which he had no right to resent. Whether this authority was possessed by appointment or inheritance, we could not learn, but we observed that the chiefs, as well here as in other parts, were elderly men. In other parts, however, we learnt that they possessed their authority by inheritance. The little societies which we found in the southern parts seem to have several things in common, particularly their fine clothes and fishing nets. Their fine clothes, which possibly might be the spoils of war, were kept in a small hut, which was erected for that purpose in the middle of the town. The nets we saw making in almost every house, and the several parts being afterwards collected, were joined together. Less account seems to be made of the women here than in the South Sea Islands. Such at least was the opinion of Tupia, who complained of it as an indignity to the sex. We observed that the two sexes eat together, but how they divide their labour we do not certainly know. I am inclined to believe that the men till the ground, make nets, catch birds, and go out in their boats to fish, and that the women dig up fern roots, collect lobsters and other shellfish near the beach, dress the victuals, and weave cloth. Such at least were their employments when we had an opportunity of observing them, which was but seldom for in general our appearance made a holiday wherever we went, men, women and children flocking round us, either to gratify their curiosity or to purchase some of the valuable merchandise which we carried about with us, consisting principally of nails, paper and broken glass. Of the religion of these people it cannot be supposed that we could learn much, they acknowledge the influence of superior beings, one of whom is supreme, and the rest subordinate, and gave nearly the same account of the origin of the world and the production of mankind as our friends at Otaheite. Tupia, however, seem to have a much more deep and extensive knowledge of these subjects than any of the people here, and whenever he was disposed to instruct them, which he sometimes did in a long discourse, he was sure of a numerous audience who listened in profound silence with such reverence and attention that we could not but wish them a better teacher. What homage they pay to the deities they acknowledge we could not learn, but we saw no place of public worship like the Morais of the South Sea Islands Yet we saw, near a plantation of sweet potatoes, a small area of a square figure, surrounded with stones, in the middle of which one of the sharpened stakes, which they used as a spade, was set up, and upon it was hung a basket of fern roots. Upon inquiry, the natives told us 
that it was an offering to the gods by which the owner hoped to render them propitious and obtain a plentiful crop. As to their manner of disposing of their dead, we could form no certain opinion of it, for the accounts that we received by no means agreed. In the northern parts they told us that they buried them in the ground, and in the southern that they threw them into the sea. It is, however, certain that we saw no grave in the country, and that they affected to conceal everything relating to their dead with a kind of mysterious secrecy. But whatever may be the sepulchre, the living are themselves the monuments, for we saw scarcely a single person of either sex whose body was not marked by the scars of wounds which they had inflicted upon themselves as a testimony of their regret for the loss of a relative or friend. Some of these wounds we saw in a state so recent that the blood was scarcely staunched, which shows that death had been among them while we were upon the coast, and it makes it more extraordinary that no funeral ceremony should have fallen under our notice. Some of the scars were very large and deep, and in many instances had greatly disfigured the face. One monument indeed we observed of another kind, the cross that was set up near Queen Charlotte's Sound. Having now given the best account in my power of the customs and opinions of the inhabitants of New Zealand, with their boats, nets, furniture and dress, I shall only remark that the similitude between these particulars here and in the South Sea Islands is a very strong proof that the inhabitants have the same origin, and that the common ancestors of both were natives of the same country. They have both a tradition that their ancestors, at a very remote period of time, came from another country, and according to the tradition of both, that the name of that country was Hiawije, but the similitude of the language seems to put the matter altogether out of doubt. I have already observed that Tupia, when he accosted the people here in the language of his own country, was perfectly understood, and I shall give a specimen of the similitude by a list of words in both languages, according to the dialect of the northern and southern islands of which New Zealand consists, by which it will appear that the language of Otaheite does not differ more from that of New Zealand than the language of the two islands from each other. Table. First column, English. Second column, New Zealand Northern. Third column, New Zealand Southern. Fourth column, Otaheite. A chief, Iriti, Iriti, Iri. A man, Tata, Tata, Tata. A woman, Wahine, Wahine, Ivahine. The head, Upo, Hiawapoho. Upo, the hair, Makaway, Hai Oo, Ruuro, the ear, Teringa, Hetahaya, Teria, the forehead, Erai, Hiai, Erai, the eyes, Mata, Hemata, Mata, the cheeks, Paparinga, Hepapaya, Paparaya. The nose, ahewe, hai, ahu. The mouth, hangutu, hegaiwai, utu. The chin, ekuwai, hekawai, blank. The arm, haringaringu, blank, rema. The finger, matikara, hermaigal, manio. The belly, Atarabu, blank, obu. The navel, apeto, hiapeto, peto. Come hither, haramai, haramai, haramai. Fish, haika, haika, aya. A lobster, kuura, kuura, tuura. 
cocos, taro, 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 sweet potatoes, kamala, 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 yams, tufwe, 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 birds, manu, 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 no, ka ora, ka ora, ora, one, tahai, blank, tahai, two, rua, blank, rua, three, toru, blank, toru, four, ha, blank, here, five, rema, blank, rema, six, oh no, blank, oh no, seven, etu, blank, etu, eight, waru, blank, waru, nine, Iva blank, heva, ten, angahuru, blank, ahuru, the teeth, anyhu, hinaho, nihiho, the wind, mehau, blank, matai, a thief, amutu, blank, teto, to examine, matakataka, blank, mataitai, to sing, ehira, blank, heva, bad, keno, keno, eno, trees, eratu, eratu, erau, grandfather, tubuna, 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 what do you call this or that, owi terra, blank, owi terra, by this specimen, I think it appears to demonstration that the language of New Zealand and Otaheite is radically the same. The language of the northern and southern parts of New Zealand differs principally in the pronunciation, as the same English word is pronounced gate in Middlesex and gate in Yorkshire, and as the southern and northern words were not written down by the same person, one might possibly use more letters to produce the same sound than the other. I must also observe that it is the genius of the language, especially in the southern parts, to put some article before a noun, as we do the or a. The articles used here were generally he or co, it is also common here to add the word oaya after another word as an iteration, especially if it is an answer to a question, as we say, yes indeed, to be sure, really, certainly. This sometimes led our gentlemen into the formation of words of an enormous length, judging by the ear only, without being able to refer each sound into its signification. An example will make this perfectly understood. In the Bay of Islands, there is a remarkable one called by the natives Matuaro. One of our gentlemen, having asked a native the name of it, he answered with the particle, K Matuaro. The gentleman, hearing the sound imperfectly, repeated his question, and the Indian, repeating his answer, added, O Aya which made the word K Matuaro O Aya, and thus it happened that in the log book I found Metuaro transformed into Kumeti Warawaya, and the same transformation by the same means might happen to an English word. Suppose a native of New Zealand at Hackney Church to inquire what village is this, the answer would be it is Hackney. Suppose the question to be repeated with an air of doubt and uncertainty, the answer might be, it is Hackney indeed, and the New Zealander, if he had the use of letters, would probably record, for the information of his countrymen, that during his residence among us, he had visited a village called, it is Sackney indeed day. The article used by the inhabitants of the South Sea Island instead of he or co, is tu or ta, 
but the word oaya is common to both. And when we began to learn the language, it led us into many ridiculous mistakes. But supposing these islands and those in the South Seas to have been peopled originally from the same country, it will perhaps forever remain a doubt what country that is. We were, however, unanimously of opinion that the people did not come from America, which lies to the eastward, and except that there should appear to be a continent to the southward in a moderate latitude, it will follow that they came from the westward. Thus far our navigation has certainly been unfavourable to the notion of a southern continent, for it has swept away at least three-fourths of the positions upon which it has been founded. The principal navigators, whose authority has been urged on this occasion, are Tasman, Juan Fernandez, Hermite, the commander of a Dutch squadron, Quiros, and Rogavine, and the track of the endeavour has demonstrated that the land seen by these persons, and supposed to be part of a continent, is not so. It has also totally subverted the theoretical arguments which have been brought to prove that the existence of a southern continent is necessary to preserve an equilibrium between the two hemispheres, for upon this principle what we have already proved to be water would render the southern hemisphere too light in our route to the northward after doubling cape horn when we were in the latitude of forty degrees our longitude was a hundred and ten degrees and in our return to the southward after leaving ulitea when we were again in latitude forty degrees our longitude was one forty five degrees the difference is 35 degrees. When we were in latitude 30 degrees, the difference of longitude between the two tracks was 21 degrees, which continued till we were as low as 20 degrees. But a single view of the chart will convey a better idea of this than the most minute description. Yet, as upon a view of the chart, it will appear that there is a large space extending quite to the tropics, which neither we nor any other navigators to our knowledge have explored, and as there will appear to be room enough for the cape of a southern continent to extend northward into a low southern latitude, I shall give my reason for believing there is no cape of any southern continent to the northward of 40 degrees south. Notwithstanding what has been laid down by some geographers in their maps, and alleged by Mr. Dalrymple with respect to Quiros, it is improbable in the highest degree that he saw to the southward of two islands, which he discovered in latitude 25 or 26 degrees, and which I suppose may lie between the longitude of 130 degrees and 140 degrees west, any signs of a continent, much less anything which, in his opinion, was a known or indubitable sign of such land. For if he had, he would certainly have sailed southward in search of it, and if he had sought, supposing the signs to have been indubitable, he must have found. The discovery of a southern continent was the ultimate object of Quiros's voyage, and no man appears to have had it more at heart so that if he was in latitude 26 degrees south and in longitude 146 degrees west, where Mr. Dalrymple has placed the islands he discovered, it may fairly be inferred that no part of a southern continent extends to that latitude. It will, I think, appear with equal evidence from the accounts of Rogovine's voyage, that between the longitudes of 130 degrees and 150 degrees west, there is no mainland to the northward of 35 degrees south. Mr. Pingra, in a treatise concerning the transit of Venus, which he went out to observe, has inserted an extract of Rogovine's voyage and a map of the South Seas, and for reasons which may be seen at large in his work, supposes him, after leaving Easter Island, 
which he places in latitude 28 and a half degrees south, longitude 123 degrees west, to have steered southwest as high as 34 degrees south, and afterwards west northwest. And if this was indeed his route, the proof that there is no mainland to the northward of 35 degrees south is irrefragable. Mr. Dalrymple indeed supposes his route to have been different, and that from Easter Isle he steered northwest, taking a course afterwards very little different from that of La Mer. But I think it is highly improbable that a man who, had his own request was sent to discover a southern continent, should take a course in which La Mer had already proved no continent could be found. It must, however, be confessed that Rogovine's track cannot certainly be ascertained because, in the accounts that have been published of his voyage, neither longitudes nor latitudes are mentioned. As to myself, I saw nothing that I thought a sign of land in my route, either to the northward, southward, or westward, till a few days before I made the east coast of New Zealand. I did indeed frequently see large flocks of birds, but they were generally such as are found at a very remote distance from any coast. And it is also true that I frequently saw pieces of rock weed, but I could not infer the vicinity of land from these, because I have been informed upon indubitable authority that a considerable quantity of the beans called oxeyes, which are known to grow nowhere but in the West Indies, are every year thrown up on the coast of Ireland, which is not less than 1,200 leagues distant. Thus have I given my reasons for thinking that there is no continent to the northward of latitude 40 degrees south. Of what may lie farther to the southward than 40 degrees, I can give no opinion, but I am so far from wishing to discourage any future attempt finally to determine a question which has long been an object of attention to many nations, that now this voyage has reduced the only possible site of a continent in the southern hemisphere, north of latitude 40 degrees, to so small a space, I think it would be pity to leave that any longer unexamined, especially as the voyage may turn to good account, besides determining the principal question if no continent should be found, by the discovery of new islands in the tropical regions, of which there is probably a great number that no European vessel has ever yet visited. Tupia, from time to time, gave us an account of about 130, and, in a chart drawn by his own hand, he actually laid down no less than 74. End of book two, end of section five. Section six of the first voyage of James Cook, volume two, by James Cook, 1728 to 1779. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Three, Chapter One, Part One. The run from New Zealand to Botany Bay on the east coast of New Holland, now called New South Wales, various incidents that happened there, with some account of the country and its inhabitants. Having sailed from Cape Farewell, which lies in latitude 40 degrees 33 minutes south, longitude 186 degrees west. On Saturday the 31st of March 1770, we steered westward with a fresh gale at north-north-east, and at noon on the 2nd of April, our latitude by observation was 40 degrees, our longitude from Cape Farewell 2 degrees 31 minutes west. In the morning of the ninth, being in latitude 38 degrees 29 minutes south, we saw a tropic bird, which in so high a latitude is very uncommon. 
in the morning of the 10th, being in latitude 38 degrees 51 minutes south, longitude 202 degrees 43 minutes west, we found the variation by the amplitude to be 11 degrees 25 minutes east, and by the azimuth 11 degrees 20 minutes. In the morning of the 11th, the variation was 13 degrees 48 minutes which is two degrees and a half more than the day before, though I expected to have found it less. In the course of the 13th, being in latitude 39 degrees 23 minutes south, longitude 204 degrees 2 minutes west, I found the variation to be 12 degrees 27 minutes east, and in the morning of the 14th it was 11 degrees 30 minutes this day we also saw some flying fish. On the 15th we saw an egg bird and a gannet, and as these are birds that never go far from the land, we continued to sound all night, but had no ground with 130 fathom. At noon on the 16th we were in latitude 39 degrees 45 minutes south, longitude 208 degrees west. At about two o'clock, the wind came about to the west-southwest, upon which we tacked and stood to the northwest. Soon after, a small land bird perched upon the rigging, but we had no ground with a hundred and twenty fathom. At eight, we wore and stood to the southward till twelve at night, and then wore and stood to the northwest till four in the morning, when we again stood to the southward having a fresh gale at west-south-west, with squalls and dark weather till nine, when the weather became clear, and there being little wind, we had an opportunity to take several observations of the sun and moon, the mean result of which gave 207 degrees 56 minutes west longitude. Our latitude at noon was 39 degrees 36 minutes south. We had now a hard gale from the southward, and a great sea from the same quarter, which obliged us to run under our foresail and mizzen all night, during which we sounded every two hours, but had no ground with a hundred and twenty fathom. In the morning of the 18th, we saw two Port Egmont hens, and a pintado bird, which are certain signs of approaching land, and, indeed, by our reckoning, we could not be far from it, for our longitude was now one degree to the westward of the east side of Van Diemen's Land, according to the longitude laid down by Tasman, whom we could not suppose to have erred much in so short a run as from this land to New Zealand, and by our latitude we could not be above fifty or fifty-five leagues from the place whence he took his departure. All this day we had frequent squalls and a great swell. At one in the morning we brought to and sounded, but had no ground with a hundred and thirty fathom. At six we saw land extending from north-east to west, at the distance of five or six leagues, having eighty fathom water with a fine sandy bottom. We continued standing westward, with the wind at south south west till eight, when we made all the sail we could, and bore away along the shore north east for the easternmost land in sight, being at this time in latitude thirty seven degrees fifty eight minutes south, and longitude two hundred and ten degrees thirty nine minutes west. The southernmost point of land in sight, which bore from us west one quarter south, I judged to lie in latitude 38 degrees, longitude 211 degrees 7 minutes, and gave it the name of Point Hicks, because Mr. Hicks, the first lieutenant, was the first who discovered it. To the southward of this point no land was to be seen, though it was very clear in that quarter, and by our longitude, compared with that of Tasman, not as it is laid down in the printed charts, but in the extracts from Tasman's journal, published by Rebrantse, 
the body of Van Diemen's land ought to have borne due south, and indeed, from the southern falling of the sea after the wind abated, I had reason to think it did. Yet as I did not see it, and as I found the coast trend northeast and southwest, or rather more to the eastward, I cannot determine whether it joins to Van Diemen's land or not. At noon we were in latitude 37 degrees 5 minutes, longitude 210 degrees 29 minutes west. The extremes of the land extended from northwest to east northeast, and a remarkable point bore north 20 degrees east at the distance of about four leagues. This point rises in a round hillock, very much resembling the ram head at the entrance of Plymouth Sound, and therefore I called it by the same name. The variation by an azimuth taken this morning was three degrees seven minutes east, and what we had now seen of the land appeared low and level, the seashore was a white sand, but the country within was green and woody. About one o'clock, we saw three water spouts at once. Two were between us and the shore, and the third at some distance, upon our larboard quarter. This phenomenon is so well known that it is not necessary to give a particular description of it here. At six o'clock in the evening we shortened sail and brought to for the night, having fifty-six fathom water and a fine sandy bottom. The northernmost land in sight then bore north by east a half east, and a small island lying close to a point on the main bore west, distant two leagues. This point, which I called Cape Howe, may be known by the trending of the coast, which is north on one side and southwest on the other. It may also be known by some round hills upon the main, just within it. We brought two for the night, and at four in the morning made sail along shore to the northward. At six the northernmost land in sight bore north-northwest, and we were at this time about four leagues from the shore. At noon we were in latitude 36 degrees 51 minutes south, longitude 209 degrees 53 minutes west, and about three leagues distant from the shore. The weather being clear gave us a good view of the country, which has a very pleasing appearance. It is of a moderate height, diversified by hills and valleys, ridges and plains, interspersed with a few lawns of no great extent, but in general covered with wood. The ascent of the hills and ridges is gentle, and the summits are not high. We continue to sail along the shore to the northward, with a southerly wind, and in the afternoon we saw smoke in several places, by which we knew the country to be inhabited. At six in the evening we shortened sail and sounded. We found forty-four fathom water, with a clear sandy bottom, and stood on under an easy sail till twelve, when we brought to for the night, and had ninety fathom water. At four in the morning we made sail again, at the distance of about five leagues from the land, and at six we were abreast of a high mountain, lying near the shore, which, on account of its figure, I called Mount Dromedary. Under this mountain the shore forms a point, to which I gave the name of Point Dromedary, and over it there is a peaked hillock, at this time, being in latitude 36 degrees 18 minutes south, longitude 209 degrees 55 minutes west, we found the variation to be 10 degrees 42 minutes east. Between 10 and 11, Mr. Green and I took several observations of the sun and moon, the mean result of which gave 209 degrees 17 minutes longitude west. 
By an observation made the day before, our longitude was 210 degrees 9 minutes west, from which 20 minutes being subtracted, there remains 209 degrees 49 minutes, the longitude of the ship this day at noon, the mean of which, with this day's observation, gives 209 degrees 33 minutes, by which I fix the longitude of this coast. At noon, our latitude was 35 degrees 49 minutes south. Cape Dromedary bore south 30 degrees west at the distance of 12 leagues, and an open bay, in which were three or four small islands, bore northwest by west at the distance of five or six leagues. This bay seemed to afford but little shelter from the sea winds, and yet it is the only place where there appeared a probability of finding anchorage upon the whole coast. We continued to steer along the shore north by east and north-north-east at the distance of about three leagues, and saw smoke in many places near the beach. At five in the evening we were abreast of a point of land which rose in a perpendicular cliff, and which, for that reason, I called Point Upright. Our latitude was 35 degrees 35 minutes south, when this point bore from us due west, distant about two leagues. In this situation, we had about 31 fathom water with a sandy bottom. At six in the evening, the wind falling, we hauled off east-north-east, and at this time the northernmost land in sight bore north by east half east. At midnight, being in seventy fathom water, we brought to till four in the morning, when we made sail in for the land, but at daybreak found our situation nearly the same as it had been at five the evening before, by which it was apparent that we had been driven about three leagues to the southward, by a tide or current during the night. After this we steered along the shore north-north-east with a gentle breeze at south-west, and were so near the land as to distinguish several of the natives upon the beach, who appeared to be of a black or very dark colour. At noon our latitude by observation was 35 degrees 27 minutes south, and longitude 209 degrees 23 minutes west, Cape Dromedary bore south 28 degrees west, distant 19 leagues, a remarkable peaked hill, which resembled a square dove house, with a dome at the top, and which for that reason I call the Pigeon House, bore north 32 degrees 30 minutes west, and a small low island, which lay close under the shore, bore northwest, distant about two or three leagues. When I first discovered this island in the morning, I was in hopes from its appearance that I should have found shelter for the ship behind it. But when we came near it, it did not promise security even for the landing of a boat. I should, however, have attempted to send a boat on shore, if the wind had not veered to that direction, with a large hollow sea rolling in upon the land from the south-east, which indeed had been the case ever since we had been upon it. The coast still continued to be of a moderate height, forming alternately rocky points and sandy beaches, but within, between Mount Dromedary and the Pigeon House, we saw high mountains which, except two are covered with wood. These two lie inland behind the pigeon house and are remarkably flat at the top with steep rocky cliffs all round them as far as we could see. The trees which almost everywhere clothe this country appear to be large and lofty. This day the variation was found to be 9 degrees 50 minutes east and for the last two days the latitude, by observation, was twelve or fourteen miles to the southward of the ship's account, 
which could have been the effect of nothing but a current setting in that direction. About four in the afternoon, being near five leagues from the land, we tacked and stood off south, east and east, and the wind having veered in the night from east to northeast and north, we tacked about four in the morning and stood in, being then about nine or ten leagues from the shore. At eight, the wind began to die away, and soon after it was calm. At noon, our latitude by observation was 35 degrees 38 minutes, and our distance from the land about six leagues. Cape Dromedary bore south 37 degrees west, distant 17 leagues, and the Pigeon House north 40 degrees west. In this situation we had 74 fathom water. In the afternoon we had variable light airs and calms, till six in the evening, when a breeze sprung up at north by west. At this time, being about four or five leagues from the shore, we had seventy fathom water. The Pigeon House bore north forty-five degrees west, Mount Dromedary south thirty degrees west, and the northernmost land in sight north nineteen degrees east. We stood to the northeast till noon the next day, with a gentle breeze at northwest, and then we tacked and stood westward. At this time, our latitude by observation was 35 degrees 10 minutes south, and longitude 208 degrees 51 minutes west. A point of land which I had discovered on St. George's Day, and which therefore I called Cape George, bore west distant 19 miles, and the Pigeon House, the latitude and longitude of which I found to be 35 degrees 19 minutes south, and 209 degrees 42 minutes west, south 75 degrees west. In the morning we had found the variation, by amplitude, to be 7 degrees 50 minutes east, and by several azimuths, 7 degrees 54 minutes east. We had a fresh breeze at northwest from noon till three. It then came to the west when we tacked and stood to the northward. At five in the evening, being about five or six leagues from the shore, with a pigeon house bearing west-southwest, distant about nine leagues, we had 86 fathom water, and at eight, Having thunder and lightning with heavy squalls, we brought to in a hundred and twenty fathom. At three in the morning, we made sail again to the northward, having the advantage of a fresh gale at southwest. At noon, we were about three or four leagues from the shore and in latitude thirty four degrees twenty two minutes south, longitude two o eight degrees thirty six minutes west. In the course of this day's run from the preceding noon, which was 45 miles northeast, we saw smoke in several places near the beach. About two leagues to the northward of Cape George, the shore seemed to form a bay, which promised shelter from the northeast winds, but as the wind was with us, it was not in my power to look into it without beating up which would have cost me more time than I was willing to spare. The north point of this bay, on account of its figure, I named Long Nose. Its latitude is 35 degrees 6 minutes, and about 8 leagues north of it there lies a point which, from the colour of the land about it, I called Red Point. Its latitude is 34 degrees 29 minutes and longitude 208 degrees 45 minutes west. To the northwest of Red Point and a little way inland stands a round hill, the top of which looks like the crown of a hat. In the afternoon of this day we had a light breeze at north-northwest till five in the evening when it fell calm. At this time we were between three and four leagues from the shore and had 48 fathom water. 
the variation by azimuth was eight degrees forty eight minutes east and the extremities of this land were from northeast by north to southwest by south before it was dark we saw smoke in several places along the shore and a fire two or three times afterward during the night we lay becalmed driving in before the sea till one in the morning when we got a breeze from the land with which we steered north-east being then in thirty-eight fathom at noon it veered to north-east by north and we were then in latitude thirty-four degrees ten minutes south longitude two o eight degrees twenty seven minutes west the land was distant about five leagues and extended from south thirty seven degrees west to north a half east in this latitude there are some white cliffs which rise perpendicularly from the sea to a considerable height we stood off the shore till two o'clock and then tacked and stood in till six when we were within four or five miles of it and at that distance had fifty fathom water the extremities of the land bore from south twenty eight degrees west to north twenty five degrees thirty minutes east we now tacked and stood off till twelve then tacked and stood in again till four in the morning when we made a trip off till daylight and during all this time we lost ground owing to the variableness of the winds we continued at the distance of between four and five miles from the shore till the afternoon when we came within two miles and i then hoisted out the pinnace and yawl to attempt a landing but the pinnace proved to be so leaky that i was obliged to hoist her in again at this time we saw several of the natives walking briskly along the shore four of whom carried a small canoe upon their shoulders we flattered ourselves that they were going to put her into the water and come off to the ship but finding ourselves disappointed i determined to go on shore in the yawl with as many as it would carry i embarked therefore with only mr banks dr zolander tupia and four rowers we pulled for that part of the shore where the indians appeared near which four small canoes were lying at the water's edge the indians sat down upon the rocks and seemed to wait for our landing but to our great regret when we came within about a quarter of a mile they ran away into the woods we determined however to go ashore and endeavour to procure an interview but in this we were again disappointed for we found so great a surf beating upon every part of the beach that landing with our little boat was altogether impracticable we were therefore obliged to be content with gazing at such objects as presented themselves from the water the canoes upon a near view seemed very much to resemble those of the smaller sort at new zealand we observed that among the trees on shore which were not very large there was no underwood and could distinguish that many of them were of the palm kind and some of them cabbage trees after many a wishful look we were obliged to return with our curiosity rather excited than satisfied and about five in the evening got on board the ship about this time it fell calm and our situation was by no means agreeable we were now not more than a mile and a half from the shore and within some breakers which lay to the southward but happily a light breeze came off the land and carried us out of danger with this breeze we stood to the northward and at daybreak we discovered a bay which seemed to be well sheltered from all winds and into which therefore i determined to go with the ship the pinnace being repaired i sent her with the master to sound the entrance while i kept turning up having the wind right out at noon the mouth of the bay bore north-north-west distant about a mile 
and seeing a smoke on the shore, we directed our glasses to the spot and soon discovered ten people who, upon our nearer approach, left their fire and retired to a little eminence whence they could conveniently observe our motions. Soon after, two canoes, each having two men on board, came to the shore just under the eminence, and the men joined the rest on the top of it. The pinnace, which had been sent ahead to sound, now approached the place, upon which all the Indians retired farther up the hill, except one, who hid himself among some rocks near the landing place. As the pinnace proceeded along the shore, most of the people took the same route and kept abreast of her at a distance. When she came back, the master told us that in a cove a little within the harbour, some of them had come down to the beach and invited him to land by many signs and words, of which he knew not the meaning but that all of them were armed with long pikes and a wooden weapon shaped somewhat like a scimitar. The Indians who had not followed the boat, seeing the ship approach, used many threatening gestures and brandished their weapons, particularly two who made a very singular appearance, for their faces seemed to have been dusted with a white powder and their bodies painted with broad streaks of the same colour, which, passing obliquely over their breasts and backs, looked not unlike the cross-belts worn by our soldiers. The same kind of streaks were also drawn round their legs and thighs, like broad garters. Each of these men held in his hand the weapon that had been described to us as like a scimitar, which appeared to be about two feet and a half long, and they seemed to talk to each other with great earnestness. We continued to stand into the bay, and early in the afternoon anchored under the south shore, about two miles within the entrance, in six fathom water, the south point bearing southeast and the north point east. As we came in, we saw on both points of the bay, a few huts, and several of the natives, men, women, and children. Under the south head we saw four small canoes, with each one man on board, who were very busily employed in striking fish with a long pike or spear. They ventured almost into the surf, and were so intent upon what they were doing, that although the ship passed within a quarter of a mile of them, they scarcely turned their eyes towards her, possibly being deafened by the surf, and their attention wholly fixed upon their business or sport, they neither saw nor heard her go past them. The place where the ship had anchored was abreast of a small village, consisting of about six or eight houses, and while we were preparing to hoist out the boat, we saw an old woman, followed by three children, come out of the wood. She was loaded with firewood, and each of the children had also its little burden. When she came to the houses, three more children, younger than the others, came out to meet her. She often looked at the ship, but expressed neither fear nor surprise. In a short time she kindled a fire, and the four canoes came in from fishing. The men landed, and having hauled up their boats, began to dress their dinner, to all appearance, wholly unconcerned about us, though we were within half a mile of them. We thought it remarkable that all the people we had yet seen, not one had the least appearance of clothing, the old woman herself being destitute even of a fig leaf. End of section 6。Section 7 of The First Voyage of James Cook, Volume 2, by James Cook, 1728-1779. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
Book Three, Chapter One, Part Two. The run from New Zealand to Botany Bay on the east coast of New Holland, now called New South Wales. Various incidents that happened there, with some account of the country and its inhabitants, continued. After dinner, the boats were manned, and we set out from the ship, having to peer of our party. We intended to land where we saw the people, and began to hope that as they had so little regarded the ships coming into the bay, they would as little regard our coming on shore. In this, however, we were disappointed, for as soon as we approached the rocks, two of the men came down upon them to dispute our landing, and the rest ran away. Each of the two champions was armed with a lance about ten feet long, and a short stick, which he seemed to handle as if it was a machine to assist him in managing or throwing the lance. They called to us in a very loud tone, and in a harsh dissonant language, of which neither we nor Tupia understood a single word. They brandished their weapons, and seemed resolved to defend their coast to the uttermost, though they were but two and we were forty. I could not but admire their courage, and being very unwilling that hostility should commence with such inequality of force between us, I ordered the boat to lie upon her oars. We then parleyed by signs for about a quarter of an hour, and to bespeak their good will, I threw them nails, beads, and other trifles, which they took up and seemed to be well pleased with. I then made signs that I wanted water, and, by all the means that I could devise, endeavoured to convince them that we would do them no harm. They now waved to us, and I was willing to interpret it as an invitation, but upon our putting the boat in, they came again to oppose us. One appeared to be a youth about nineteen or twenty, and the other a man of middle age. As I had now no other resource, I fired a musket between them. Upon the report, the youngest dropped a bundle of lances upon the rock, but recollecting himself in an instant, he snatched them up again with great haste. A stone was then thrown at us, upon which I ordered a musket to be fired with small shot, which struck the eldest upon the legs, and he immediately ran to one of the houses, which was distant about an hundred yards. I now hoped that our contest was over, and we immediately landed, but we had scarcely left the boat when he returned and we then perceived that he had left the rock only to fetch a shield or target for his defence. As soon as he came up, he threw a lance at us, and his comrade another. They fell where we stood thickest, but happily hurt nobody. A third musket with small shot was then fired at them, upon which one of them threw another lance, and both immediately ran away. If we had pursued, we might probably have taken one of them, but Mr. Banks suggesting that the lances might be poisoned, I thought it not prudent to venture into the woods. We repaired immediately to the huts, in one of which we found the children, who had hidden themselves behind a shield and some bark. We peeped at them, but left them in their retreat without their knowing that they had been discovered, and we threw into the house, when we went away, some beads, ribbons, pieces of cloth, and other presents, which we hoped would procure us the goodwill of the inhabitants when they should return. But the lances which we found lying about, we took away with us, to the number of about fifty. They were from six to fifteen feet long, and all of them had four prongs in the manner of a fish gig, each of which was pointed with fish bone and very sharp. We observed that they were smeared with a viscous substance of a green colour, which favoured the opinion of their being poisoned, 
though we afterwards discovered that it was a mistake. They appeared by the seaweed that we found sticking to them to have been used in striking fish. Upon examining the canoes that lay upon the beach, we found them to be the worst we had ever seen. They were between 12 and 14 feet long and made of the bark of a tree in one piece, which was drawn together and tied up at each end the middle being kept open by sticks, which were placed across them from gunnel to gunnel as thwarts. We then searched for fresh water, but found none, except in a small hole which had been dug in the sand. Having re-embarked in our boat, we deposited our lances on board the ship, and then went over to the north point of the bay, where we had seen several of the inhabitants when we were entering it, but which we now found totally deserted. Here, however, we found fresh water, which trickled down from the top of the rocks, and stood in pools among the hollows at the bottom, but it was situated so as not to be procured for our use without difficulty. In the morning, therefore, I sent a party of men to that part of the shore where we first landed, with orders to dig holes in the sand where the water might gather. But going ashore myself with the gentlemen soon afterwards, we found, upon a more diligent search, a small stream more than sufficient for our purpose. Upon visiting the hut where we had seen the children, we were greatly mortified to find that the beads and ribbons which we had left there the night before had not been moved from their places, and that not an Indian was to be seen. Having sent some empty water casks on shore, and left a party of men to cut wood, I went myself in the pinnace to sound and examine the bay. During my excursion I saw several of the natives, but they all fled at my approach. In one of the places where I landed, I found several small fires and fresh mussels broiling upon them. Here also I found some of the largest oyster shells I had ever seen. As soon as the wooders and waters came on board to dinner, ten or twelve of the natives came down to the place and looked with great attention and curiosity at the casks, but did not touch them. They took away, however, the canoes which lay near the landing place, and again disappeared. In the afternoon, when our people were again ashore, sixteen or eighteen Indians, all armed, came boldly within about an hundred yards of them, and then stopped. Two of them advanced somewhat nearer, and Mr. Hicks, who commanded the party on shore, with another, advanced to meet them, holding out presents to them as he approached, and expressing kindness and amity by every sign he could think of, but all without effect. For before he could get up with them, they retired, and it would have answered no purpose to pursue. In the evening I went with Mr. Banks and Dr. Zollander to a sandy cove on the north side of the bay, where, in three or four halls with the Seine, we took above three hundred weight of fish, which was equally divided among the ship's company. The next morning, before daybreak, the Indians came down to the houses that were abreast of the ship, and were heard frequently to shout very loud. As soon as it was light, they were seen walking along the beach, and soon after they retired to the woods, where, at the distance of about a mile from the shore, they kindled several fires. Our people went ashore as usual, and with them Mr. Banks and Dr. Zollander, who, in search of plants, repaired to the woods. Our men, who were employed in cutting grass, being the farthest removed from the main body of the people, a company of fourteen or fifteen Indians advanced towards them, having sticks in their hands, which, according to the report of the sergeant of marines, shone like a musket. 
The grass cutters, upon seeing them approach, drew together and repaired to the main body. The Indians, being encouraged by this appearance of a flight, pursued them. They stopped, however, when they were within about a furlong of them, and after shouting several times, went back into the woods. In the evening they came again in the same manner, stopped at the same distance, shouted and retired. I followed them myself, alone and unarmed, for a considerable way along the shore, but I could not prevail upon them to stop. This day Mr. Green took the sun's meridian altitude a little within the south entrance of the bay, which gave the latitude 34 degrees south, the variation of the needle was 11 degrees 3 minutes east. Early the next morning, the body of Forby Sutherland, one of our seamen, who died the evening before, was buried near the watering place and from this incident I call the south point of this bay Sutherland Point. This day we resolved to make an excursion into the country. Mr. Banks, Dr. Zollander, myself and seven others, properly accoutred for the expedition, set out and repaired first to the huts near the watering place, whither some of the natives continued every day to resort, and though the little presents which we had left there before had not yet been taken away, we left others of somewhat more value, consisting of cloth, looking-glasses, combs and beads, and then went up into the country. We found the soil to be either swamp or light sand, and the face of the country finely diversified by wood and lawn. The trees are tall, straight, and without underwood, standing at such a distance from each other that the whole country, at least where the swamps do not render it incapable of cultivation, might be cultivated without cutting down one of them. Between the trees the ground is covered with grass, of which there is great abundance, growing in tufts about as big as can well be grasped in the hand, which stand very close to each other. We saw many houses of the inhabitants, and places where they had slept upon the grass without any shelter, but we saw only one of the people who, the moment he discovered us, ran away. At all these places we left presents, hoping that at length they might produce confidence and goodwill. We had a transient and imperfect view of a quadruped, about as big as a rabbit. Mr. Banks's greyhound, which was with us, got sight of it, and would probably have caught it, but the moment he set off, he lamed himself against the stump which lay concealed in the long grass. We afterwards saw the dung of an animal which fed upon grass, and which we judged could not be less than a deer and the footsteps of another, which was clawed like a dog, and seemed to be about as big as a wolf. We also tracked a small animal, whose foot resembled that of a polecat or weasel. The trees over our head abounded with birds of various kinds, among which were many of exquisite beauty, particularly lorikets and cockatoos, which flew in flocks of several scores together. We found some wood which had been felled by the natives with a blunt instrument, and some that had been barked. The trees were not of many species. Among others there was a large one which yielded a gum not unlike the sanguis draconis, and in some of them steps had been cut at about three feet distance from each other for the convenience of climbing them. From this excursion we returned between three and four o'clock, and having dined on board, we went ashore again at the watering place, where a party of men were filling casks. Mr. Gore, the second lieutenant, had been sent out in the morning with a boat to dredge for oysters at the head of the bay. When he had performed this service, he went ashore, 
and having taken a midshipman with him and sent the boat away set out to join the waters by land in his way he fell in with a body of two and twenty indians who followed him and were often not more than twenty yards distant when mr gore perceived them so near he stopped and faced about upon which they stopped also and when he went on again continued their pursuit they did not however attack him though they were all armed with lances and he and the midshipmen got in safety to the watering place the indians who had slackened their pursuit when they came in sight of the main body of our people halted at about the distance of a quarter of a mile where they stood still mr monkhouse and two or three of the waterers took it into their head to march up to them but seeing the indians keep their ground till they came pretty near them they were seized with a sudden fear very common to the rash and foolhardy and made a hasty retreat this step which ensured the danger that it was taken to avoid encouraged the indians and four of them running forward discharged their lances at the fugitives with such force that flying no less than forty yards they went beyond them as the indians did not pursue our people recovering their spirits stopped to collect the lances when they came up to the place where they lay upon which the indians in their turn began to retire just at this time i came up with mr banks dr zolander and tupia and being desirous to convince the indians that we were neither afraid of them nor intended them any mischief we advanced towards them making signs of expostulation and entreaty but they could not be persuaded to wait till we could come up mr gore told us that he had seen some of them up the bay who had invited him by signs to come on shore which he certainly with great prudence declined the morning of the next day was so rainy that we were all glad to stay on board in the afternoon however it cleared up and we made another excursion along the sea coast to the southward we went ashore and mr banks and dr zolander gathered many plants but besides these we saw nothing worthy of notice at our first entering the woods we met with three of the natives who instantly ran away more of them were seen by some of the people but they all disappeared with great precipitation as soon as they found that they were discovered by the boldness of these people at our first landing and the terror that seized them at the sight of us afterwards it appears that they were sufficiently intimidated by our firearms not that we had any reason to think the people much hurt by the small shot which we were obliged to fire at them when they attacked us at our coming out of the boat but they had probably seen the effects of them from their lurking places upon the birds that we had shot to peer who was now become a good marksman frequently strayed from us to shoot parrots and he told us that while he was thus employed he had once met with nine indians who as soon as they perceived he saw them ran from him in great confusion and terror the next day twelve canoes in each of which was a single indian came towards the watering place and were within half a mile of it a considerable time they were employed in striking fish upon which like others that we had seen before they were so intent that they seemed to regard nothing else it happened however that a party of our people were out a shooting near the place and one of the men whose curiosity might at length perhaps be roused by the report of the fowling pieces was observed by mr banks to haul up his canoe upon the beach and go towards the shooting party 
In something more than a quarter of an hour he returned, launched his canoe, and went off in her to his companions. This incident makes it probable that the natives acquired a knowledge of the destructive power of our firearms when we knew nothing of the matter, for this man was not seen by any of the party whose operations he had reconnoitred. While Mr. Banks was gathering plants near the watering place, I went with Dr. Zollander and Mr. Monkhouse to the head of the bay that I might examine that part of the country and make farther attempts to form some connection with the natives. In our way, we met with eleven or twelve small canoes, with each a man in it, probably the same that were afterwards abreast of the shore, who all made into shoal water upon our approach. We met other Indians on shore the first time we landed, who instantly took to their canoes and paddled away. We went up the country to some distance, and found the face of it nearly the same with that which has been described already, but the soil was much richer, for, instead of sand, I found a deep black mould, which I thought very fit for the production of grain of any kind. In the woods we found a tree which bore fruit that in colour and shape resembled a cherry. The juice had an agreeable tartness, though but little flavour. We found also interspersed some of the finest meadows in the world. Some places, however, were rocky, but these were comparatively few. The stone is sandy and might be used with advantage for building. When we returned to the boat, we saw some smoke upon another part of the coast and went thither in hopes of meeting with the people, but at our approach these also ran away. We found six small canoes, and six fires very near the beach, with some mussels roasting upon them, and a few oysters lying near. By this we judged that there had been one man in each canoe, who, having picked up some shellfish, had come ashore to eat it, and made his separate fire for that purpose. We tasted of their cheer, and left them in return some strings of beads, and other things which we thought would please them. At the foot of a tree in this place, we found a small well of fresh water, supplied by a spring, and the day being now far spent, we returned to the ship. In the evening, Mr. Banks made a little excursion with his gun and found such a number of quails resembling those in England that he might have shot as many as he pleased, but his object was variety and not number. The next morning, as the wind would not permit me to sail, I sent out several parties into the country to try again whether some intercourse could not be established with the natives. A midshipman, who belonged to one of these parties, having straggled a long way from his companions, met with a very old man and woman, and some little children. They were sitting under a tree by the waterside, and neither party saw the other till they were close together. The Indians showed signs of fear, but did not attempt to run away. The man happened to have nothing to give them but a parrot that he had shot. This he offered, but they refused to accept it, withdrawing themselves from his hand, either through fear or aversion. His stay with them was but short, for he saw several canoes near the beach fishing, and being alone, he feared they might come ashore and attack him. He said that these people were very dark coloured but not black, that the man and woman appeared to be very old, being both grey-headed, that the hair of the man's head was bushy and his beard long and rough, that the woman's hair was cropped short and both of them were stark naked. Mr. Monkhouse, the surgeon, and one of the men, who were with another party near the watering place, 
also strayed from their companions, and as they were coming out of a thicket, observed six Indians standing together at the distance of about fifty yards. One of them pronounced a word very loud, which was supposed to be a signal, for a lance was immediately thrown at him out of the wood, which very narrowly missed him. When the Indians saw that the weapon had not taken effect, they ran away with the greatest precipitation, but on turning about towards the place whence the lance had been thrown, he saw a young Indian, whom he judged to be about nineteen or twenty years old, come down from a tree, and he also ran away with such speed as made it hopeless to follow him. Mr. Monkhouse was of opinion that he had been watched by these Indians in his passage through the thicket, and that the youth had been stationed in the tree to discharge the lance at him upon a signal as he should come by. But however this be, there could be no doubt but that he was the person who threw the lance. In the afternoon I, I went myself with a party over to the north shore, and while some of our people were hauling the Seine, we made an excursion a few miles into the country, proceeding afterwards in the direction of the coast. We found this place without wood, and somewhat resembling our moors in England. The surface of the ground, however, was covered with a thin brush of plants, about as high as the knees. The hills near the coast are low, but others rise behind them, increasing by a gradual ascent to a considerable distance, with marshes and morasses between. When we returned to the boat, we found that our people had caught with the Seine a great number of small fish, which are well known in the West Indies, and which our sailors call leather jackets, because their skin is remarkably thick. I had sent the second lieutenant out in the yawl a striking, and when we got back to the ship, we found that he also had been very successful. He had observed that the large stingrays, of which there is great plenty in the bay, followed the flowing tide into very shallow water. He therefore took the opportunity of flood, and struck several in not more than two or three feet water, one of them weighed no less than 240 pounds after his entrails were taken out. The next morning, as the wind still continued northerly, I sent out the yawl again, and the people struck one still larger, for when his entrails were taken out, he weighed 336 pounds. The great quantity of plants which Mr. Banks and Dr. Zollander collected in this place induced me to give it the name of Botany Bay. It is situated in the latitude of 34 degrees south, longitude 208 degrees 37 minutes west. It is capacious, safe and convenient, and may be known by the land on the sea coast, which is nearly level, and of a moderate height, in general higher than it is farther inland, with steep rocky cliffs next the sea, which have the appearance of a long island lying close under the shore. The harbour lies about the middle of this land, and in approaching it from the southward is discovered before the ship comes abreast of it, but from the northward it is not discovered so soon, the entrance is a little more than a quarter of a mile broad and lies in west-northwest. To sail into it, the southern shore should be kept on board till the ship is within a small bare island which lies close under the north shore. Within this island, the deepest water on that side is seven fathom shallowing to five a good way up. At a considerable distance from the south shore, there is a shoal reaching from the inner south point quite to the head of the harbour, but over towards the north and northwest shore, there is a channel of twelve or fourteen feet at low water for three or four leagues, 
up to a place where there is three or four fathom, but here I found very little fresh water. We anchored near the south shore, about a mile within the entrance, for the convenience of sailing with the southerly wind, and because I thought it the best situation for watering, but I afterwards found a very fine stream on the north shore, in the first sandy cove within the island, before which a ship might lie almost landlocked, and procure wood as well as water in great abundance. Wood, indeed, is everywhere plenty, but I saw only two kinds which may be considered as timber. These trees are as large or larger than the English oak, and one of them has not a very different appearance. This is the same that yields the reddish gum like sanguinis draconis, and the wood is heavy, hard, and dark-coloured like lignum vitae. The other grows tall and straight, something like the pine, and the wood of this which has some resemblance to the live oak of America, is also hard and heavy. There are a few shrubs and several kinds of the palm. Mangroves also grow in great plenty near the head of the bay. The country in general is level, low and woody, as far as we could see. The woods, as I have before observed, abound with birds of exquisite beauty, particularly of the parrot kind. We found also crows here, exactly the same with those in England. About the head of the harbour, where there are large flats of sand and mud, there is great plenty of waterfowl, most of which were altogether unknown to us. One of the most remarkable was black and white, much larger than a swan, and in shape somewhat resembling a pelican. On these banks of sand and mud, there are great quantities of oysters, mussels, cockles, and other shellfish, which seem to be the principal subsistence of the inhabitants, who go into shoal water with their little canoes, and pick them out with their hands. We did not observe that they eat any of them raw, nor do they always go on shore to dress them for they have frequently fires in their canoes for that purpose. They do not, however, subsist wholly upon this food, for they catch a variety of other fish, some of which they strike with gigs, and some they take with hook and line. All the inhabitants that we saw were stark naked. They did not appear to be numerous, nor to live in societies, but, like other animals, were scattered about along the coast and in the woods. Of their manner of life, however, we could know but little, as we were never able to form the least connection with them. After the first contest at our landing, they would never come near enough to parley, nor did they touch a single article of all that we had left at their huts and the places they frequented on purpose for them to take away. During my stay in this harbour, I caused the English colours to be displayed on shore every day, and the ship's name and the date of the year to be inscribed upon one of the trees near the watering place. It is high water here at the full and change of the moon about eight o'clock, and the tide rises and falls perpendicularly between four and five feet. End of section 7。section 8 of the first voyage of James Cook, volume 2, by James Cook, 1728 to 1779. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 3, chapter 2. Part 1. The range from Botany Bay to Trinity Bay, with a farther account of the country, its inhabitants, and productions. At daybreak on Sunday, the 6th of May, 1770, 
we set sail from Botany Bay with a light breeze at northwest, which soon after coming to the southward, we steered along the shore north northeast, and at noon our latitude by observation was thirty three degrees fifty minutes south. At this time we were between two and three miles distant from the land, and abreast of a bay or harbour, in which there appeared to be good anchorage, and which I called Port Jackson. This harbour lies three leagues to the northward of Botany Bay. The variation by several azimuths appeared to be eight degrees east. At sunset, the northernmost land in sight bore north 26 degrees east, and some broken land that seemed to form a bay bore north 40 degrees west, distant four leagues. This bay, which lies in latitude 33 degrees 42 minutes, I called Broken Bay. We steered along the shore north-northeast all night, at the distance of about three leagues from the land, having from 32 to 36 fathom water, with a hard sandy bottom. Soon after sunrise on the 7th, I took several azimuths, with four needles belonging to the azimuth compass, the mean result of which gave the variation 7 degrees 56 minutes east. At noon, our latitude by observation was 33 degrees 22 minutes south. We were about three leagues from the shore. The northernmost land in sight bore north 19 degrees east, and some lands which projected in three bluff points, and which, for that reason, I called Cape Three Points, bore southwest distant five leagues. Our longitude from Botany Bay was 19 minutes east. In the afternoon, we saw smoke in several places upon the shore, and in the evening found the variation to be 8 degrees 25 minutes east. At this time, we were between 2 and 3 miles from the shore, in 28 fathom, and at noon the next day, we had not advanced one step to the northward. We stood offshore with the winds northerly till twelve at night, and at the distance of about five leagues had seventy fathom. At the distance of six leagues we had eighty fathom, which is the extent of the soundings, for at the distance of ten leagues we had no ground with a hundred and fifty fathom. The wind continuing northerly till the morning of the 10th, we continued to stand in and off the shore, with very little change of situation in other respects. But a gale then springing up at southwest, we made the best of our way along the shore to the northward. At sunrise, our latitude was 33 degrees 2 minutes south, and the variation 8 degrees east. At nine in the forenoon, we passed a remarkable hill, which stood a little way inland, and somewhat resembled the crown of a hat. And at noon, our latitude by observation was 32 degrees 53 minutes south, and our longitude 208 degrees west. We were about two leagues distant from the land, which extended from north 41 degrees east to south 41 degrees west, and a small round rock or island, which lay close under the land, bore south 82 degrees west, distant between three and four leagues. At four in the afternoon, we passed, at the distance of about a mile, a low rocky point, which I called Point Stevens on the north side of which is an inlet, which I called Port Stevens. This inlet appeared to me, from the masthead, to be sheltered from all winds. It lies in latitude 32 degrees 40 minutes, longitude 207 degrees 51 minutes, and at the entrance are three small islands, two of which are high, 
and on the main near the shore are some high round hills which at a distance appear like islands in passing this bay at the distance of two or three miles from the shore our soundings were from thirty three to twenty seven fathom from which i conjectured that there must be a sufficient depth of water within it at a little distance within land we saw smoke in several places and at half an hour past five the northernmost land in sight bore north thirty six degrees east and point stephens southwest distant four leagues our soundings in the night were from forty eight to sixty two fathom at the distance of between three and four leagues from the shore which made in two hillocks this point i called cape hawk it lies in the latitude of thirty two degrees fourteen minutes south longitude two o seven degrees thirty minutes west and at four o'clock in the morning bore west distant about eight miles at the same time the northernmost land in sight bore north six degrees east and appeared like an island at noon this land bore north eight degrees east the northernmost land in sight north thirteen degrees east and cape hawk south thirty seven degrees west our latitude by observation was thirty two degrees two minutes south which was twelve miles to the southward of that given by the log so that probably we had a current setting that way by the morning amplitude and azimuth the variation was nine degrees ten minutes east during our run along the shore in the afternoon we saw smoke in several places at a little distance from the beach and one up on the top of a hill which was the first we had seen upon elevated ground since our arrival upon the coast at sunset we had twenty three fathom at the distance of a league and a half from the shore the northernmost land then bore north thirteen degrees east and three hills remarkably large and high lying contiguous to each other and not far from the beach north northwest as these hills bore some resemblance to each other we called them the three brothers they lie in latitude thirty one degrees forty minutes and may be seen fourteen or sixteen leagues we steered northeast by north all night having from twenty seven to sixty seven fathom at the distance of between two and six leagues from the shore at daybreak we steered north for the northernmost land in sight at noon we were four leagues from the shore and by observation in latitude thirty one degrees eighteen minutes south which was fifteen miles to the southward of that given by the log our longitude two o six degrees fifty eight minutes west in the afternoon we stood in for the land where we saw smoke in several places till six in the evening when being within three or four miles of it and in twenty-four fathom of water we stood off with a fresh breeze at north and north-north-west till midnight when we had one hundred and eighteen fathom at the distance of eight leagues from the land and then tacked at three in the morning the wind veered to the westward when we tacked and stood to the northward at noon our latitude by observation was thirty degrees forty three minutes south and our longitude two o six degrees forty five minutes west at this time we were between three and four leagues from the shore the northernmost part of which bore from us north thirteen degrees west and a point or headland on which we saw fires that produced a great quantity of smoke bore west distant four leagues to this point i gave the name of smoky cape it is of a considerable height 
and over the pitch of the point is a round hillock. Within it are two others, much higher and larger, and within them the land is very low. Our latitude was 30 degrees 31 minutes south, longitude 206 degrees 54 minutes west. This day the observed latitude was only five miles south of the log. We saw smoke in several parts along the coast, besides that seen upon Smoky Cape. In the afternoon, the wind being at northeast, we stood off and on, and at three or four miles distance from the shore had thirty fathom water. The wind afterwards coming cross off land, we stood to the northward, having from thirty to twenty one fathom at the distance of four or five miles from the shore. At five in the morning, the wind veered to the north and blew fresh, attended with squalls. At eight, it began to thunder and rain, and in about an hour it fell calm, which gave us an opportunity to sound, and we had eighty-six fathom at between four and five leagues from the shore. Soon after this we had a gale from the southward, with which we steered north by west for the northernmost land in sight. At noon we were about four leagues from the shore and, by observation, in latitude 30 degrees 22 minutes, which was nine miles to the southward of our reckoning, longitude 206 degrees 39 minutes west. Some lands near the shore of a considerable height, bore west. As we advanced to the northward from Botany Bay, the land gradually increased in height, so that in this latitude it may be called a hilly country. Between this latitude and the bay, it exhibits a pleasing variety of ridges, hills, valleys and plains, all clothed with wood, of the same appearance with that which has been particularly described. The land near the shore is in general low and sandy, except the points, which are rocky, and over many of them are high hills, which, at their first rising out of the water, have the appearance of islands. In the afternoon we had some small rocky islands between us and the land, the southernmost of which lies in latitude 30 degrees 10 minutes, and the northernmost in 29 degrees 58 minutes, and somewhat more than two leagues from the land. About two miles without the northernmost island, we had 33 fathom water. Having the advantage of a moon, we steered along the shore all night, in the direction of north and north by east, keeping at the distance of about three leagues from the land, and having from twenty to twenty-five fathom water. As soon as it was light, having a fresh gale, we made all the sail we could, and at nine o'clock in the morning, being about a league from the shore, we discovered smoke in many places, and having recourse to our glasses, we saw about twenty of the natives, who had each a large bundle up on his back, which we conjectured to be palm leaves for covering their houses. We continued to observe them for above an hour, during which they walked upon the beach, and up a path that led over a hill of a gentle ascent, behind which we lost sight of them. Not one of them was observed to stop and look towards us, but they trudged along, to all appearance, without the least emotion, either of curiosity or surprise, though it is impossible they should not have seen the ship by a casual glance as they walked along the shore. And though she must, with respect to every other object they had yet seen, have been little less stupendous and unaccountable than a floating mountain with all its woods would have been to us, at noon, our latitude by observation was 28 degrees 39 minutes south and longitude 206 degrees 27 minutes west. A high point of land, which I named Cape Byron, 
bore northwest by west at the distance of three miles. It lies in latitude 28 degrees 37 minutes 30 seconds south, longitude 206 degrees 30 minutes west, and may be known by a remarkable sharp peaked mountain which lies inland and bears from it northwest by west. From this point, the land trends north 13 degrees west. Inland it is high and hilly, but low near the shore. To the southward of the point it is also low and level. We continued to steer along the shore with a fresh gale till sunset, when we suddenly discovered breakers ahead, directly in the ship's course, and also on our larboard bow. At this time we were about five miles from the land, and had twenty fathom water. We hauled up east till eight, when we had run eight miles, and increased our depth of water to forty-four fathom. We then brought two, with the ship's head to the eastward, and lay upon this tack till ten, when, having increased our sounding to seventy-eight fathom, we wore and lay with the ship's head to the land till five in the morning, when we made sail, and, at daylight, were greatly surprised to find ourselves farther to the southward than we had been the evening before, though the wind had been southerly and blown fresh all night. We now saw the breakers again within us, and passed them at the distance of one league. They lie in latitude 28 degrees 8 minutes south, stretching off east two leagues from a point of land, under which is a small island. Their situation may always be known by the peaked mountain which has been just mentioned, and which bears from them southwest by west. For this reason I have named it Mount Warning. It lies seven or eight leagues inland, in latitude 28 degrees 22 minutes south. The land about it is high and hilly, but it is of itself sufficiently conspicuous to be at once distinguished from every other object. The point of which these shoals lie I have named Point Danger. To the northward of this point the land is low and trends northwest by north, but it soon turns again more to the northward. At noon we were about two leagues from the land and, by observation, in latitude 27 degrees 46 minutes south, which was 17 miles to the southward of the log. Our longitude was 206 degrees 26 minutes west. Mount Warning bore south 26 degrees west, distant 14 leagues, and the northernmost land in sight bore north. We pursued our course along the shore at the distance of about two leagues, in the direction of north three-quarter east, till between four and five in the afternoon, when we discovered breakers on our larboard bow. Our depth of water was 37 fathom, and at sunset, the northernmost land bore north by west, the breakers northwest by west, distant four miles, and the northernmost land set at noon, which formed a point, and to which I gave the name of Point Lookout, west, distant five or six miles, in the latitude of 27 degrees six minutes. On the north side of this point, the shore forms a wide open bay, which I called Morton's Bay, in the bottom of which the land is so low that I could but just see it from the top masthead. The breakers lie between three or four miles from Point Lookout, and at this time we had a great sea from the southward, which broke upon them very high. We stood at north north east till eight o'clock, when having passed the breakers and deepened our water to fifty-two fathom, we brought to till midnight, when we made sail again to the north north east. At four in the morning we had a hundred and thirty-five fathom, and when the day broke, I perceived that during the night I had got much farther northward, and from the shore, than I expected from the course we steered, 
for we were distant at least seven leagues. I therefore hauled in northwest by west, with a fresh gale at south southwest. The land that was farthest to the north the night before I now bore south southwest, distant six leagues, and I gave it the name of Cape Morton, it being the north point of Morton's Bay. Its latitude is 26 degrees 56 minutes, and its longitude is 206 degrees 28 minutes. From Cape Morton, the land trends away west, farther than can be seen, for there is a small space where at this time no land is visible, and some on board having also observed that the sea looked paler than usual, were of opinion that the bottom of Morton's Bay opened into a river. We had here thirty-four fathom water and a fine sandy bottom. This alone would have produced the change that had been observed in the colour of the water, and it was by no means necessary to suppose a river to account for the land at the bottom of the bay not being visible. For supposing the land there to be as low as we knew it to be in a hundred other parts of the coast, it would have been impossible to see it from the station of the ship. However, if any future navigator should be disposed to determine the question whether there is or is not a river in this place, which the wind would not permit us to do, the situation may always be found by three hills which lie to the northward of it in the latitude of 26 degrees 53 minutes. These hills lie but a little way inland and not far from each other. They are remarkable for the singular form of their elevation, which very much resembles a glass house, and for which reason I call them the glass houses. The northernmost of the three is the highest and largest. There are also several other peaked hills inland to the northward of these, but they are not nearly so remarkable. At noon our latitude was, by observation, 26 degrees 28 minutes south, which was 10 miles to the northward of the log, a circumstance which had never before happened upon this coast. Our longitude was 206 degrees 46 minutes. At this time, we were between two and three leagues from the land and had 24 fathom water. A low bluff point, which was the south head of a sandy bay, bore north 62 degrees west, distant three leagues, and the northernmost point of land in sight bore north one quarter east. This day we saw smoke in several places, and some at a considerable distance inland. In steering along the shore at the distance of two leagues, our soundings were from 24 to 32 fathom, with a sandy bottom. At six in the evening, the northernmost point of the land bore north one quarter west, distant four leagues. At ten it bore northwest by west half west, and as we had seen no land to the northward of it, we brought to, not well knowing which way to steer. At two in the morning, however, we made sail with the wind at southwest, and at daylight we saw the land extending as far as north three quarter east. The point we had set the night before bore southwest by west distant between three and four leagues. It lies in latitude 25 degrees 58 minutes, longitude 206 degrees 48 minutes west. The land within it is of a moderate and equal height, but the point itself is so unequal that it looks like two small islands lying under the land, for which reason I gave it the name of Double Island Point. It may also be known by the white cliffs on the north side of it. Here the land trends to the northwest and forms a large open bay, the bottom of which is so low a flat that from the deck it could scarcely be seen. In crossing this bay, our depth of water was from 30 to 22 fathom, 
with a white sandy bottom. At noon, we were about three leagues from the shore in latitude 25 degrees 34 minutes south, longitude 206 degrees 45 minutes west. Double Island Point bore south three quarters west and at the northernmost land in sight north three quarters east. This part of the coast, which is of a moderate height, is more barren than any we had seen and the soil more sandy. With our glasses we could discover that the sands, which lay in great patches of many acres, were movable and that some of them had not been lung in the place they possessed. For we saw in several parts trees half buried, the tops of which were still green, and in others the naked trunks of such as the sand had surrounded long enough to destroy. In other places the woods appeared to be low and shrubby, and we saw no signs of inhabitants. Two water snakes swam by the ship. They were beautifully spotted, and in every respect like land snakes, except that their tails were broad and flat, probably to serve them instead of fins in swimming. In the morning of this day the variation was 8 degrees 20 minutes east, and in the evening 8 degrees 36 minutes. During the night we continued our course to the northward, with a light breeze from the land, being distant from it between two and three leagues, and having from 23 to 27 fathom, with a fine sandy bottom. At noon, on the 19th, we were about four miles from the land, with only 13 fathom. Our latitude was 25 degrees 4 minutes, and the northernmost land in sight bore north 21 degrees west, distant 8 miles. At one o'clock, being still four miles distant from the shore, but having seventeen fathom water, we passed a black bluff head, or point of land, upon which a great number of the natives were assembled, and which therefore I called Indian Head. It lies in latitude twenty-five degrees three minutes. About four miles north by west of this head is another very like it, from whence the land trends away somewhat more to the westward. Next to the sea it is low and sandy, and behind it nothing was to be seen, even from the masthead. Near Indian Head we saw more of the natives, and upon the neighbouring shore fires by night and smoke by day. We kept to the northward all night, at the distance of from four miles to four leagues from the shore, and with a depth of water from 17 to 34 fathom. At daybreak, the northernmost land bore from us west-southwest, and seemed to end in a point, from which we discovered a reef running out to the northward, as far as we could see. We had hauled our wind to the westward before it was light, and continued the course till we saw the breakers upon our lee bow. We now edged away northwest and north northwest along the east side of the shoal, from two to one mile distant, having regular soundings from thirteen to seven fathom, with a fine sandy bottom. At noon, our latitude by observation was twenty degrees twenty six minutes, which was thirteen miles to the northward of the log. We judged the extreme point of the shoal to bear from us about northwest, and the point from which it seemed to run out bore south three quarter west, distant twenty miles. This point I named Sandy Cape from two very large patches of white sand which lay upon it. It is sufficiently high to be seen at the distance of twelve leagues in clear weather and lies in latitude 24 degrees 45 minutes, longitude 206 degrees 51 minutes. The land trends from its southwest as far as can be seen. We kept along the east side of the shoal till two in the afternoon, when, judging that there was a sufficient depth of water upon it to allow passage for the ship, I sent the boat ahead to sound, 
and upon her making the signal for more than five fathom we hauled our wind and stood over the tail of it in six fathom at this time we were in latitude twenty four degrees twenty two minutes and sandy cape bore south half east distant eight leagues but the direction of the shoal is nearest north north west and south south east it is remarkable that when on board the ship we had six fathom the boat which was scarcely a quarter of a mile to the southward had little more than five and that immediately after six fathom we had thirteen and then twenty as fast as the man could cast the lead from these circumstances i conjectured that the west side of the shoal was steep this shoal i called the break sea spit because we had now smooth water and to the southward of it we had always a high sea from the southeast at six in the evening the land of sandy cape extended from south seventeen degrees east to south twenty seven degrees east at the distance of eight leagues our depth of water was twenty three fathom with the same soundings we stood to the westward all night at seven in the morning we saw from the masthead the land of sandy cape bearing southeast a half east distant about thirteen leagues at nine we discovered land to the westward and soon after saw smoke in several places our depth of water was now decreased to seventeen fathom and by noon we had no more than thirteen though we were seven leagues from the land which extended from south by west to west northwest our latitude at this time was twenty four degrees twenty eight minutes south for a few days past we had seen several of the seabirds called boobies not having met with any of them before last night a small flock of them passed the ship and went away to the northwest and in the morning from about half an hour before sunrise to half an hour after flights of them were continually coming from the north northwest and flying to the south southeast nor was one of them seen to fly in any other direction we therefore conjectured that there was a lagoon river or inlet of shallow water in the bottom of the deep bay to the southward of us whither these birds resorted to feed in the day and that not far to the northward there were some islands to which they repaired in the night to this bay i gave the name of harvey's bay in honour of captain harvey in the afternoon we stood in for the land steering southwest with a gentle breeze at southeast till four o'clock when being in latitude twenty four degrees thirty six minutes about two leagues from the shore and having nine fathom water we bore away along the coast northwest by west and at the same time could see land extending from the south southeast about eight leagues near the sea the land is very low but within there are some lofty hills all thickly clothed with wood while we were running along the shore we shallowed our water from nine to seven fathom and at one time we had but six which determined us to anchor for the night at six in the morning we weighed with a gentle breeze from the southward and steered northwest one quarter west edging in for the land till we got within two miles of it with water from seven to eleven fathom we then steered north northwest as the land lay and at noon our latitude was twenty four degrees nineteen minutes we continued in the same course at the same distance with from twelve fathom to seven till five in the evening when we were abreast of the south point of a large open bay in which i intended to anchor during this course we discovered with our glasses that the land was covered with palm nut trees which we had not seen from the time of our leaving the islands within the tropic we also saw two men walking along the shore who did not condescend to take the least notice of us 
In the evening, having hauled close upon a wind and made two or three trips, we anchored about eight o'clock in five fathom with a fine sandy bottom. The south point of the bay bore east three-quarters south, distant two miles, the north point northwest one-quarter north, and about the same distance from the shore. End of section 8「Section nine of the First Voyage of James Cook, Volume two by James Cook, seventeen twenty eight to seventeen seventy nine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book three, Chapter two, Part two. The range from Botany Bay to Trinity Bay with a farther account of the country, its inhabitants, and productions. Continued. Early the next morning I went ashore with a party of men in order to examine the country, accompanied by Mr. Banks, Dr. Zollander, the other gentlemen, and Tupia. The wind blew fresh, and we found it so cold that being at some distance from the shore, we took our cloaks as a necessary equipment for the voyage. We landed a little within the south point of the bay, where we found a channel leading into a large lagoon. This channel I proceeded to examine and found three fathom water till I got about a mile up it, where I met with a shoal upon which there was little more than one fathom, but having passed over it, I had three fathom again. The entrance of this channel lies close to the south point of the bay, being formed by the shore on the east and on the west by a large spit of land. It is about a quarter of a mile broad and lies in south by west. In this place there is room for a few ships to lie in great security and a small stream of fresh water. I would have rowed into the lagoon, but was prevented by shallows. We found several bogs and swamps of salt water, upon which, and by the sides of the lagoon, grows the true mangrove, such as is found in the West Indies, and the first of the kind that we had met with. In the branches of these mangroves there were many nests of a remarkable kind of ant, that was as green as grass. When the branches were disturbed, they came out in great numbers and punished the offender by a much sharper bite than ever we had felt from the same kind of animal before. Upon these mangroves also, we saw small green caterpillars in great numbers. Their bodies were thick set with hairs and they were ranged upon the leaves side by side like a file of soldiers, to the number of twenty or thirty together. When we touched them, we found that the hair of their bodies had the quality of a nettle, and gave us a much more acute, though less durable, pain. The country here is manifestly worse than about Botany Bay. The soil is dry and sandy, but the sides of the hills are covered with trees, which grow separately, without underwood. We found here the tree that yields a gum like the sanguinis draconis, but it is somewhat different from the trees of the same kind which we had seen before, for the leaves are longer and hang down like those of the weeping willow. We found also much less gum upon them, which is contrary to the established opinion that the hotter the climate, the more gums exude. Upon a plant also, which yielded a yellow gum, there was less than upon the same kind of plant in Botany Bay. Among the shoals and sandbanks we saw many large birds, some in particular of the same kind that we had seen in Botany Bay, much bigger than swans, which we judged to be pelicans, but they were so shy that we could not get within gunshot of them. 
Upon the shore we saw a species of the bustard, one of which we shot. It was as large as a turkey and weighed seventeen pounds and a half. We all agreed that this was the best bird we had eaten since we left England, and in honour of it we call this inlet Bustard Bay. It lies in latitude 24 degrees 4 minutes, longitude 208 degrees 18 minutes. The sea seemed to abound with fish, but unhappily we tore our seine all to pieces at the first haul. Upon the mud banks under the mangroves, we found innumerable oysters of various kinds, among others the hammer oyster and a large proportion of small pearl oysters. If in deeper water there is equal plenty of such oysters at their full growth, a pearl fishery might certainly be established here to very great advantage. The people who were left on board the ship said that while we were in the woods, about twenty of the natives came down to the beach, abreast of her, and having looked at her some time, went away. But we that were ashore, though we saw smoke in many places, saw no people. The smoke was at places too distant for us to get to them by land, except one to which we repaired. We found ten small fires still burning within a few paces of each other, but the people were gone. We saw near them several vessels of bark, which we supposed to have contained water, and some shells and fish bones, the remains of a recent meal. We saw also, lying upon the ground, several pieces of soft bark, about the length and breadth of a man, which we imagined might be their beds, and on the windward side of the fires, a small shade, about a foot and a half high, of the same substance. The hole was in a thicket of close trees, which afforded good shelter from the wind. The place seemed to be much trodden, and as we saw no house, nor any remains of a house, we were inclined to believe that, as these people had no clothes, they had no dwelling, but spent their nights among the other commoners of nature in the open air, and to peer himself, with an air of superiority and compassion, shook his head and said that they were Tata Enos, poor wretches. I measured the perpendicular height of the last tide, and found it to be eight feet above low water mark, and from the time of low water this day, I found that it must be high water at the full and change of the moon at eight o'clock. At four o'clock in the morning we weighed, and with a gentle breeze at south made sail out of the bay. In standing out, our soundings were from five to fifteen fathom, and at daylight, when we were in the greatest depth, and abreast of the north head of the bay, we discovered breakers stretching out from it north-north-east between two and three miles, with a rock at the outermost point of them, just above water. While we were passing these rocks, at the distance of about half a mile, we had from fifteen to twenty fathom, and as soon as we had passed them, we hauled along shore west-north-west for the farthest land we had in sight. At noon our latitude by observation was 23 degrees 52 minutes south. The north part of Bustard Bay bore south 62 degrees east, distant 10 miles, and the northernmost land in sight north 60 degrees west. The longitude was 208 degrees 37 minutes, and our distance from the nearest shore 6 miles, with 14 fathom water. Till 5 in the afternoon it was calm, but afterwards we steered before the wind northwest as the land lay till 10 at night, and then brought to, having had all along 14 and 15 fathom. At five in the morning we made sail, 
and at daylight the northernmost point of the main bore north 70 degrees west. Soon after we saw more land, making like islands, and bearing northwest by north. At nine we were abreast of the point, at the distance of one mile, with fourteen fathom water. This point I found to lie directly under the Tropic of Capricorn, and for that reason I called it Cape Capricorn. Its longitude was 208 degrees 58 minutes west. It is of a considerable height, looks white and barren, and may be known by some islands which lie to the northwest of it, and some small rocks at the distance of about a league southeast. On the west side of the cape there appeared to be a lagoon, and on the two spits which formed the entrance, we saw an incredible number of the large birds that resemble a pelican. The northernmost land now in sight bore from Cape Capricorn north 24 degrees west, and appeared to be an island. But the mainland trended west by north a half north, which course we steered, having from 15 to 6 fathom, and from 6 to 9, with a hard sandy bottom. At noon our latitude by observation was 23 degrees 24 minutes south. Cape Capricorn bore south 60 degrees east, distant 2 leagues, and a small island north by east 2 miles. In this situation we had 9 fathom, being about 4 miles from the main, which, next the sea, is low and sandy, except the points which are high and rocky. The country inland is hilly, but by no means of a pleasing aspect. We continued to stand to the northwest till four o'clock in the afternoon, when it fell calm, and we soon after anchored in twelve fathom, having the mainland and islands in a manner all round us, and Cape Capricorn bearing south 54 degrees east, distant four leagues. In the night we found the tide rise and fall near seven feet, and the flood to set to the westward, and the ebb to the eastward, which is just contrary to what we found when we were at anchor to the eastward of Bustard Bay. At six in the morning we weighed, with a gentle breeze at south, and stood away to the northwest, between the outermost range of islands and the main, leaving several small islands between the main and the ship, which we passed at a very little distance. Our soundings being irregular from twelve to four fathom, I sent a boat ahead to sound. At noon we were about three miles from the main, and about the same distance from the islands without us. Our latitude by observation was 23 degrees 7 minutes south. The mainland here is high and mountainous. The islands which lie off it are also most of them high, and of a small circuit, having the appearance rather of barrenness than fertility. At this time we saw smoke in many places at a considerable distance inland, and therefore conjectured that there might be a lagoon, river, or inlet running up the country, the rather as we had passed two places which had the appearance of being such. But our depth of water was too little to encourage me to venture where I should probably have less. We had not stood to the northward above an hour, before we suddenly fell into three fathom, upon which I anchored, and sent away the master to sound the channel which lay to leeward of us, between the northernmost island and the main. It appeared to be pretty broad, but I suspected that it was shallow, and so indeed it was found, for the master reported at his return that in many places he had only two fathom and a half, and where we lay at anchor we had only sixteen feet, which was not two feet more than the ship drew. While the master was sounding the channel, Mr. Banks tried to fish from the cabin windows with hook and line. 
the water was too shallow for fish, but the ground was almost covered with crabs, which readily took the bait, and sometimes held it so fast in their claws that they did not quit their hold till they were considerably above water. These crabs were of two sorts, and both of them such as we had not seen before. One of them was adorned with the finest blue that can be imagined, in every respect equal to the ultramarine, with which all his claws and every joint was deeply tinged. The under part of him was white, and so exquisitely polished, that in colour and brightness it exactly resembled the white of old china. The other was also marked with the ultramarine upon his joints and his toes, but somewhat more sparingly and his back was marked with three brown spots, which had a singular appearance. The people who had been out with the boat to sound reported that, upon an island where we had observed two fires, they had seen several of the inhabitants, who called to them, and seemed very desirous that they should land. In the evening the wind veered to east-north-east, which gave us an opportunity to stretch three or four miles back by the way we came, after which the wind shifted to the south and obliged us again to anchor in six fathom. At five in the morning I sent away the master to search for a passage between the islands while we got the ship under sail, and as soon as it was light we followed the boat which made a signal that a passage had been found. As soon as we had got again into deep water, we made sail to the northward as the land lay, with soundings from nine fathom to fifteen, and some small islands still without us. At noon we were about two leagues distant from the main, and, by observation, in latitude 22 degrees 53 minutes south. The northernmost point of land in sight now bore north-northwest, distant 10 miles. To this point I gave the name of Cape Manifold from the number of high hills which appeared over it. It lies in latitude 22 degrees 43 minutes south and distant about 17 leagues from Cape Capricorn in the direction of north 26 degrees west. Between these capes the shore forms a large bay, which I called Keppel Bay, and I also distinguish the islands by the name of Keppel's Islands. In this bay there is good anchorage, but what refreshments it may afford I know not. We caught no fish, though we were at anchor but probably there is fresh water in several places, as both the islands and the main are inhabited. We saw smoke and fires upon the main, and upon the islands we saw people. At three in the afternoon we passed Cape Manifold, from which the land trends north-northwest. The land of the Cape is high, rising in hills directly from the sea and may be known by three islands which lie off it, one of them near the shore and the other two eight miles out at sea. One of these islands is low and flat, and the other high and round. At six o'clock in the evening we brought two, when the northernmost part of the main in sight bore northwest, and some islands which lie off it north thirty-one degrees west. Our soundings after twelve o'clock were from twenty to twenty-five fathom, and in the night from thirty to thirty-four. At daybreak we made sail, Cape Manifold bearing south by east, distant eight leagues, and the islands which I had set the night before were distant four miles in the same direction. The farthest visible point of the main bore north 67 degrees west at the distance of 22 miles, but we could see several islands to the northward of this direction. 
At nine o'clock in the forenoon, we were abreast of the point which I called Cape Townsend. It lies in latitude 22 degrees 15 minutes, longitude 209 degrees 43 minutes. The land is high and level, and rather naked than woody. Several islands lie to the northward of it, at the distance of four or five miles out at sea. Three or four leagues to the southeast, the shore forms a bay, in the bottom of which there appeared to be an inlet or harbour. To the westward of the cape, the land trends southwest or half south, and there forms a very large bay, which turns to the eastward and probably communicates with the inlet and makes the land of the cape an island. As soon as we got round this cape, we hauled our wind to the westward in order to get within the islands, which lie scattered in the bay in great numbers, and extend out to sea as far as the eye could reach, even from the masthead. These islands vary both in height and circuit from each other, so that, although they are very numerous, no two of them are alike. We had not stood long upon a wind before we came into shoal water, and were obliged to tack at once to avoid it. Having sent a boat ahead, I bore away west by north, many small islands, rocks and shoals lying between us and the main, and many of a larger extent without us. Our soundings till near noon were from 14 to 17 fathom, when the boat made the signal for meeting with shoal water. Upon this we hauled close upon a wind to the eastward, but suddenly fell into three fathom and a quarter. We immediately dropped an anchor, which brought the ship up with all her sails standing. When the ship was brought up we had four fathom, with a coarse sandy bottom, and found a strong tide setting to the northwest by west or half west at the rate of near three miles an hour by which we were so suddenly carried upon the shoal our latitude by observation was twenty two degrees eight minutes south cape townsend or east sixteen degrees south distant thirteen miles and the westernmost part of the main in sight west three quarters north at this time a great number of islands lay all round us. In the afternoon, having sounded round the ship, and found there was water sufficient to carry her over the shoal, we weighed, and about three o'clock made sail and stood to the westward, as the land lay, having sent a boat ahead to sound. At six in the evening we anchored in ten fathom, with a sandy bottom, at about two miles distance from the main, the westernmost part of which bore west-northwest, and a great number of islands, lying a long way without us, were still in sight. At five o'clock the next morning, I sent away the master with two boats to sound the entrance of an inlet, which bore from us west, at about the distance of a league, into which I intended to go with the ship, that I might wait a few days till the moon should increase, and in the meantime examine the country. As soon as the ship could be got under sail, the boats made the signal for anchorage, upon which we stood in and anchored in five fathom water, about a league within the entrance of the inlet, which, as I observed a tide to flow and ebb considerably, I judged to be a river that ran up the country to a considerable distance. In this place I had thoughts of laying the ship ashore and cleaning her bottom. I therefore landed with the master in search of a convenient place for that purpose and was accompanied by Mr. Banks and Dr. Zollander. We found walking here exceedingly troublesome for the ground was covered with a kind of grass the seeds of which were very sharp, and bearded backwards, so that whenever they stuck into our clothes, which indeed was at every step, they worked forwards by means of the beard till they got at the flesh, and at the same time we were surrounded by a cloud of mosquitoes, 
which incessantly tormented us with their stings. We soon met with several places where the ship might conveniently be laid ashore, but to our great disappointment we could find no fresh water. We proceeded, however, up the country, where we found gum trees like those that we had seen before, and observed that here also the gum was in very small quantities. Upon the branches of these trees and some others, we found ants' nests made of clay as big as a bushel, something like those described in Sir Hans Sloane's Natural History of Jamaica, Volume 2, page 221, Table 258, but not so smooth. The ants which inhabited these nests were small and their bodies white. But upon another species of the tree, we found a small black ant, which perforated all the twigs, and having worked out the pith, occupied the pipe which had contained it. Yet the parts in which these insects had thus formed a lodgment, and in which they swarmed in amazing numbers, bore leaves and flowers, and appeared to be in as flourishing a state as those that were sound. We found also an incredible number of butterflies, so that for the space of three or four acres, the air was so crowded with them that millions were to be seen in every direction, at the same time that every branch and twig was covered with others that were not upon the wing. We found here also a small fish of a singular kind. It was about the size of a minnow, and had two very strong breast fins. We found it in places that were quite dry, where we supposed it might have been left by the tide, but it did not seem to have become languid by the want of water, for upon our approach it leaped away by the help of the breast fins as nimbly as a frog. Neither, indeed, did it seem to prefer water to land, for when we found it in the water, it frequently leaped out and pursued its way upon dry ground. We also observed that when it was in places where small stones were standing above the surface of the water at a little distance from each other, it chose rather to leap from stone to stone than to pass through the water, and we saw several of them pass entirely over puddles in this manner till they came to dry ground, and then leap away. In the afternoon we renewed our search after fresh water, but without success, and therefore I determined to make my stay here but short. However, having observed from an eminence that the inlet penetrated a considerable way into the country, I determined to trace it in the morning. At sunrise I went ashore, and climbing a considerable hill, I took a view of the coast and the islands that lie off it, with their bearings, having an azimuth compass with me for that purpose. But I observed that the needle differed very considerably in its position, even to thirty degrees, in some places more, in others less and once I found it differ from itself no less than two points in the distance of fourteen feet. I took up some of the loose stones that lay upon the ground, and applied them to the needle, but they produced no effect, and I therefore concluded that there was iron ore in the hills, of which I had remarked other indications both here and in the neighbouring parts. After I had made my observations upon the hill, I proceeded with Dr. Zollander up the inlet. I set out with the first of the flood, and long before high water, I had advanced above eight leagues. Its breadth thus far was from two to five miles upon a southwest by south direction, but here it opened every way and formed a large lake which to the northwest communicated with the sea, and I not only saw the sea in that direction, but found the tide of flood coming strongly in from that point. I also observed an arm of this lake extending to the eastward, 
and it is not improbable that it may communicate with the sea in the bottom of the bay which lies to the westward of cape townsend on the south side of the lake is a ridge of high hills which i was very desirous to climb but it being high water and the day far spent i was afraid of being bewildered among the shoals in the night especially as the weather was dark and rainy and therefore i made the best of my way to the ship in this excursion i saw only two people and they were at a distance they followed the boat along the shore a good way but the tide running strongly in my favour i could not prudently wait for them i saw however several fires in one direction and smoke in another but they were also at a distance while i was tracing the inlet with dr zollander mr banks was endeavouring to penetrate into the country where several of the people who had leave to go ashore were also rambling about mr banks and his party found their course obstructed by a swamp covered with mangroves which however they resolved to pass the mud was almost knee-deep yet they resolutely went on but before they got halfway over they repented of their undertaking the bottom was covered with branches of trees interwoven with each other sometimes they kept their footing upon them sometimes their feet slipped through and sometimes they were so entangled among them that they were forced to free themselves by groping in the mud and slime with their hands in about an hour however they crossed it and judged it might be about a quarter of a mile over after a short walk they came up to a place where there had been four small fires and near them some shells and bones of fish that had been roasted they found also heaps of grass laid together where four or five people appeared to have slept the second lieutenant mr gore who was at another place saw a little water lying in the bottom of a gully and near it the track of a large animal some bustards were also seen but none of them shot nor any other bird except a few of the beautiful loriquettes which we had seen in botany bay mr gore and one of the midshipmen who were in different places said that they had heard the voices of indians near them but had seen none the country in general appeared sandy and barren and being destitute of fresh water it cannot be supposed to have any settled inhabitants the deep gullies which were worn by torrents from the hills prove that at certain seasons the rains here are very copious and heavy end of section nine Section 10 of The First Voyage of James Cook, Volume 2, by James Cook, 1728-1779. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 3, Chapter 2, Part 3. The Range from Botany Bay to Trinity Bay with a farther account of the country, its inhabitants, and productions. Continued. The inlet in which the ship lay I called Thirsty Sound, because it afforded us no fresh water. It lies in latitude 22 degrees 10 minutes south, and longitude 210 degrees 18 minutes west and may be known by a group of small islands lying under the shore from two to five leagues distant in the direction of northwest and by another group of islands that lie right before it between three and four leagues out to sea over each of the points that form the entrance is a high round hill which on the northwest is a peninsula that at high water is surrounded by the sea they are bold to both the shores 
and the distance between them is about two miles. In this inlet is good anchorage in seven, six, five, and four fathom, and places very convenient for laying a ship down, where, at spring tides, the water does not rise less than sixteen or eighteen feet. The tide flows at the full and change of the moon about eleven o'clock. I have already observed that here is no fresh water, nor could we procure refreshment of any other kind. We saw two turtles, but we were not able to take either of them. Neither did we catch either fish or wild fowl, except a few small land birds. We saw indeed the same sorts of waterfowl as in Botany Bay, but they were so shy that we could not get a shot at them. As I had not therefore a single inducement to stay longer in this place, I weighed anchor at six o'clock in the morning of Thursday the 31st of May and put to sea. We stood to the northwest with a fresh breeze at south south east and kept without the group of islands that lie in shore and to the northwest of Thirsty Sound as there appeared to be no safe passage between them and the main. At the same time we had a number of islands without us, extending as far as we could see. During our run in this direction, our depth of water was ten, eight, and nine fathom. At noon, the west point of Thirsty Sound, which I have called Pier Head, bore south 36 degrees east, distant five leagues. The east point of the other inlet, which communicates with the sound, bore south by west, distant two leagues. The group of islands just mentioned lay between us and the point, and the farthest part of the main in sight, on the other side of the inlet, bore northwest. Our latitude by observation was 21 degrees 53 minutes. At half an hour after 12, the boat, which was sounding ahead, made the signal for shoal water, and we immediately hauled our wind to the northeast. At this time we had seven fathom, at the next cast five, and at the next three, upon which we instantly dropped an anchor that brought the ship up. Pier Head, the northwest point of Thirsty Sound, bore southeast, distant six leagues, being halfway between the islands which lie off the east point of the western inlet and three small islands which lie directly without them. It was now the first of the flood, which we found to set northwest by west or half west, and having sounded about the shoal, upon which we had three fathom, and found deep water all round it, we got under sail, and having hauled round the three islands that have been just mentioned, came to an anchor under the lee of them in fifteen fathom water, and the weather being dark, hazy, and rainy, we remained there till seven o'clock in the morning. At this time we got again under sail and stood to the northwest with a fresh breeze at south southeast, having the mainland in sight and a number of islands all round us, some of which lay out at sea as far as the eye could reach. The western inlet, which in the chart is distinguished by the name of Broad Sound, we had now all open. At the entrance it is at least nine or ten leagues wide. In it and before it lie several islands, and probably shoals also, for our soundings were very irregular, varying suddenly from ten to four fathom. At noon our latitude by observation was twenty-one degrees twenty-nine minutes south. A point of land which forms the northwest entrance into Broad Sound, and which I have named Cape Palmerston, 
lying in latitude 21 degrees 30 minutes, longitude 210 degrees 54 minutes west, bore west by north distant three leagues. Our latitude was 21 degrees 27 minutes, our longitude 210 degrees 57 minutes. Between this cape and Cape Townsend lies the bay which I have called the Bay of Inlets. We continued to stand to the northwest and northwest by north as the land lay under an easy sail, having a boat ahead to sound. At first the soundings were very irregular, from nine to four fathom, but afterwards they were regular from nine to eleven. At eight in the evening, being about two leagues from the mainland, we anchored in eleven fathom with a sandy bottom, and soon after we found the tide setting with a slow motion to the westward. At one o'clock it was slack or low water, and at half an hour after two the ship tended to the eastward and rode so till six in the morning when the tide had risen eleven feet. We now got under sail and stood away in the direction of the coast, north-northwest. From what we had observed of the tide during the night, it is plain that the flood came from the northwest, whereas the preceding day and several days before, it came from the southeast. Nor was this the first or even second time that we had remarked the same thing. At sunrise this morning, we found the variation to be 6 degrees 45 minutes east, and in steering along the shore, between the island and the main, at the distance of about two leagues from the main, and three or four from the island, our soundings were regular from 12 to 9 fathom. But about 11 o'clock in the forenoon, we were again embarrassed with shoal water, having at one time not more than three fathom, yet we got clear without casting anchor. At noon we were about two leagues from the main and four from the islands without us. Our latitude by observation was 20 degrees 56 minutes, and a high promontory, which I named Cape Hillsborough, bore west a half north distant seven miles. The land here is diversified by mountains, hills, plains and valleys, and seems to be well clothed with herbage and wood. The islands which lie parallel to the coast, and from five to eight or nine miles distant, are of various height and extent. Scarcely any of them are more than five leagues in circumference, and many are not four miles. Besides this chain of islands, which lies at a distance from the coast, there are others much less, which lie under the land, from which we saw smoke rising in different places. We continued to steer along the shore at the distance of about two leagues, with regular soundings from nine to ten fathom. At sunset, the farthest point of the main bore north 48 degrees west, and to the northward of this lay some high land, which I took to be an island, and of which the northwest point bore 41 degrees west. But not being sure of a passage, I came to an anchor about eight o'clock in the evening in ten fathom water with a muddy bottom. About ten we had a tide setting to the northward, and at two it had fallen nine feet. After this it began to rise, and the flood came from the northward, in the direction of the islands which lay out to sea, a plain indication that there was no passage to the northwest. This, however, had not appeared at daybreak when we got under sail and stood to the northwest. At eight o'clock in the morning, we discovered low land quite across what we took for an opening, which proved to be a bay about five or six leagues deep, 
upon this we hauled our wind to the eastward round the north point of the bay which at this time bore from us northeast by north distant four leagues from this point we found the land trend away north by west a half west and a strait or passage between it and a large island or islands lying parallel to it having the tide of ebb in our favour we stood for this passage and at noon were just within the entrance our latitude by observation was twenty degrees twenty six minutes south cape hillsborough bore south by east distant ten leagues and the north point of the bay south nineteen degrees west distant four miles this point which i named cape conway lies in latitude twenty six degrees thirty six minutes south longitude two eleven degrees twenty eight minutes west and the bay which lies between this cape and cape hillsborough i called repulse bay the greatest depth of water which we found in it was thirteen fathom and the least eight in all parts there was safe anchorage and i believe that upon proper examination some good harbours would be found in it especially at the north side within cape conway for just within that cape there lie two or three small islands which alone would shelter that side of the bay from the southerly and south-easterly winds that seem to prevail here as a trade among the many islands that lie upon this coast there is one more remarkable than the rest it is of a small circuit very high and peaked and lies east by south ten miles from cape conway at the south end of the passage in the afternoon we steered through this passage which we found to be from three to seven miles broad and eight or nine leagues in length north by west a half west south by east a half east it is formed by the main on the west and by the islands on the east one of which is at least five leagues in length our depth of water in running through was from twenty to five and twenty fathom with good anchorage everywhere and the whole passage may be considered as one safe harbour exclusive of the small bays and coves which abound on each side where ships might lie as in a basin the land both upon the main and islands is high and diversified by hill and valley wood and lawn with a green and pleasant appearance on one of the islands we discovered with our glasses two men and a woman and a canoe with an outrigger which appeared to be larger and of a construction very different from those of bark tied together at the ends which we had seen upon other parts of the coast we hoped therefore that the people here had made some farther advances beyond mere animal life than those that we had seen before at six o'clock in the evening we were nearly the length of the north end of the passage the north-westernmost point of the main in sight bore north fifty-four degrees west and the north end of the island north-north-east with an open sea between the two points as this passage was discovered on whit sunday i called it whit sunday's passage and i called the islands that form it cumberland islands in honour of his royal highness the duke we kept under an easy sail with the lead going all night being at the distance of about three leagues from the shore and having from twenty one to twenty three fathom water at daybreak we were abreast of the point which had been the farthest in sight to the northwest the evening before which i named cape gloucester it is a lofty promontory in latitude nineteen degrees fifty nine minutes south longitude two eleven degrees forty nine minutes west and may be known by an island which lies out at sea 
north by west to half west at the distance of five or six leagues from it and which i called holborn isle there are also islands lying under the land between holborn isle and whitsunday's passage on the west side of cape gloucester the land trends away south-west and south-south-west and forms a deep bay the bottom of which i could but just see from the masthead it is very low and a continuation of the lowland which we had seen at the bottom of repulse bay this bay i called edgecombe bay but without staying to look into it we continued our course to the westward for the farthest land we could see in that direction which bore west by north a half north and appeared very high at noon we were about three leagues from the shore by observation in latitude nineteen degrees forty seven minutes south and cape gloucester bore south sixty three degrees east distant seven leagues and a half at six in the evening we were abreast of the westernmost point just mentioned at about three miles distance and because it rises abruptly from the lowlands which surround it i called it cape upstart it lies in latitude nineteen degrees thirty nine minutes south longitude two hundred and twelve degrees thirty two minutes west fourteen leagues west northwest from cape gloucester and is of a height sufficient to be seen at the distance of twelve leagues inland there are some high hills or mountains which like the cape afford but a barren prospect having passed this cape we continued standing to the west northwest as the land lay under an easy sail having from sixteen to ten fathom till two o'clock in the morning when we fell into seven fathom upon which we hauled our wind to the northward judging ourselves to be very near land at daybreak we found our conjecture to be true being within little more than two leagues of it in this part of the coast the land being very low is nearer than it appears to be though it is diversified with here and there a hill at noon we were about four leagues from the land in fifteen fathom water and our latitude by observation was nineteen degrees twelve minutes south cape upstart bearing south thirty two degrees thirty minutes east distant twelve leagues about this time some very large columns of smoke were seen arising from the lowlands at sunset the preceding night when we were close under cape upstart the variation was nearly nine degrees east and at sunrise this day it was no more than five degrees thirty five minutes i judged therefore that it had been influenced by iron ore or other magnetical matter contained under the surface of the earth we continued to steer west northwest as the land lay with twelve or fourteen fathom water till noon on the sixth when our latitude by observation was nineteen degrees one minute south and we had the mouth of a bay all open extending from south a half east to southwest a half south distant two leagues this bay which i named cleveland bay appeared to be about five or six miles in extent every way the east point i named cape cleveland and the west which had the appearance of an island magnetical isle as we perceived that the compass did not traverse well when we were near it they are both high and so is the mainland within them the whole forming a surface the most rugged rocky and barren of any we had seen upon the coast it was not however without inhabitants for we saw smoke in several parts of the bottom of the bay the northernmost land that was in sight at this time bore northwest 
and it had the appearance of an island, for we could not trace the mainland farther than west by north. We steered west-north-west, keeping the mainland on board, the outermost part of which, at sunset, bore west by north. But without it lay high land, which we judged not to be part of it. At daybreak we were abreast of the eastern part of this land, which we found to be a group of islands, lying about five leagues from the main. At this time, being between the two shores, we advanced slowly to the northwest till noon, when our latitude by observation was 18 degrees 49 minutes south, and our distance from the main about five leagues. The northwest part of it bore from us north by west to half west, the islands extending from north to east, and the nearest being distant about two miles. Cape Cleveland bore south 50 degrees east, distant 18 leagues. Our soundings in the course that we had sailed between this time and the preceding noon were from 14 to 11 fathom. In the afternoon we saw several large columns of smoke upon the main. We saw also some people and canoes, and upon one of the islands what had the appearance of coconut trees. As a few of these nuts would now have been very acceptable, I sent Lieutenant Hicks ashore, and with him went Mr. Banks and Dr. Zollander, to see what refreshment could be procured while I kept standing in for the island with the ship. About seven o'clock in the evening they returned, with an account that what we had taken for coconut trees were a small kind of cabbage palm, and that, except about fourteen or fifteen plants, they had met with nothing worth bringing away. While they were ashore, they saw none of the people, but just as they had put off, one of them came very near the beach and shouted with a loud voice. It was so dark that they could not see him. However, they turned towards the shore, but when he heard the boat putting back, he ran away or hid himself, for they could not get a glimpse of him, and though they shouted, he made no reply. After the return of the boats, we stood away north by west for the northernmost land in sight, of which we were abreast at three o'clock in the morning, having passed all the islands three or four hours before. This land, on account of its figure, I named Point Hillock. It is of a considerable height, and may be known by a round hillock, or rock, which joins to the point but appears to be detached from it. Between this cape and magnetical isle, the shore forms a large bay, which I called Halifax Bay. Before it lay the group of islands, which has been just mentioned, and some others at a less distance from the shore. By these islands, the bay is sheltered from all winds, and it affords good anchorage. The land near the beach in the bottom of the bay is low and woody, but farther back it is one continued ridge of high land which appeared to be barren and rocky. Having passed Point Hillock, we continued standing to the north-northwest as the land trended, having the advantage of a light moon. At six, we were abreast of a point of land which lies north by west to half west, distant 11 miles from Point Hillock, which I named Cape Sandwich. Between these two points, the land is very high and the surface is craggy and barren. Cape Sandwich may be known not only by the high craggy land over it, but by a small island which lies east of it, at the distance of a mile, and some others that lie about two leagues to the northward. From Cape Sandwich, the land trends west and afterwards north, forming a fine large bay, which I called Rockingham Bay, where there appears to be good shelter and good anchorage, 
but I did not stay to examine it. I kept ranging along the shore to the northward for a cluster of small islands which lie off the northern point of the bay. Between the three outermost of these islands and those near the shore, I found a channel of about a mile broad through which I passed, and upon one of the nearest islands we saw with our glasses about thirty of the natives, men, women, and children, all standing together and looking with great attention at the ship, the first instance of curiosity that we had seen among them. They were all stark naked, with short hair, and of the same complexion with those that we had seen before. At noon, our latitude by observation was 17 degrees 59 minutes, and we were abreast of the north point of Rockingham Bay which bore from us west at the distance of about two miles. This boundary of the bay is formed by an island of considerable height, which in the chart is distinguished by the name of Dunk Isle, and which lies so near the shore as not to be easily distinguished from it. Our longitude was 213 degrees 57 minutes west, Cape Sandwich bore south by east a half east, distant 19 miles, and the northernmost land in sight north a half west. Our depth of water for the last 10 hours had not been more than 16, nor less than 7 fathom. At sunset, the northern extremity of the land bore north 25 degrees west, and we kept our course north by west along the coast, at the distance of between three and four leagues, with an easy sail all night, having from twelve to fifteen fathom water. At six o'clock in the morning we were abreast of some small islands, which we called Franklin's Isles, and which lie about two leagues distant from the mainland. The most distant point in sight to the northward bore north by west or half west, and we thought it was part of the main, but afterwards found it to be an island of considerable height and about four miles in circuit. Between this island and a point on the main, from which it is distant about two miles, I passed with the ship. At noon we were in the middle of the channel and by observation in the latitude of 16 degrees 57 minutes south with 20 fathom water. The point on the main of which we were now abreast I called Cape Grafton. Its latitude is 16 degrees 57 minutes south and longitude 214 degrees 6 minutes west and the land here as well as the whole coast for about 20 leagues to the southward, is high, has a rocky surface, and is thinly covered with wood. During the night we had seen several fires, and about noon some people. Having hauled round Cape Grafton, we found the land trend away northwest by west, and three miles to the westward of the Cape we found a bay, in which we anchored about two miles from the shore, in four fathom water, with an oozy bottom. The east point of the bay bore south 74 degrees east, the west point south 83 degrees west, and a low, green, woody island, which lies in the offing north 35 degrees east. This island which lies north by east a half east, distant three or four leagues from Cape Grafton, is called in the chart Green Island. As soon as the ship was brought to an anchor, I went ashore, accompanied by Mr. Banks and Dr. Zollander. As my principal view was to procure some fresh water, and as the bottom of the bay was lowland covered with mangroves, where it was not probable fresh water was to be found, I went out towards the Cape and found two small streams, which, however, 
were rendered very difficult of access by the surf and rocks upon the shore. I saw also, as I came round the cape, a small stream of water run over the beach in a sandy cove, but I did not go in with a boat, because I saw that it would not be easy to land. When we got ashore, we found the country everywhere rising into steep rocky hills, and as no fresh water could conveniently be procured, I was unwilling to lose time by going in search of lower land elsewhere. We therefore made the best of our way back to the ship, and about midnight we weighed and stood to the northwest, having but little wind, with some showers of rain. At four in the morning the breeze freshened at south by east, and the weather became fair. We continued steering north-northwest to half-west as the land lay, at about three leagues distance, with ten, twelve, and fourteen fathom water. At ten we hauled off north, in order to get without a small low island, which lay at about two leagues distance from the main, and a great part of which at this time, it being high water, was overflowed. About three leagues to the northwest of this island, close under the mainland, is another island, the land of which rises to a greater height, and which at noon bore from us north fifty five degrees west, distant seven or eight miles. At this time, our latitude was sixteen degrees twenty minutes south. Cape Grafton bore south 29 degrees east, distant 40 miles, and the northernmost point of land in sight, north 20 degrees west. Our depth of water was 15 fathom. Between this point and Cape Grafton, the shore forms a large but not a very deep bay, which being discovered on Trinity Sunday, I called Trinity Bay. End of section 10. Section 11 of The First Voyage of James Cook, Volume 2 by James Cook, 1728 to 1779. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book three chapter three dangerous situation of the ship in her course from trinity bay to endeavour river hitherto we had safely navigated this dangerous coast where the sea in all parts conceals shoals that suddenly project from the shore and rocks that rise abruptly like a pyramid from the bottom for an extent of two and twenty degrees of latitude, more than one thousand three hundred miles, and therefore hitherto none of the names which distinguish the several parts of the country that we saw are memorials of distress. But here we became acquainted with misfortune, and we therefore called the point which we had just seen farthest to the northward, Cape Tribulation. This cape lies in latitude 16 degrees 6 minutes south and longitude 214 degrees 39 minutes west. We steered along the shore north by west at the distance of between 3 and 4 leagues, having from 14 to 12 and 10 fathom water. In the offing we saw two islands which lie in latitude 16 degrees south and about six or seven leagues from the main. At six in the evening, the northernmost land in sight bore north by west a half west, and two low woody islands, which some of us took to be rocks above water, bore north a half west. At this time we shortened sail and hauled off shore east north east and north east by east close upon a wind, for it was my design to stretch off all night, as well to avoid the danger we saw ahead, as to see whether any islands lay in the offing, 
especially as we were now near the latitude assigned to the islands which were discovered by Quiros, and which some geographers, for what reason I know not, have thought fit to join to this land. We had the advantage of a fine breeze and a clear moonlit night, and in standing off from six till near nine o'clock, we deepened our water from fourteen to twenty-one fathom. But while we were at supper, it suddenly shoaled, and we fell into twelve, ten, and eight fathom within the space of a few minutes. I immediately ordered everybody to their station, and all was ready to put about and come to an anchor, but meeting at the next cast of the lead with deep water again, we concluded that we had gone over the tail of the shoals which we had seen at sunset, and that all danger was past. Before ten we had twenty and one and twenty fathom, and this depth continuing, the gentlemen left the deck in great tranquillity and went to bed. But a few minutes before eleven, the water shallowed at once from twenty to seventeen fathom, and before the lead could be cast again, the ship struck and remained immovable, except by the heaving of the surge that beat her against the crags of the rock upon which she lay. In a few moments everybody was upon the deck, with countenances which sufficiently expressed the horrors of our situation. We had stood off the shore three hours and a half, with a pleasant breeze, and therefore knew that we could not be very near it, and we had too much reason to conclude that we were upon a rock of coral, which is more fatal than any other, because the points of it are sharp, and every part of the surface so rough as to grind away whatever is rubbed against it, even with the gentlest motion. In this situation all the sails were immediately taken in, and the boats hoisted out to examine the depth of water round the ship. We soon discovered that our fears had not aggravated our misfortune, and that the vessel had been lifted over a ledge of the rock, and lay in a hollow within it. In some places there was from three to four fathom, and in others not so many feet. The ship lay with her head to the northeast, and at the distance of about thirty yards on the starboard side, the water deepened to eight, ten, and twelve fathom. As soon as the long boat was out, we struck our yards and topmasts, and carried out the stream anchor on the starboard bow, got the coasting anchor and cable into the boat, and were going to carry it out the same way. But upon sounding a second time round the ship, the water was found to be deepest astern. The anchor, therefore, was carried out from the starboard quarter instead of the starboard bow, that is, from the stern instead of the head, and having taken ground, our utmost force was applied to the capstan, hoping that if the anchor did not come home, the ship would be got off, but to our great misfortune and disappointment, we could not move her. During all this time, she continued to beat with great violence against the rock, so that it was with the utmost difficulty that we kept upon our legs, and to complete the scene of distress, we saw by the light of the moon the sheathing boards from the bottom of the vessel floating away all round her, and at last her false keel, so that every moment was making way for the sea to rush in, which was to swallow us up. We had now no chance but to lighten her, and we had lost the opportunity of doing that to the greatest advantage, for unhappily we went on shore just at high water, and by this time it had considerably fallen, so that after she should be lightened so as to draw as much less water as the water had sunk, we should be but in the same situation as at first. And the only alleviation of this circumstance was that as the tide ebbed, the ship settled to the rocks and was not beaten against them with so much violence. 
We had indeed some hope from the next tide, but it was doubtful whether she would hold together so long especially as the rock kept grating her bottom under the starboard bow with such force as to be heard in the fore storeroom this however was no time to indulge conjecture nor was any effort remitted in despair of success that no time might be lost the water was immediately started in the hold and pumped up six of our guns being all we had upon the deck our iron and stone ballast casks hoop staves oil jars decayed stores and many other things that lay in the way of heavier materials were thrown overboard with the utmost expedition every one exerting himself with an alacrity almost approaching to cheerfulness without the least repining or discontent yet the men were so far impressed with a sense of their situation that not an oath was heard among them the habit of profaneness however strong being instantly subdued by the dread of incurring guilt when death seemed to be so near while we were thus employed day broke upon us and we saw the land at about eight leagues distance without any island in the intermediate space upon which if the ship should have gone to pieces we might have been set ashore by the boats and from which they might have taken us by different turns to the main the wind however gradually died away and early in the forenoon it was a dead calm if it had blown hard the ship must inevitably have been destroyed at eleven in the forenoon we expected high water and anchors were got out and everything made ready for another effort to heave her off if she should float but to our inexpressible surprise and concern she did not float by a foot and a half though we had lightened her nearly fifty ton so much did the daytide fall short of that in the night we now proceeded to lighten her still more and threw overboard everything that it was possible for us to spare hitherto she had not admitted much water but as the tide fell it rushed in so fast that two pumps incessantly worked could scarcely keep her free at two o'clock she lay heeling two or three streaks to starboard and the pinnace which lay under her bows touched the ground we had now no hope but from the tide at midnight and to prepare for it we carried out our two bower anchors one on the starboard quarter and the other right astern got the blocks and tackle which were to give us a purchase upon the cables in order and brought the falls or ends of them in a bath straining them tight that the next effort might operate upon the ship and by shortening the length of the cable between that and the anchors draw her off the ledge upon which she rested towards the deep water about five o'clock in the afternoon we observed the tide begin to rise but we observed at the same time that the leak increased to a most alarming degree so that two more pumps were manned but unhappily only one of them would work three of the pumps however were kept going and at nine o'clock the ship righted but the leak had gained upon us so considerably that it was imagined she must go to the bottom as soon as she ceased to be supported by the rock this was a dreadful circumstance so that we anticipated the floating of the ship not as an earnest of deliverance but as an event that would probably precipitate our destruction we well knew that our boats were not capable of carrying us all on shore and that when the dreadful crisis should arrive as all command and subordination would be at an end a contest for preference would probably ensue that it would increase even the horrors of shipwreck and terminate in the destruction of us all by the hands of each other yet we knew that if any should be left on board to perish in the waves they would probably suffer less upon the whole than those who should get on shore 
without any lasting or effectual defence against the natives in a country where even nets and firearms would scarcely furnish them with food and where if they should find the means of subsistence they must be condemned to languish out the remainder of life in a desolate wilderness without the possession or even hope of any domestic comfort and cut off from all commerce with mankind except the naked savages who prowl the desert and who perhaps were some of the most rude and uncivilized upon the earth to those only who have waited in a state of such suspense death has approached in all his terrors and as the dreadful moment that was to determine our fate came on every one saw his own sensations pictured in the countenances of his companions however the capstan and windlass were manned with as many hands as could be spared from the pumps and the ship floating about twenty minutes after ten o'clock the effort was made and she was heaved into deep water it was some comfort to find that she did not now admit more water than she had done upon the rock and though by the gaining of the leak upon the pumps there was no less than three feet nine inches water in the hold yet the men did not relinquish their labour and we held the water as it were at bay but having now endured excessive fatigue of body and agitation of mind for more than four and twenty hours and having but little hope of succeeding at last they began to flag none of them could work at the pump more than five or six minutes together and then being totally exhausted they threw themselves down upon the deck though a stream of water was running over it from the pumps between three and four inches deep when those who succeeded them had worked their spell and were exhausted in their turn they threw themselves down in the same manner and the others started up again and renewed their labour thus relieving each other till an accident was very near putting an end to their efforts at once the planking which lines the inside of the ship's bottom is called the ceiling and between this and the outside planking there is a space of about eighteen inches the man who till this time had attended the well to take the depth of water had taken it only to the ceiling and gave the measure accordingly but he being now relieved the person who came in his stead reckoned the depth to the outside planking by which it appeared in a few minutes to have gained upon the pumps eighteen inches the difference between the planking without and within upon this even the bravest was upon the point of giving up his labour with his hope and in a few minutes everything would have been involved in all the confusion of despair but this accident however dreadful in its first consequences was eventually the cause of our preservation the mistake was soon detected and the sudden joy which every man felt upon finding his situation better than his fears had suggested operated like a charm and seemed to possess him with a strong belief that scarcely any real danger remained new confidence and new hope however founded inspired new vigour and though our state was the same as when the men first began to slacken in their labour through weariness and despondency they now renewed their efforts with such alacrity and spirit that before eight o'clock in the morning the leak was so far from having gained upon the pumps that the pumps had gained considerably upon the leak everybody now talked of getting the ship into some harbour as a thing not to be doubted and as hands could be spared from the pumps they were employed in getting up the anchors the stream anchor and best bow we had taken on board but it was found impossible to save the little bower and therefore it was cut away at a whole cable we lost also the cable of the stream anchor among the rocks but in our situation these were trifles which scarcely attracted our notice 
Our next business was to get up the fore topmast and fore yard and warp the ship to the southeast. And at eleven, having now a breeze from the sea, we once more got under sail and stood for the land. It was, however, impossible long to continue the labour by which the pumps had been made to gain upon the leak, and as the exact situation of it could not be discovered, we had no hope of stopping it within. In this situation, Mr. Monkhouse, one of my midshipmen, came to me and proposed an expedient that he had once seen used on board a merchant ship which sprung a leak that admitted above four feet water an hour, and which, by this expedient, was brought safely from Virginia to London, the master having such confidence in it that he took her out of harbour, knowing her condition, and did not think it worth while to wait till the leak could be otherwise stopped. To this man, therefore, the care of the expedient which is called fathering the ship, was immediately committed, four or five of the people being appointed to assist him, and he performed it in this manner. He took a lower studding sail, and having mixed together a large quantity of oakum and wool, chopped pretty small, he stitched it down in handfuls upon the sail, as lightly as possible, and over this he spread the dung of our sheep and other filth, but horse dung, if we had had it, would have been better. When the sail was thus prepared, it was hauled under the ship's bottom by ropes, which kept it extended, and when it came under the leak, the suction which carried it in the water carried in with it the oakum and wool from the surface of the sail, which in other parts the water was not sufficiently agitated to wash off. By the success of this expedient, our leak was so far reduced that instead of gaining upon three pumps, it was easily kept under with one. This was a new source of confidence and comfort. The people could scarcely have expressed more joy if they had been already in port, and their views were so far from being limited to running the ship ashore in some harbour either of an island or the main, and building a vessel out of her materials to carry us to the East Indies, which had so lately been the utmost object of our hope, that nothing was now thought of but ranging along the shore in search of a convenient place to repair the damage she had sustained, and then prosecuting the voyage upon the same plan as if nothing had happened. Upon this occasion I must observe, both in justice and gratitude to the ship's company and the gentlemen on board, that although in the midst of our distress every one seemed to have a just sense of his danger, yet no passionate exclamations or frantic gestures were to be heard or seen. Every one appeared to have the perfect possession of his mind, and every one exerted himself to the uttermost with a quiet and patient perseverance, equally distant from the tumultuous violence of terror and the gloomy inactivity of despair. In the meantime, having light airs at east-south-east, we got up the top main mast and main yard and kept edging in for the land till about six o'clock in the evening when we came to an anchor in seventeen-fathom water at the distance of seven leagues from the shore, and one from the ledge of rocks upon which we had struck. This ledge or shoal lies in latitude 15 degrees 45 minutes south, and between six and seven leagues from the main. It is not, however, the only shoal on this part of the coast, especially to the northward, and at this time we saw one to the southward, the tail of which we passed over when we had uneven soundings about two hours before we struck. A part of this shoal is always above water and has the appearance of white sand. A part also of that upon which we had lain is dry at low water, 
and in that place consists of sandstones, but all the rest of it is a coral rock. While we lay at anchor for the night, we found that the ship made about 15 inches water an hour, from which no immediate danger was to be apprehended, and at six o'clock in the morning we weighed and stood to the northwest, still edging in for the land with a gentle breeze at south-south-east. At nine we passed close without two small islands that lie in latitude fifteen degrees forty-one minutes south and about four leagues from the main. To reach these islands had, in the height of our distress, been the object of our hope, or perhaps rather of our wishes, and therefore I called them Hope Islands. At noon we were about three leagues from the main, and in latitude 15 degrees 37 minutes south. The northernmost part of the main in sight bore north 30 degrees west, and Hope Islands extended from south 30 degrees east to south 40 degrees east. In this situation, we had 12 fathom water and several sandbanks without us. At this time, the leak had not increased, but that we might be prepared for all events, we got the sail ready for another fothering. In the afternoon, having a gentle breeze at south east by east, I sent out the master with two boats, as well to sound ahead of the ship, as to look out for a harbour where we might repair our defects and put the ship in a proper trim. At three o'clock we saw an opening that had the appearance of a harbour and stood off and on while the boats examined it, but they soon found that there was not depth of water in it sufficient for the ship. When it was near sunset, there being many shoals about us, we anchored in four fathom, at the distance of about two miles from the shore, the land extending from north a half east to south by east a half east. The pinnace was still out with one of the mates, but at nine o'clock she returned and reported that about two leagues to leeward she had discovered just such a harbour as we wanted, in which there was a sufficient rise of water and every other convenience that could be desired, either for laying the ship ashore or heaving her down. In consequence of this information, I weighed at six o'clock in the morning, and having sent two boats ahead to lie upon the shoals that we saw in our way, we ran down to the place. But notwithstanding our precaution, we were once in three fathom water. As soon as these shoals were passed, I sent the boats to lie in the channel that led to the harbour, and by this time it began to blow. It was happy for us that a place of refuge was at hand, for we soon found that the ship would not work, having twice missed stays. Our situation, however, though it might have been much worse, was not without danger. We were entangled among shoals, and I had great reason to fear being driven to leeward before the boats could place themselves so as to prescribe our course. I therefore anchored in four fathom, about a mile from the shore, and then made the signal for the boats to come on board. When this was done, I went myself and buoyed the channel which I found very narrow. The harbour also I found smaller than I expected, but most excellently adapted to our purpose. And it is remarkable that in the whole course of our voyage we had seen no place which, in our present circumstances, could have afforded us the same relief. At noon our latitude was 15 degrees 26 minutes south. During all the rest of this day and the whole night, it blew too fresh for us to venture from our anchor and run into the harbour, and for our farther security we got down the top gallant yards 
unbent the mainsail and some of the smaller sails, got down the fore topgallant mast and the jib boom and sprit sail, with a view to lighten the ship forwards as much as possible, in order to come at her leak, which we supposed to be somewhere in that part, for in all the joy of our unexpected deliverance, we had not forgot that at this time there was nothing but a lock of wool between us and destruction. The gale continuing, we kept our station all the 15th. On the 16th it was somewhat more moderate, and about six o'clock in the morning we hove the cable short, with a design to get under sail, but were obliged to desist and veer it out again. It is remarkable that the sea breeze, which blew fresh when we anchored, continued to do so almost every day while we stayed here. It was calm only while we were upon the rock except once, and even the gale that afterwards wafted us to the shore would then certainly have beaten us to pieces. In the evening of the preceding day, we had observed a fire near the beach over against us, and as it would be necessary for us to stay some time in this place, we were not without hope of making an acquaintance with the people. We saw more fires upon the hills today, and with our glasses discovered four Indians going along the shore, who stopped and made two fires, but for what purpose it was impossible we should guess. The scurvy now began to make its appearance among us, with many formidable symptoms. Our poor Indian, Tupia, who had some time before complained that his gums were sore and swelled, and who had taken plentifully of our lemon juice by the surgeon's direction, had now livid spots upon his legs, and other indubitable testimonies that the disease had made a rapid progress, notwithstanding all our remedies, among which the bark had been liberally administered. Mr. Green, our astronomer, was also declining, and these, among other circumstances, embittered the delay which prevented our going ashore. In the morning of the 17th, though the wind was still fresh, we ventured to weigh and push in for the harbour, but in doing this we twice run the ship aground. The first time she went off without any trouble, but the second time she stuck fast. We now got down the foreyard, four top masts and booms, and taking them overboard, made a raft of them alongside of the ship. The tide was happily rising, and about one o'clock in the afternoon she floated. We soon warped her into the harbour, and having moored her alongside of a steep beach to the south, we got the anchor's cables and all the hawsers on shore before night. End of section 11「Transactions while the ship was refitting in Endeavour River a description of the adjacent country, its inhabitants and productions. In the morning of Monday the 18th, a stage was made from the ship to the shore, which was so bold that she floated at 20 feet distance. Two tents were also set up, one for the sick and the other for stores and provisions, which were landed in the course of the day. We also landed all the empty water casks and part of the stores. As soon as the tent for the sick was got ready for their reception, they were sent ashore to the number of eight or nine, 
and the boat was dispatched to haul the Seine in hopes of procuring some fish for their refreshment, but she returned without success. In the meantime, I climbed one of the highest hills among those that overlooked the harbour, which afforded by no means a comfortable prospect. The lowland near the river is wholly overrun with mangroves, among which the salt water flows every tide, and the highland appeared to be everywhere stony and barren. In the meantime, Mr. Banks had also taken a walk up the country and met with the frames of several old Indian houses and places where they had dressed shellfish, but they seemed not to have been frequented for some months. To Pierre, who had employed himself in angling and lived entirely upon what he caught, recovered in a surprising degree, but Mr. Green still continued to be extremely ill. The next morning I got the four remaining guns out of the hold and mounted them upon the quarter-deck. I also got a spare anchor and anchor stopped ashore and the remaining part of the stores and ballast that were in the hold, set up the smith's forge and employed the armourer and his mate to make nails and other necessaries for the repair of the ship. In the afternoon, all the officers' stores and the ground tier of water were got out, so that nothing remained in the fore and main hold but the coals and a small quantity of stone ballast. This day, Mr. Banks crossed the river to take a view of the country on the other side. He found it to consist principally of sand hills, where he saw some Indian houses which appeared to have been very lately inhabited. In this walk he met with vast flocks of pigeons and crows. Of the pigeons, which were exceedingly beautiful, he shot several. But the crows, which were exactly like those in England, were so shy that he could not get within reach of them. On the 20th we landed the powder and got out the stone ballast and wood which brought the ship's draught of water to eight feet ten inches forward and thirteen feet abaft, and this, I thought, with the difference that would be made by trimming the coals aft, would be sufficient, for I found that the water rose and fell perpendicularly eight feet at the spring tides. But as soon as the coals were trimmed from over the leak, we could hear the water rush in a little abaft the foremast, about three feet from the keel. This determined me to clear the hold entirely. This evening, Mr. Banks observed that in many parts of the inlet there were large quantities of pumice stones, which lay at a considerable distance above high water mark. Whither they might have been carried either by the freshes or extraordinary high tides, for there could be no doubt but that they came from the sea. The next morning we went early to work, and by four o'clock in the afternoon had got out all the coals, cast the moorings loose, and warped the ship a little higher up the harbour, to a place which I thought most convenient for laying her ashore, in order to stop the leak. Her draught of water forward was now seven feet nine inches, and abaft thirteen feet six inches. At eight o'clock, it being high water, I hauled her bow close ashore, but kept her stern afloat, because I was afraid of niping her. It was, however, necessary to lay the whole of her as near the ground as possible. At two o'clock in the morning of the twenty-second, the tide left her, and gave us an opportunity to examine the leak, which we found to be at her floorheads, a little before the starboard forechains. In this place the rocks had made their way through four planks, and even into the timbers. Three more planks were much damaged, and the appearance of these breaches was very extraordinary. There was not a splinter to be seen, but all was as smooth 
as if the whole had been cut away by an instrument. The timbers in this place were happily very close, and if they had not, it would have been absolutely impossible to have saved the ship. But after all, her preservation depended upon a circumstance still more remarkable. One of the holes, which was big enough to have sunk us, if we had had eight pumps instead of four, and been able to keep them incessantly going, was in great measure plugged up by a fragment of the rock, which, after having made the wound, was left sticking in it, so that the water which at first had gained upon our pumps was what came in at the interstices, between the stone and the edges of the hole that received it. We found also several pieces of the fothering, which had made their way between the timbers, and in a great measure stopped those parts of the leak which the stone had left open. Upon further examination we found that, besides the leak, considerable damage had been done to the bottom. Great part of the sheathing was gone from under the larboard bow. A considerable part of the false keel was also wanting and these indeed we had seen swim away in fragments from the vessel while she lay beating against the rock. The remainder of it was in so shattered a condition that it had better have been gone, and the forefoot and main keel were also damaged, but not so as to produce any immediate danger. What damage she might have received abaft could not yet be exactly known, but we had reason to think it was not much, as but little water made its way into her bottom, while the tide kept below the leak which has already been described. By nine o'clock in the morning, the carpenters got to work upon her, while the smiths were busy in making bolts and nails. In the meantime, some of the people were sent on the other side of the water to shoot pigeons for the sick, who at their return reported that they had seen an animal as large as a greyhound, of a slender make, a mouse colour, and extremely swift. They discovered also many Indian houses, and a fine stream of fresh water. The next morning I sent a boat to haul the Seine, but at noon it returned with only three fish, and yet we saw them in plenty leaping about the harbour. This day the carpenter finished the repairs that were necessary on the starboard side, and at nine o'clock in the evening we heeled the ship the other way, and hauled her off about two feet for fear of niping. This day almost everybody had seen the animal which the pigeon shooters had brought an account of the day before and one of the seamen who had been rambling in the woods told us at his return that he verily believed he had seen the devil. We naturally inquired in what form he had appeared, and his answer was in so singular a style that I shall set down his own words. He was, says John, as large as a one-gallon keg, and very like it, he had horns and wings, yet he crept so slowly through the grass that if I had not been afeard, I might have touched him. This formidable apparition we afterwards discovered to have been a bat, and the bats here must be acknowledged to have a frightful appearance, for they are nearly black and full as large as a partridge. They have indeed no horns, but the fancy of a man who thought he saw the devil might easily supply that defect. Early on the 24th, the carpenters began to repair the sheathing under the larboard bow, where we found two planks cut about half, and in the meantime I sent a party of men, under the direction of Mr. Gore, in search of refreshments for the sick. This party returned about noon, with a few palm cabbages and a bunch or two of wild plantain. The plantains were the smallest I had ever seen, and the pulp, though it was well tasted, 
was full of small stones. As I was walking this morning at a little distance from the ship, I saw myself one of the animals which had been so often described. It was of a light mouse colour, and in size and shape very much resembling a greyhound. It had a long tail also, which it carried like a greyhound, and I should have taken it for a wild dog if, instead of running, it had not leapt like a hare or deer. Its legs were said to be very slender, and the print of its foot to be like that of a goat. But where I saw it, the grass was so high that the legs were concealed, and the ground was too hard to receive the track. Mr. Banks also had an imperfect view of this animal, and was of opinion that its species was hitherto unknown. After the ship was hauled ashore, all the water that came into her, of course, went backwards, so that although she was dry forwards, she had nine feet water abaft. As in this part, therefore, her bottom could not be examined on the inside, I took the advantage of the tide being out this evening to get the master and two of the men to go under her and examine her whole larboard side without. They found the sheathing gone about the floor heads abreast of the main mast, and part of a plank a little damaged, but all agreed that she had received no other material injury. The loss of her sheathing alone was a great misfortune, as the worm would now be let into her bottom, which might expose us to great inconvenience and danger. But as I knew no remedy for the mischief but heaving her down, which would be a work of immense labour and long time, if practicable at all in our present situation, I was obliged to be content. The carpenters, however, continued to work under her bottom in the evening till they were prevented by the tide. The morning tide did not ebb out far enough to permit them to work at all, for we had only one tolerable high and low tide in four and twenty hours, as indeed we had experienced when we lay upon the rock. The position of the ship which threw the water in her abaft, was very near depriving the world of all the knowledge which Mr. Banks had endured so much labour, and so many risks to procure, for he had removed the curious collection of plants which he had made during the whole voyage into the bedroom, which lies in the after part of the ship as a place of the greatest security and that nobody having thought of the danger to which laying her head so much higher than the stern would expose them, they were this day found under water. Most of them, however, were, by indefatigable care and attention, restored to a state of preservation, but some were entirely spoilt and destroyed. The 25th was employed in filling water and overhauling the rigging, and at low water the carpenters finished the repairs under the larboard bow, and every other place which the tide would permit them to come at. Some casks were then lashed under her bows to facilitate her floating, and at night, when it was high water, we endeavoured to heave her off, but without success, for some of the casks that were lashed to her gave way. The morning of the 26th was employed in getting more casks ready for the same purpose, and in the afternoon we lashed no less than eight and thirty under the ship's bottom, but to our great mortification these also proved ineffectual, and we found ourselves reduced to the necessity of waiting till the next spring tide. This day, some of our gentlemen, who had made an excursion into the woods, brought home the leaves of a plant, which was thought to be the same that in the West Indies is called cocos. But upon trial, the roots proved too acrid to be eaten. The leaves, however, were little inferior to spinach. 
In the place where these plants were gathered grew plenty of the cabbage trees, which have occasionally been mentioned before, a kind of wild plantain, the fruit of which was so full of stones as scarcely to be eatable. Another fruit was also found about the size of a small golden pippin, but flatter, and of a deep purple colour. When first gathered from the tree, it was very hard and disagreeable, but after being kept a few days became soft, and tasted very much like an indifferent damascene. The next morning we began to move some of the weight from the after part of the ship forward to ease her. In the meantime the armourer continued to work at the forge, the carpenter was busy in caulking the ship, and the men employed in filling water and overhauling the rigging. In the forenoon I went myself in the pinnace up the harbour, and made several hauls with the sin but caught only between twenty and thirty fish, which were given to the sick and convalescent. On the 28th, Mr. Banks went with some of the seamen up the country to show them the plant which in the West Indies is called Indian kale, and which served us for greens. Tupia had much meliorated the root of the cocos by giving them a long dressing in his country oven but they were so small that we did not think them an object to the ship. In their walk they found one tree which had been notched for the convenience of climbing it, in the same manner with those we had seen in Botany Bay. They saw also many nests of white ants, which resemble those of the East Indies, the most pernicious insects in the world. The nests were of a pyramidal figure, from a few inches to six feet high, and very much resembled the stones in England, which are said to be monuments of the Druids. Mr. Gore, who was also this day four or five miles up the country, reported that he had seen the footsteps of men, and tracked animals of three or four different sorts, but had not been fortunate enough to see either man or beast. At two o'clock in the morning of the twenty-ninth, I observed, in conjunction with Mr. Green, an immersion of Jupiter's first satellite. The time here was two hours, eighteen minutes, fifty-three seconds, which gave the longitude of this place two hundred and fourteen degrees, forty-two minutes, thirty seconds west. Its latitude is fifteen degrees, twenty-six minutes south. At break of day I sent the boat out again with the Seine, and in the afternoon it returned with as much fish as enabled me to give every man a pound and a half. One of my midshipmen, an American, who was this day abroad with his gun, reported that he had seen a wolf, exactly like those which he had been used to see in his own country, and that he had shot at it, but did not kill it. The next morning, encouraged by the success of the day before, I sent the boat out again to haul the Seine, and another party to gather greens. I sent also some of the young gentlemen to take a plan of the harbour, and went myself up on a hill, which lies over the south point, to take a view of the sea. At this time it was low water, and I saw with great concern innumerable sandbanks and shoals lying all along the coast in every direction. The innermost lay about three or four miles from the shore, the outermost extended as far as I could see with my glass, and many of them did but just rise above water. There was some appearance of a passage to the northward, and I had no hope of getting clear but in that direction. For, as the wind blows constantly from the south-east, it would have been difficult, if not impossible, to return back to the southward. Mr. Gore reported that he had this day seen two animals like dogs, of a straw colour, that they ran like a hare, and were about the same size. In the afternoon the people returned from hauling the Seine, 
with still better success than before, for I was now able to distribute two pounds and a half to each man. The greens that had been gathered I ordered to be boiled among the peas, and they made an excellent mess, which, with two copious supplies of fish, afforded us unspeakable refreshment. The next day, July the 1st being Sunday, everybody had liberty to go ashore, except one from each mess, who were again sent out with the Seine. The Seine was again equally successful, and the people who went up the country gave an account of having seen several animals, though none of them were to be caught. They saw a fire also about a mile up the river, and Mr. Gore, the second lieutenant, picked up the husk of a coconut, which had been cast upon the beach, and was full of barnacles. This probably might have come from some island to windward, perhaps from the Terra del Espirito Santo of Quiros, as we were now in the latitude where it is said to lie. This day the thermometer in the shade rose to 87, which was higher than it had been on any day since we came upon this coast. Early the next morning I sent the master in the pinnace out of the harbour to sound about the shoals in the offing and look for channel to the northward. At this time we had a breeze from the land which continued till about nine o'clock and was the first we had since our coming into the river. At low water we lashed some empty casks under the ship's bows, having some hope that, as the tides were rising, she would float the next high water. We still continued to fish with great success, and at high water we again attempted to heave the ship off, but our utmost efforts were still ineffectual. The next day at noon the master returned and reported that he had found a passage out to sea between the shoals and described its situation. The shoals, he said, consisted of coral rocks, many of which were dry at low water, and upon one of which he had been ashore. He found here some cockles of so enormous a size that one of them was more than two men could eat, and a great variety of other shellfish, of which he brought us a plentiful supply. In the evening he had also landed in a bay about three leagues to the northward of our station, where he disturbed some of the natives who were at supper. They all fled with the greatest precipitation at his approach, leaving some fresh sea eggs and a fire ready kindled behind them, but there was neither house nor hovel near the place. We observed that although the shoals that lie just within sight of the coast abound with shellfish, which may be easily caught at low water, yet we saw no such shells about the fireplaces on shore. This day an alligator was seen to swim about the ship for some time, and at high water we made another effort to float her, which happily succeeded. We found, however, that by lying so long with her head aground, and her stern float. She had sprung a plank between decks, abreast of the main chains, so that it was become necessary to lay her ashore again. The next morning was employed in trimming her upon an even keel, and in the afternoon, having warped her over and waited for high water, we laid her ashore on the sandbank on the south side of the river, for the damage she had received already from the great descent of the ground made me afraid to lay her broadside to the shore in the same place from which we had just floated her. I was now very desirous to make another trial to come at her bottom, where the sheathing had been rubbed off, but though she had scarcely four feet water under her when the tide was out, yet that part was not dry. On the 5th I got one of the carpenter's crew, a man in whom I could confide, to go down again to the ship's bottom and examine the place. He reported that three streaks of the sheathing 
about eight feet long, were wanting, and that the main plank had been a little rubbed. This account perfectly agreed with the report of the master and others who had been under her bottom before. I had the comfort, however, to find the carpenter of opinion that this would be of little consequence, and therefore the other damage being repaired, she was again floated at high water and moored alongside the beach where the stores had been deposited. We then went to work to take the stores on board and put her in a condition for the sea. This day Mr. Banks crossed to the other side of the harbour, where, as he walked along a sandy beach, he found innumerable fruits, and many of them, such as no plants which he had discovered in this country produced. Among others were some coconuts, which to Pierre said had been opened by a kind of crab, which from his description we judged to be the same that the Dutch call bear's crabber, and which we had not seen in these seas. All the vegetable substances which he found in this place were encrusted with marine productions and covered with barnacles, a sure sign that they must have come far by sea, and as the trade wind blows right upon the shore, probably from Terra del Espirito Santo, which has been mentioned already. The next morning, Mr. Banks, with Lieutenant Gore and three men, set out in a small boat up the river, with a view to spend two or three days in an excursion to examine the country and kill some of the animals which had been so often seen at a distance. On the 7th, I sent the master again out to sound about the shoals, the account which he had brought me of the channel being by no means satisfactory, and we spent the remainder of this day and the morning of the next in fishing and other necessary occupations. About four o'clock in the afternoon, Mr. Banks and his party returned and gave us an account of their expedition. Having proceeded about three leagues among swamps and mangroves, they went up into the country, which they found to differ but little from what they had seen before. They pursued their course, therefore, up the river, which at length was contracted into a narrow channel, and was bounded not by swamps and mangroves, but by steep banks, that were covered with trees of a most beautiful verdure, among which was that which in the West Indies is called moho, or the bark tree, the hibiscus telacius. The land within was in general low, and had a thick covering of long grass. The soil seemed to be such as promised great fertility to any who should plant and improve it. In the course of the day, Tupia saw an animal which, by his description, Mr. Banks judged to be a wolf. They also saw three other animals, but could neither catch nor kill one of them, and a kind of bat as large as a partridge, but this also eluded all their diligence and skill. At night they took up their lodging close to the banks of the river and made a fire but the mosquitoes swarmed about them in such numbers that their quarters were almost untenable. They followed them into the smoke and almost into the fire, which, hot as the climate was, they could better endure than the stings of these insects, which were an intolerable torment. The fire, the flies, and the want of a better bed than the ground rendered the night extremely uncomfortable so that they passed it not in sleep but in restless wishes for the return of day with the first dawn they set out in search of game and in a walk of many miles they saw four animals of the same kind two of which mr banks's greyhound fairly chased but they threw him out at a great distance by leaping over the long thick grass which prevented his running this animal was observed not to run upon four legs, but to bound or hop forward upon two, like the jabua, 
or Mus Yakalus. About noon they returned to the boat and again proceeded up the river, which was soon contracted into a freshwater brook, where, however, the tide rose to a considerable height. As evening approached, it became low water, and it was then so shallow that they were obliged to get out of the boat and drag her along, till they could find a place in which they might, with some hope of rest, pass the night. Such a place at length offered, and while they were getting the things out of the boat, they observed a smoke at the distance of about a furlong, as they did not doubt but that some of the natives with whom they had so long and earnestly desired to become personally acquainted were about the fire three of the party went immediately towards it hoping that so small a number would not put them to flight when they came up to the place however they found it deserted and therefore they conjectured that before they had discovered the indians the Indians had discovered them. They found the fire still burning in the hollow of an old tree that was become touchwood, and several branches of trees newly broken down, with which the children appeared to have been playing. They observed also many footsteps upon the sand below high water mark, which were certain indications that the Indians had been recently upon the spot several houses were found at a little distance and some ovens dug in the ground in the same manner as those of otaheite in which victuals appeared to have been dressed since the morning and scattered about them lay some shells of a kind of clam and some fragments of roots the refuse of the meal after regretting their disappointment they repaired to their quarters which was a broad sandbank under the shelter of a bush. Their beds were plantain leaves, which they spread upon the sand, and which were as soft as a mattress. Their cloaks served them for bedclothes, and some bunches of grass for pillows. With these accommodations, they hoped to pass a better night than the last, especially as, to their great comfort, not a mosquito was to be seen. Here then they lay down, and, such is the force of habit, they resigned themselves to sleep, without once reflecting upon the probability and danger of being found by the Indians in that situation. If this appears strange, let us for a moment reflect that every danger and every calamity, after a time, becomes familiar, and loses its effect upon the mind. If it were possible that a man should first be made acquainted with his mortality, or even with the inevitable debility and infirmities of old age, when his understanding had arrived at its full strength, and life was endeared by the enjoyments of youth and vigour and health, with what an agony of terror and distress would the intelligence be received? Yet, being gradually acquainted with these mournful truths, by insensible degrees, we scarce know when they lose all their force, and we think no more of the approach of old age and death than these wanderers of an unknown desert did of a less obvious and certain evil, the approach of the native savages at a time when they must have fallen an easy prey to their malice or their fears. And it is remarkable that the greater part of those who have been condemned to suffer a violent death have slept the night immediately preceding their execution, though there is perhaps no instance of a person accused of a capital crime having slept the first night of his confinement. Thus is the evil of life in some degree a remedy for itself, and though every man at twenty deprecates for a score, Almost every man is as tenacious of life at four score as at twenty, and if he does not suffer under any painful disorder, loses as little of the comforts that remain by reflecting that he is upon the brink of the grave, where the earth already crumbles under his feet, 
as he did of the pleasures of his better days when his dissolution though certain was supposed to be at a distance our travellers having slept without once awaking till the morning examined the river and finding the tide favoured their return and the country promised nothing worthy of a farther search they re-embarked in their boat and made the best of their way to the ship soon after the arrival of this party the master also returned having been seven leagues out to sea and he was now of opinion that there was no getting out where before he thought there had been a passage his expedition however was by no means without its advantage for having been a second time upon the rock where he had seen the large cockles he met with a great number of turtle three of which he caught that together weighed seven hundred and ninety one pounds though he had no better instrument than a boat hook the next morning therefore i sent him out again with proper instruments for taking them and mr banks went with him but the success did not at all answer our expectations for by the unaccountable conduct of the officer not a single turtle was taken nor could he be persuaded to return mr banks however went ashore upon the reef where he saw several of the large cockles and having collected many shells and marine productions he returned at eleven o'clock at night in his own small boat the master still continuing with the large one upon the rock in the afternoon seven or eight of the natives had appeared on the south side of the river and two of them came down to the sandy point opposite to the ship but upon seeing me put off in a boat to speak with them they all ran away with the greatest precipitation End of section 12section 13 of the first voyage of james cook volume 2 by james cook 1728 to 1779 this librivox recording is in the public domain book 3 chapter 4 part 2 transactions while the ship was refitting in endeavor river a description of the adjacent country its inhabitants and productions continued as the master continued absent with the boat all night i was forced to send the second lieutenant for him early the next morning in the yawl and soon after four of the natives appeared upon the sandy point on the north side of the river having with them a small wooden canoe without riggers they seemed for some time to be busily employed in striking fish some of our people were for going over to them in a boat but this i would by no means permit repeated experience having convinced me that it was more likely to prevent than procure an interview i was determined to try what could be done by a contrary method and accordingly let them alone without appearing to take the least notice of them this succeeded so well that at length two of them came in the canoe within a musket shot of the ship and there talked a great deal in a very loud tone we understood nothing that they said and therefore could answer their harangue only by shouting and making all the signs of invitation and kindness that we could devise during this conference they came insensibly nearer and nearer holding up their lances not in a threatening manner but as if to intimate that if we offered them any injury they had weapons to revenge it when they were almost alongside of us we threw them some cloth nails beads paper and other trifles which they received without the least appearance of satisfaction at last 
one of the people happened to throw them a small fish. At this they expressed the greatest joy imaginable, and, intimating by signs that they would fetch their companions, immediately paddled away towards the shore. In the meantime, some of our people, and among them Tupia, landed on the opposite side of the river. The canoe, with all the four Indians, very soon returned to the ship and came quite alongside, without expressing any fear or distrust. We distributed some more presents among them, and soon after they left us, and landed on the same side of the river where our people had gone ashore. Every man carried in his hand two lances and a stick, which is used in throwing them, and advanced to the place where Tupia and the rest of our people were sitting. Tupia soon prevailed upon them to lay down their arms and come forward without them. He then made signs that they should sit down by him, with which they complied, and seemed to be under no apprehension or constraint. Several more of us then going ashore, they expressed some jealousy, lest we should get between them and their arms. We took care, however, to show them that we had no such intention, and having joined them, we made them some more presents, as a farther testimony of our goodwill and our desire to obtain theirs. We continued together with the utmost cordiality till dinner time, and then giving them to understand that we were going to eat, we invited them by signs to go with us. This, however, they declined, and as soon as we left them, they went away in their canoe. One of these men was somewhat above the middle age, the other three were young. They were in general of the common stature, but their limbs were remarkably small. Their skin was of the colour of wood soot, or what would be called a dark chocolate colour. Their hair was black but not woolly. It was short cropped in some lank and in others curled. Dampier says that the people whom he saw on the western coast of this country wanted two of their four teeth, but these had no such defect. Some part of their bodies had been painted red, and the upper lip and breast of one of them was painted with streaks of white, which he called carbanda. Their features were far from disagreeable, their eyes were lively, and their teeth even and white. Their voices were soft and tunable, and they repeated many words after us with great facility. In the night, Mr. Gore and the master returned with the longboat, and brought one turtle and a few shellfish. The yawl had been left upon the shoal with six men, to make a further trial for turtle. The next morning we had another visit from four of the natives. Three of them had been with us before, but the fourth was a stranger, whose name, as we learned from his companions who introduced him, was Yaparico. This gentleman was distinguished by an ornament of a very striking appearance. It was the bone of a bird, nearly as thick as a man's finger, and five or six inches long, which he had thrust into a hole, made in the gristle that divides the nostrils. Of this we had seen one instance, and only one in New Zealand. But upon examination, we found that among all these people, this part of the nose was perforated, to receive an ornament of the same kind. They had also holes in their ears, though nothing was then hanging to them, and had bracelets upon the upper part of their arms, made of plaited hair, so that, like the inhabitants of Terra del Fuego, they seem to be fond of ornament, though they are absolutely without apparel. And one of them, to whom I had given part of an old shirt, instead of throwing it over any part of his body, tied it as a fillet round his head. They brought with them a fish, which they gave us, as we supposed, in return for the fish that we had given them the day before. They seemed to be much pleased and in no haste to leave us, 
but seeing some of our gentlemen examine their canoe with great curiosity and attention, they were alarmed, and jumping immediately into it, paddled away without speaking a word. About two the next morning, the yawl, which had been left upon the shoal, returned with three turtles and a large skeet. As it seemed now probable that this fishery might be prosecuted with advantage, I sent her out again after breakfast for a further supply. Soon after, three Indians ventured down to Tupia's tent, and were so well pleased with their reception, that one of them went with the canoe to fetch two others whom we had never seen. When he returned, he introduced the strangers by name, a ceremony which, upon such occasions, was never omitted. As they had received the fish that was thrown into their canoe, when they first approached the ship, with so much pleasure, some fish was offered to them now, and we were greatly surprised to see that it was received with the greatest indifference. They made signs, however, to some of the people, that they should dress it for them, which was immediately done, but after eating a little of it, they threw the rest to Mr. Banks's dog. They stayed with us all the forenoon, but would never venture above twenty yards from their canoe. We now perceived that the colour of their skin was not so dark as it appeared, what we had taken for their complexion being the effects of dirt and smoke, in which we imagined they contrived to sleep, notwithstanding the heat of the climate, as the only means in their power to keep off the mosquitoes. Among other things that we had given them when we first saw them were some medals, which we had hung round their necks by a ribbon, and these ribbons were so changed by smoke that we could not easily distinguish of what colour they had been. This incident led us more narrowly to examine the colour of their skin. While these people were with us, we saw two others on the point of land that lay on the opposite side of the river, at the distance of about two hundred yards, and by our glasses discovered them to be a woman and a boy, the woman, like the rest, being stark naked. We observed that all of them were remarkably clean-limbed, and exceedingly active and nimble. One of these strangers had a necklace of shells, very prettily made, and a bracelet upon his arm, formed of several strings, so as to resemble what in England is called gimp. Both of them had a piece of bark tied over their forehead, and were disfigured by the bone in the nose. We thought their language more harsh than that of the islanders in the South Sea, and they were continually repeating the word chekau, which we imagined to be a term expressing admiration, by the manner in which it was uttered. They also cried out, when they saw anything new, chair tut 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 tut, which probably had a similar signification. Their canoe was not above ten feet long and very narrow, but it was fitted with an outrigger, much like those of the islands, though in every respect very much inferior. When it was in shallow water, they set it on with poles, and when in deep, they worked it with paddles about four feet long. It contained just four people, so that the people who visited us today went away at two turns. Their lances were, like those that we had seen in Botany Bay, except that they had but a single point, which in some of them was the sting of the ray, and barbed with two or three sharp bones of the same fish. It was indeed a most terrible weapon, and the instrument which they used in throwing it seemed to be formed with more art than any we had seen before. About twelve o'clock next day, the yawl returned with another turtle and a large stingray, and in the evening was sent out again. The next morning, two of the Indians came on board, 
but after a short stay went along the shore and applied themselves with great diligence to the striking of fish mr gore who went out this day with his gun had the good fortune to kill one of the animals which had been so much the subject of our speculation an idea of it will best be conceived by the cut plate twenty without which the most accurate verbal description would answer very little purpose as it has not similitude enough to any animal already known to admit of illustration by reference in form it is most like the jabur which it also resembles in its motion as has been observed already but it greatly differs in size the jabur not being larger than a common rat and this animal when full grown being as big as a sheep this individual was a young one much under its full growth weighing only thirty-eight pounds the head neck and shoulders are very small in proportion to the other parts of the body the tail is nearly as long as the body thick near the rump and tapering towards the end the forelegs of this individual were only eight inches long and the hind legs two and twenty its progress is by successive leaps or hops of a great length in an erect posture the forelegs are kept bent close to the breast and seem to be of use only for digging the skin is covered with a short fur of a dark mouse or grey colour excepting the head and ears which bear a slight resemblance to those of a hare this animal is called by the natives kangaroo the next day our kangaroo was dressed for dinner and proved most excellent meat we might now indeed be said to fare sumptuously every day for we had turtle in great plenty and we all agreed that they were much better than any we had tasted in england which we imputed to their being eaten fresh from the sea before their natural fat had been wasted or their juices changed by a diet and situation so different from what the sea affords them as garbage and a tub most of those that we caught here were of the kind called green turtle and weighed from two to three hundred weight and when these were killed they were always found to be full of turtle grass which our naturalists took to be a kind of conferva two of them were loggerheads the flesh of which was much less delicious and in their stomachs nothing was to be found but shell in the morning of the sixteenth while the people were employed as usual in getting the ship ready for the sea i climbed one of the hills on the north side of the river from which i had an extensive view of the inland country and found it agreeably diversified by hills valleys and large plains which in many places were richly covered with wood this evening we observed an immersion of jupiter's first satellite which gave two hundred and fourteen degrees fifty three minutes forty five seconds of longitude the observation which was made on the twenty ninth of june gave two hundred and fourteen degrees forty two minutes thirty seconds the mean is two hundred and fourteen degrees forty eight minutes seven and a half seconds the longitude of this place west of greenwich on the seventeenth i sent the master and one of the mates in the pinnace to look for a channel to the northward and i went myself with mr banks and dr zollander into the woods on the other side of the water to Pierre, who had been thither by himself reported that he had seen three indians who had given him some roots about as thick as a man's finger in shape not much unlike a radish and of a very agreeable taste this induced us to go over hoping that we should be able to improve our acquaintance with the natives in a very little time we discovered four of them in a canoe who as soon as they saw us come ashore and though they were all strangers 
walked up to us without any signs of suspicion or fear. Two of these had necklaces of shells, which we could not persuade them to part with for anything we could give them. We presented them, however, with some beads, and after a short stay they departed. We attempted to follow them, hoping that they would conduct us to some place where we should find more of them and have an opportunity of seeing their women, but they made us understand by signs that they did not desire our company. At eight o'clock the next morning, we were visited by several of the natives who were now becoming quite familiar. One of them, at our desire, threw his lance, which was about eight feet long. It flew with a swiftness and steadiness that surprised us, and though it was never more than four feet from the ground, it entered deeply into a tree at fifty paces distance. After this they ventured on board where I left them, to all appearance much entertained, and went again with Mr. Banks to take a view of the country, but chiefly to indulge an anxious curiosity by looking round us upon the sea, of which our wishes almost persuaded us we had formed an idea more disadvantageous than the truth. After having walked about seven or eight miles along the shore to the northward, we ascended a very high hill, and were soon convinced that the danger of our situation was at least equal to our apprehensions, for in whatever direction we turned our eyes, we saw rocks and shoals without number, and no passage out to sea but through the winding channels between them, which could not be navigated without the last degree of difficulty and danger. We returned, therefore, to the ship, not in better spirits than when we left it. We found several natives still on board, and we were told that the turtles, of which we had no less than twelve upon the deck, had fixed their attention more than anything else in the ship. On the 19th, in the morning, we were visited by ten of the natives, the greater part from the other side of the river, where we saw six or seven more, most of them women, and, like all the rest of the people we had seen in this country, they were stark naked. Our guests brought with them a greater number of lances than they had ever done before, and having laid them up in a tree, they set a man and a boy to watch them. The rest then came on board, and we soon perceived that they had determined to get one of our turtles which was probably as great a dainty to them as to us. They first asked us by signs to give them one, and being refused, they expressed, both by looks and gestures, great disappointment and anger. At this time we happened to have no victuals dressed, but I offered one of them some biscuit, which he snatched and threw overboard with great disdain. One of them renewed his request to Mr. Banks, and upon a refusal stamped with his foot, and pushed him from him in a transport of resentment and indignation. Having applied by turns to almost every person who appeared to have any command in the ship without success, they suddenly seized two of the turtles, and dragged them towards the side of the ship where their canoe lay. Our people soon forced them out of their hands and replaced them with the rest. They would not, however, relinquish their enterprise, but made several other attempts of the same kind, in all which being equally disappointed, they suddenly leaped into their canoe in a rage and began to paddle towards the shore. At the same time, I went into the boat with Mr. Banks and five or six of the ship's crew, and we got ashore before them, where many more of our people were already engaged in various employments. As soon as they landed, they seized their arms, and before we were aware of their design, they snatched a brand from under a pitch kettle which was boiling, 
and making a circuit to the windward of the few things we had on shore they set fire to the grass in their way with surprising quickness and dexterity the grass which was five or six feet high and as dry as stubble burnt with amazing fury and the fire made a rapid progress towards the tent of mr banks's which had been set up for Tupia when he was sick taking in its course a sow and pigs one of which it scorched to death mr banks leaped into a boat and fetched some people from on board just time enough to save his tent by hauling it down upon the beach but the smith's forge at least such part of it as would burn was consumed while this was doing the indians went to a place at some distance where several of our people were washing and where our nets among which was the same and a great quantity of linen were laid out to dry here they again set fire to the grass entirely disregarding both threats and entreaties we were therefore obliged to discharge a musket loaded with small shot at one of them which drew blood at the distance of about forty yards and thus putting them to flight we extinguished the fire at this place before it had made much progress but where the grass had been first kindled it spread into the woods to a great distance as the indians were still in sight i fired a musket charged with ball abreast of them among the mangroves to convince them that they were not yet out of our reach upon hearing the ball they quickened their pace and we soon lost sight of them we thought they would now give us no more trouble but soon after we heard their voices in the woods and perceived that they came nearer and nearer i set out therefore with mr banks and three or four more to meet them when our parties came in sight of each other they halted except one old man who came forward to meet us at length he stopped and having uttered some words which we were very sorry we could not understand he went back to his companions and the whole body slowly retreated we found means however to see some of their darts and continued to follow them about a mile we then sat down upon some rocks from which we could observe their motions and they also sat down at about an hundred yards distance after a short time the old man again advanced towards us carrying in his hand a lance without a point he stopped several times at different distances and spoke we answered by beckoning and making such signs of amity as we could devise upon which the messenger of peace as we supposed him to be turned and spoke aloud to his companions who then set up their lances against a tree and advanced towards us in a friendly manner when they came up we returned the darts or lances that we had taken from them and we perceived with great satisfaction that this rendered the reconciliation complete we found in this party four persons whom we had never seen before who as usual were introduced to us by name but the man who had been wounded in the attempt to burn our nets and linen was not among them we knew however that he could not be dangerously hurt by the distance at which the shot reached him we made all of them presents of such trinkets as we had about us and they walked back with us towards the ship as we went along they told us by signs that they would not set fire to the grass any more and we distributed among them some musket balls and endeavoured to make them understand their use and effect when they came abreast of the ship they sat down but could not be prevailed upon to come on board we therefore left them and in about two hours they went away soon after which we perceived the woods on fire at about two miles distance if this accident had happened a very little while sooner 
the consequence might have been dreadful, for our powder had been aboard but a few days, and the store tent, with many valuable things which it contained, had not been removed many hours. We had no idea of the fury with which grass would burn in this hot climate, nor consequently of the difficulty of extinguishing it, but we determined that if it should ever again be necessary for us to pitch our tents in such a situation, our first measure should be to clear the ground round us. In the afternoon we got everything on board the ship, new berthed her, and let her swing with the tide, and at night the master returned, with the discouraging account that there was no passage for the ship to the northward. The next morning at low water I went and sounded and buoyed the bar, the ship being now ready for sea. We saw no Indians this day, but all the hills round us for many miles were on fire, which at night made a most striking and beautiful appearance. The twenty-first passed without our getting sight of any of the inhabitants, and indeed without a single incident worth notice. On the twenty-second we killed a turtle for the day's provision, upon opening which we found a wooden harpoon or turtle peg about as thick as a man's finger, near fifteen inches long, and bearded at the end, such as we had seen among the natives, sticking through both shoulders. It appeared to have been struck a considerable time, for the wound had perfectly healed up over the weapon. Early in the morning of the 23rd, I sent some people into the country to gather a supply of the greens which have been before mentioned by the name of Indian Kale. One of them, having straggled from the rest, suddenly fell in with four Indians, three men and a boy, whom he did not see till, by turning short in the wood, he found himself among them. They had kindled a fire and were broiling a bird of some kind and part of a kangaroo, the remainder of which, and a cockatoo, hung at a little distance upon a tree. The man, being unarmed, was at first greatly terrified, but he had the presence of mind not to run away, judging, very rightly, that he was most likely to incur danger by appearing to apprehend it. On the contrary, he went and sat down by them, and, with an air of cheerfulness and good humour, offered them his knife, the only thing he had about him which he thought would be acceptable to them. They received it, and having handed it from one to the other, they gave it him again. He then made an offer to leave them, but this they seemed not disposed to permit. Still, however, he dissembled his fears and sat down again. They considered him with great attention and curiosity, particularly his clothes, and then felt his hands and face, and satisfied themselves that his body was of the same texture with their own. They treated him with the greatest civility, and having kept him about half an hour, they made signs that he might depart. He did not wait for a second dismission, but when he left them, not taking the direct way to the ship, they came from their fire and directed him, so that they well knew whence he came. In the meantime, Mr. Banks, having made an excursion on the other side of the river to gather plants, found the greatest part of the cloth that had been given to the Indians lying in a heap together probably as useless lumber, not worth carrying away. And perhaps, if he had sought further, he might have found the other trinkets, for they seemed to set very little value upon anything we had, except our turtle, which was a commodity that we were least able to spare. The blowing weather, which prevented our attempt to get out to sea still continuing, 
mr banks and dr zollander went out again on the twenty fourth to see whether any new plant could be picked up they traversed the woods all day without success but as they were returning through a deep valley the sides of which though almost as perpendicular as a wall were covered with trees and bushes they found lying upon the ground several marking nuts the anacardium orientale these put them upon a new scent and they made a most diligent search after the tree that bore them which perhaps no european botanist ever saw but to their great mortification they could not find it so that after spending much time and cutting down four or five trees they returned quite exhausted with fatigue to the ship on the twenty fifth having made an excursion up the river i found a canoe belonging to our friends the indians whom we had not seen since the affair of the turtle they had left it tied to some mangroves about a mile distant from the ship and i could see by their fires that they were retired at least six miles directly inland as mr banks was again gleaning the country for his natural history on the twenty sixth he had the good fortune to take an animal of the opossum tribe it was a female and with it he took two young ones it was found much to resemble the remarkable animal of the kind which monsieur de buffon has described in his natural history by the name of phalanger but it was not the same monsieur buffon supposes this tribe to be peculiar to america but in this he is certainly mistaken and probably as pallas has observed in his zoology the phalanger itself is a native of the east indies as the animal which was caught by mr banks resembled it in the extraordinary conformation of the feet in which it differs from animals of every other tribe on the twenty seventh mr gore shot a kangaroo which with the skin entrails and head weighed eighty four pounds upon examination however we found that this animal was not at its full growth the innermost grinders not yet being formed we dressed it for dinner the next day but to our great disappointment we found it had a much worse flavour than that we had eaten before the wind continued in the same quarter and with the same violence till five o'clock in the morning of the twenty ninth when it fell calm soon after a light breeze sprung up from the land and it being about two hours ebb i sent a boat to see what water was upon the bar in the meantime we got the anchor up and made all ready to put to sea but when the boat came back the officer reported that there was only thirteen feet water upon the bar which was six inches less than the ship drew we were therefore obliged to come to and the sea breeze setting in again about eight o'clock we gave up all hope of sailing that day we had fresh gales at south-east with hazy weather and rain till two in the morning of the thirty-first when the weather being somewhat more moderate i had thoughts of trying to walk the ship out of the harbour but upon going out myself first in the boat i found it still blow too fresh for the attempt during all this time the pinnace and yawl continued to ply the net and hook with tolerable success sometimes taking a turtle and frequently bringing in from two to three hundred weight of fish on the first of august the carpenter examined the pumps and to our great mortification found them all in a state of decay owing as he said to the sap having been left in the wood one of them was so rotten as when hoisted up to drop to pieces and the rest were little better so that our chief trust was now in the soundness of our vessel 
which happily did not admit more than one inch of water in an hour at six o'clock in the morning of friday the third we made another unsuccessful attempt to warp the ship out of the harbour but at five o'clock in the morning of the fourth our efforts had a better effect and about seven we got once more under sail with a light air from the land which soon died away and was followed by the sea breezes from south east by south with which we stood off to sea east by north having the pinnace ahead which was ordered to keep sounding continually the yawl had been sent to the turtle bank to take up the net which had been left there but as the wind freshened we got out before her a little before noon we anchored in fifteen fathom water with a sandy bottom for i did not think it safe to run in among the shoals till i had well viewed them at low water from the masthead which might determine me which way to steer for as yet i was in doubt whether i should beat back to the southward round all the shoals or seek a passage to the eastward or the northward all of which at present appeared to be equally difficult and dangerous when we were at anchor the harbour from which we sailed bore south seventy degrees west distant about five leagues the northernmost point of the main in sight which i named cape bedford and which lies in latitude fifteen degrees sixteen minutes south longitude two hundred and fourteen degrees forty five minutes west bore north twenty degrees west distant three leagues and a half but to the north-east of this cape we could see land which had the appearance of two high islands the turtle banks bore east distant one mile our latitude by observation was fifteen degrees thirty two minutes south and our depth of water in standing off from the land was from three and a half to fifteen fathom End of section 13